Good morning. We're going to give it just a minute. We've got some Zoom issues uh, for a couple of folks. So I'm gonna give it just a few more minutes. Um, we seem to be having some Zoom and technical difficulties. So just bear with us just a few minutes. Um, trying to get another commissioner on. We do have a couple that are gonna be late joining us today, but just trying to get everybody situated this morning. So thanks for your patience.
okay, apparently there was a Zoom update last night and it's caused some issues for folks, but I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, that way we don't run too far off our schedule. So um, I will call this Friday, November 5th, 2021, Nevada Board of Wildlife Commissioners meeting to order. Um, if we could have the Pledge of Allegiance and if Commissioner Weiss would join, uh, please lead us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, Missy, could we have the uh, roll call of the commission, please? Chairwoman East? Here. Vice Chair Cabilia? Here. Commissioner Barnes? Here. Commissioner Allenberg? He's running behind. Uh, Commissioner Keogh? And he will be joining us later in the morning. Commissioner McNinch? Here. Commissioner Green? He'll be joining us later as well. Commissioner Rogers? Here. Commissioner Wise? Here. Thank you. Thank you. And could we have the county advisory boards to manage wildlife let us know that you're on? So I have Steve Robinson, Glenn Bunch, Kobe Rowe, Therese Campbell, Dan Gilbert, Joe Krim, Matt Malarkey, anyone else? So that's um, Clark, Jean Green, Carson City, Washoe County's nicely represented. Not sure who Dan, I don't recall who Dan's with. Joe Krim is Pershing. All right, thank you all for joining us. Okay, agenda item number two, approval of the agenda, Chairwoman Neese for possible action. The committee will review the agenda and may take action to approve the agenda. The commission may remove items from the agenda, continue items for consideration or take items out of order. I would like to ask that we move agenda item number 12, the interim heritage proposal um, up above the CGRs. So we'll move 12 up before 10. If everyone's okay with that, we'll need a, a motion for that. Um, but any other thoughts on the agenda? Okay, I don't see any. Um, so we'll take it out for public comment. Any public comment on the agenda? Please raise your hand. Okay, I don't see any comment, any public comment on the agenda. Bring it back to the commission and I'll make a motion. Oh, Commissioner McNinch. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I was gonna make a motion to approve the agenda uh, with item 12, uh, agenda item number 12 being at the call of the chair. Thank you very much. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Okay, so I've got a motion by Commissioner McNinch and a second by Commissioner Barnes to move, uh, to approve the agenda with the noted change of moving 12 above 10. All in favor, raise your hand. Okay, motion passes with commissioners Almberg, Free, and Keel absent. All right, approval of the minutes, agenda item number three, Chairwoman East for possible action. Commission minutes may be approved from the September 24, 2021 meeting. Do we have any comment on the agenda, on the um, minutes. Commissioner McNinch, do you have any? I had a couple of real small, real small things that um, okay. probably just for clarification purposes, they, they're, they were very well done. I appreciate the work that goes into them. It's a lot of work to do these minutes. Um, <laughs> on page uh, 17. Okay. Um, under the, there was a public comment under Karen Boger, um, right at the end, uh, on the last three lines, right at the end of the, the third line from the bottom, um, 
I think I think that, that the intent of that was rock hounding. Oh, mm -hmm. Yep. And then the very last line in her statement, uh, working together to decrease off road travel. I think it was uh, probably intended to be road. And I don't think I had anything else. So I think uh, I'll glance real quick, but I think that's all that I noted. Okay. And I didn't note any other changes and I agree with you. Thank you so much to staff for um, doing a, a fantastic job on these minutes. Okay, any other comments? Okay, seeing none, I'll take it out for public comment. Any public comment on our minutes from the September meeting? Just raise your hand. Okay, I don't see any public comment, so I'll bring it back for a motion to approve. Commissioner Rogers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I'd like to make a motion to approve the meeting minutes from the September 24, 2021 meeting uh, as presented with the uh, two uh, changes noted by Commissioner McNinch. Okay, thank you. I have a motion. Do I have a second? I have a second by Commissioner Cavilia. Okay. All in favor of the approval of the minutes with the noted changes, raise your hand. Those opposed, motion carries. I gotta do math here, <laughs> six to zero with commissioners Perini, Keel, and Ulmberg absent. All right, uh, agenda item number four, member an items and announcements and correspondence, Chairwoman East, informational. Commissioners may present emergent items. No action may be taken by the commission. Any item requiring commission action may be scheduled on a future commission agenda. The commission will review and may discuss correspondence sent or received by the commission since the last regular meeting and may provide copies for the exhibit file. Commissioners may provide hard copies of their correspondence for the written record. Correspondence sent or received by Secretary Wasley may also be discussed. Um, I received quite a bit of correspondence regarding two agenda items, which are later in the, in the day, the um, CGR 503, and the um, Heritage Project proposal. Um, and I forwarded all of those to the um, office for uh, the record. Secretary Wasley, do you have anything? I, I do have a few items, Madam Chair. Um, just, just so the commission is fully aware, as, as the department receives any correspondence regarding any issue, we you know, immediately look at the send line and, and ensure that the commission um, is copied and if not distribute to the commission. So I, I just want to go on the record um, that the department uh, ensures that any correspondence we see is, is distributed. Um, <clears throat> there's a couple other items that um, relative to correspondence that I just, just wanna mention. Uh, the department is in uh, process of developing uh, letters of gratitude, one to the Coast Guard for the Silver Life Saving Medal that Ward, Game Warden Sean Flynn received and uh, that you, you participated as did um, Commissioner Rogers um, and numerous staff. And then also uh, we're drafting a letter of thanks and, and gratitude to several uh, other law enforcement entities that assisted with a, a recent uh, rescue and recovery um, over in the eastern part of the state with that unfortunate incident, uh, drowning of, of some kayakers. So there's some correspondence that's uh, in the queue. We've also uh, had some ongoing correspondence as it pertains to the first come first serve uh, that may may come to light further in, in the future. We, we have uh, seen what, what we would uh, consider um, suspicious activity in terms of individuals developing uh, strategies and workarounds and, and um, to, to gain uh, uh, an unfair advantage in our interpretation. And so um, we've had some communication with individuals and uh, trying to remedy that um, so that we don't have um, you know, one individual or a small group of individuals take away that opportunity from the vast majority. So um, there's been some, some correspondence there and uh, we'll, we'll have to see where that ends. Um, I'd also uh, like to make the commission aware of some challenges that the department has recent, recently encountered with respect to the new uh, tag deferral regulation. 
And this is really um, just kind of a, a, an FYI, and, and we're continuing to work through this issue. Um, as, as you're all well aware that tag deferral regulation, new regulation uh, provided an opportunity for uh, certain tag holders who met certain circumstances to choose an option to defer their tag to uh, a future season, uh, the next, next year. Um, we had some uh, misinterpretation and misapplication of that regulation in that several hunters were uh, provided were misinformed and provided guidance by the department um, that they were eligible for that uh, deferral when in fact uh, upon reinterpretation and more careful reading of that regulation they in fact weren't but it put the department in a very difficult position in that certain individuals who um, would have otherwise maintained their tag and and tried to hunt despite their injuries or complications or challenges um, found themselves uh, almost encouraged to use the, the new um, deferral option. And, and in doing so, were then later informed that they didn't have that option. And, and as you can expect, um, they were very uh, upset with the department. The department has uh, worked with the attorney general's office uh, quite a bit over the, the past week or so looking for ways to remedy that. Um, we are committed to, to making that right within the guise of, of the law and the intent of the regulation. And um, we, we believe we have a, a strategy uh, in place um, that can offset that injury to individuals. Uh, but just so the commission's aware, we've also um, immediately uh, implemented some, some training to clarify uh, that regulation in the, in the minds of our counter staff that are tasked with uh, you know, finding a solution to individuals. And I, I don't fault, uh, I really don't fault staff. And, and this is maybe something that's just kind of slipped through the cracks. And when uh, staff are faced with individuals who have those extenuating circumstances that run the gamut from, from personal injury to the loss of family members, um, you know, they're, they're, you know, we stress customer service and they're looking for ways to uh, remedy um, that situation and, and saw that tag deferral option uh, in, in numerous instances as a way to uh, offset those impacts and, <clears throat> and, and trying, to, trying to be customer service oriented. And, and uh, you know, due to that misinterpretation and misinformation, we led people astray. And so now we're committed to making that right. And uh, our senior uh, DAG, uh, Mr. Burkett, has um, spent a fair amount of time over the last week um, looking for ways that we can make that right. And I, I think that we have a, a strategy to go forward. Um, I know some of you received correspondence from upset um, tag holders, and I just, just want to say that we are fully aware and we've worked diligently to try to resolve this. And that includes training of, of counter staff and clear interpretation of that regulation so that this doesn't happen again. So um, <clears throat> happy to answer any questions on that or other issues, should there be any, Madam Chair, but that um, concludes my announcements and update on correspondence. Okay, thank you. And my apologies, I was um, remiss in not mentioning that I had gotten a couple of phone calls on the TAG deferral program. And I do want to um, just mention that uh, Commissioner Weiss was also at the event in August um, re recognizing the, um, the folks with the silver medal. Sorry, the US Coast Guard event. <laughs> so um, anyone else have cor uh, correspondence or announcements or any questions for Secretary Wasley on any of the things he just mentioned? Commissioner Rogers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, Director Wasley, I was just curious on, on this TAG uh, deferral regulation. Um, and the misrepresentation. I, I have not read that regulation in its entirety, but I'm, I guess I'm just wondering if, if one of the remedies is maybe, maybe some type of simplification of the language of that regulation. I, I'm just, you know, if one person, you know, interprets it wrong, maybe it is a misrepresentation. You got several, you know, I'm just wondering if there's something that we can do on the language that makes it a bit more clear along with the other items that, in terms of education and other things. Yeah, I uh, thank you for the question, Commissioner Rogers. That's exactly, um, I, I think, one of the things that we would like to potentially do and <clears throat> bring that um, regulation perhaps back before this body 
And it, it was stated by several individuals, staff, <clears throat> uh, you know, myself, I went back and read it and reread it. Um, our, our senior uh, DAG, uh, Craig Burkett, um, said, wow, that's a, quite a regulation. And it references other uh, chapters and statutes and you're bouncing back and forth. And one of the individuals who was affected by this was retired law enforcement. Um, and, and he said, look, he said, I, I had to read it three times and I still didn't understand it. So there, there was some confusion. And I think what it boils down to is that the instance um, where, <clears throat> where I think there was uh, something that maybe was counterintuitive is that if somebody, uh, <clears throat> for example, uh, had an injury or an extenuating circumstance that occurred on a Thursday or Friday before a hunt that started on Monday, they were not eligible for deferral. However, if that event occurred on Saturday and Sunday before that hunt started on Monday, they were. And so some of that nuance is uh, not as clear as, as maybe it could be. And we can speak to it more clearly in, in our publications, but I, I think it would be it would be good to revisit this regulation, looking at how it was interpreted, how it was applied, where there were challenges, and at a very minimum, uh, strive to have clearer uh, instruction and representation in our publications, um, and perhaps uh, look at those scenarios. And if there is a, a need to tweak the regulation to, uh, you know, under the authority that the legislature provided this this body to tweak it one way or another. Um, so that it's consistent with the intended usage, uh, you know, by this body that it would be good to bring that uh, back before you guys and have that discussion share with you uh, how it was applied, where it was misapplied, and what we can do to, to better serve our customers. Hey, other questions. Mr. Barnes. Not really a question just just a comment I think this is a, a pretty good example that that as we proceed with a lot of the regulations um, that, that we keep this in mind, um, you know, we, we look at these things and hear them, you know, two to three times. And so we're all pretty clear uh, as, as a commission what, what the intent is, but I think we need, we need to uh, consider that somebody maybe just taking a look at it for the first time um, can understand it. So I, I think as a, as a commission, as we go through these uh, regulations in the future, um, that maybe we need to take a closer look, making sure that uh, that everyone can understand what they mean and, and their intent going forward. Agreed. <clears throat> okay, any other questions? Correspondence announcements? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on. Agenda item number five, County Advisory Boards to Manage Wildlife, member items informational. CAB members may present emergent items, no action may be taken by the commission. Any item requiring commission action will be scheduled on a future commission agenda. Do we have any CAB announcements? Just raise your hand. Okay, I don't see any CAB announcements. Going once, twice. Okay, moving on. Agenda item number six, reports informational. 6A, Department Activity Report, Secretary Wasley and Division Administrators, a report will be provided on the De Nevada Department of Wildlife Activities. Secretary Wasley. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I'll start with just a, a brief update from the director's office um, <clears throat> as, as per usual. Um, the, Director's Office personnel uh, has been involved in um, developing work, work programs and seeking approval of those programs through an interim finance committee, um, also uh, attending and uh, providing comment to the legislative committee, um, legislative commission, excuse me, of the legislature uh, that meets to approve regulations that are uh, advanced by this, this body. Um, so the Ledge Commission adopted the Landowner Comp Tag Regulation, uh, the Shed Antler Regulation, and uh, NAC Chapter 501 Simplification on Friday, October 22nd. Um, have spent a uh, little bit of time uh, as it relates to uh, 
first come first serve as as indicated and some of those uh, complicating uh, factors as well as the tag deferral issue. Uh, also, um, some effort obviously put forward in preparing for uh, this this commission meeting um, had a uh, cabinet meeting yesterday uh, where the governor's staff uh, provided an update on um, some of the opportunities in the state to use some of the uh, pandemic related uh, relief funds. And so I'll, I'll uh, transition to our division reports. Uh, and first I'll go to the game division with game division administrator, Mike Scott here to provide the commission that update. Thank you. Um, for the record, Mike Scott. Um, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the commission. Um, I'm going to read you some activities from the game division. Uh, mule deer enhancement program, field trips and uh, meetings for the mule deer enhancement uh, have been completed in most of the areas. A total of 34 project proposals have been received for review by the oversight committee. An oversight committee meeting was scheduled for October 27th to prioritize project proposals submitted by the various subcommittees. Finalizing the charter and scoring matrices were also on the agenda items for the Mule Deer Oversight Committee meeting on October 27th, and you will hear more about that a bit later. Bighorn sheep surveys, both California and desert bighorn surveys have been conducted for many of our sheep herds. Many herds appear to have contracted due to continued drought conditions during 2021. Uh, four water developments have been observed to be dry in two mountain ranges, and we are in discussions about whether to address those projects immediately or to wait to see if those areas will receive any precipitation this week, which was two weeks ago or so. And um, they, both of those areas did receive some precip, but uh, they certainly will not uh, fill those, those projects completely. So we will, we will be in um, discussions about those going forward. Uh, chronic wasting disease check stations. Uh, game division personnel have participated in CWD check stations in Ely, Wells, and Alamo. Uh, Molds Meats in Las Vegas is a great source of CWD samples. To date, a total of over 90 samples have been collected, and we are seeking to create innovative ways to obtain additional samples from successful deer and elk hunters. Bighorn Sheep Plan update. Uh, Bighorn Sheep Plan Committee has been formed and has begun holding meetings to update the 2001 Bighorn Sheep Plan. The, raw, the revised plan will include mountain goats as well to be more of a mountain ungulate document. Uh, the State Wildlife Action Plan, Game Division Species Matrix. Game Division staff have spent a significant amount of time discussing and revising the matrix for game species. The criteria for ranking species should be revised, but is sufficient to create a meaningful list of species in need of conservation. Personnel changes. Uh, the game division has hired Josh Kirk for the Eastern and Southern Region Landowner Comp Tag biologist, biologist position and Cheyenne Acevedo for the Wildlife Tech position in Elko. Uh, they will both be starting within the next couple of weeks. Uh, also, Samantha Fino has accepted the Eureka game biologist position and will officially start in January. Big game management objectives. Game division staff are close to completing the updated document formerly called the harvest guidelines. The document provides guiding language for the game division to follow for season dates and quota recommendations. Uh, Commission policy 24 and 26A. Game division staff have been directed to revise these two commission policies, which have become outdated. Commission policy 24 describes hunting opportunities among weapons and hunter groups, and commission policy 26A describes game division transparency for big game data. Uh, we're also directed to look at numerous other policies, uh, commission policies that uh, we will uh, uh, review and provide edits for as well. So um, that's all I have from the game division, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Mr. Scott? Hey, I don't see any. Thank you. Who's up next, Secretary Wasley? Here I come. 
<laughs> Habitat Division. Okay, thank you. I had to come in as a uh, panelist. Sorry, sorry for the delay. Um, so from the Habitat Division, um, oh, let me, for the record, Alan Janae, Habitat Division Administrator. Um, from the Habitat Division, Wildlife Management Areas, Waterfowl season is now open in all three zones with October 16th being the first day of the season at many NDOW WMAs. Mason Valley reported 47 hunters averaging 2.62 birds. Carson Lake had 56 hunters averaging 1.64 birds per hunter. And Kirch WMA was the most popular with 118 hunters and an average of 2.53 birds per hunter. Uh, Carson Lake and Pasture, with the completion of the transfer of Carson Lake and Pasture property, and I will soon announce a public meeting to kick off the conceptual management plan for this property that is scheduled for November 16th, 2020. WMA reservations, reservation draws to guarantee access on the opening day of waterfowl season at Key Pittman WMA, which was October 16th and the first two waterfowl hunt days at Overton WMA. October 30 and November 2nd were conducted with the assistance from DAT staff. The success rate of receiving a reservation for one of the 39 available hunting blinds at Overton was 75% on opening day and increased to 95% for the second hunt day. 75% of the applicants were successful for Key Pittman, which is limited to 55 hunters on opening day. A slight decrease in applications were received this year with a total of 124 for all three hunt days as compared to 136 in 2020. Lander County Commission. Habitat staff recently attended the Lander County Commission meeting to present a requested PowerPoint on Smart from the Start Renewable Energy Planning. Also at the time, Endow presented the requested county presented and requested county support for a property acquisition opportunity north of Battle Mountain. The current owner of the Licking Ranch approached Endow to see if we would be interested in purchasing the property with the intent to maintain the wildlife conservation values of the property. And you will hear more about that later in this agenda. Uh, technical review. Currently, staff are reviewing the following noteworthy public land projects. The Gold Rush Draft Environmental Impact Statement, the Diamond Oil and Gas Exploration EA, the South Railroad Mine, Environmental Impact Statement, Mountain Home Air Force Base Optimization EIS, Green Link West Transmission Project EIS, Cross Eye Transmission EIS, Ghibellini Mine EIS, and the White Pine Pump Storage Geotechnical Study Project, as well as numerous others. Sagebrush Ecosystem Technical Team. The Sagebrush Ecosystem Technical Team is currently reviewing and finalizing four credit project management plans which when completed will establish approximately 6,500 sellable credits. There are two new potential credit projects working with the set to determine program eligibility for enrollment with the conservation credit system. Two credit transactions have occurred recently with several more in the negotiation stage. Restoration and rehabilitation. Wildfire restoration projects are well underway with approximately 26,158 acres of herbicide treatments and approximately 27,123 acres of seeding treatments in the hopper to be seeded this fall. And with that, I am done and stand for any questions. Okay, any questions for Mr. Janae? Okay, thank you. Mr. Basie, are you next? Good morning, Madam Chair and Commission members. Chris Basie, Conservation Education Chief for the record. Uh, I'm going to do a brief on programming events and outreach and media. Um, our conservation educators have been busy actively engaging classrooms throughout various programs. Most of these programs are still facilitated virtually with in-person experiences being limited to outdoor programming. Two pilot classroom programs will be launching in spring with teachers being trained and recruited late fall. This first pilot is called wildlife badges and is aligned to state standards for all grades. During the badges, the program lessons will be hosted on Google sites so the teachers can facilitate in their classrooms. So far, we have a lot of interest from teachers in piloting this program. The second pilot is called Bird Trunk and it is aligned with the standards for grades six and eight. 
The trunk contains everything a class will need to go birding, binoculars, bird feeders, field guides, bird skulls, and associated curriculum. Teachers will be trained on bird ID and how to submit their classroom observa observation to eBird. Events, the conservation education staff in the Western region has partnered with renowned Sterling Silver Club to help create events to help better connect people to nature. The first event was held in October as guided nature walk at Oxbow Nature Study Area. The event was held to receive, well received by the club members and more similar events have been added to our calendar. These kind of efforts are to reach a broader audience and there'll be more to come. Work is being done on urban wildlife uh, program ready to launch next fall and the program is aligned with high, with high school standards. Outreach in late September, conservation education staff sent multiple emails promoting the youth chucker hunt, which fell on National Nevada Hunting and Fishing Day. One email went to Hunter Education graduates and the other went to the last license holders. The Nevada Department of Wildlife also celebrated National Nevada Hunting and Fishing Day on social media with multiple posts, including a governor's recent proclamation naming Nevada Hunting and Fishing Day in recognition of hunters' contributions to conservations. Um, in October, conservation education staff sent a mass email to 93,000 hunters promoting the waterfowl hunting season and a reminder to purchase a federal duck stamp. An email was also sent to all hunting license holders informing them on the state's regulations surrounding chronic wasting disease, disease prevention and CWT, CWD check stations and other sampling efforts that help the department prevent the spread of CWD into Nevada's, Nevada. Staff also posted multiple social media posts and recorded a podcast informing the public about CWD and the department's check stations. Conservation educative staff worked on multiple press releases, which included the announcement of Director Tony Wosley being named president of the Associated Fish and Wildlife Agencies and Nevada becoming the 39th state to create a multi-agency cooperative research institute and an inter, interagency press release on bears inter, inter, in, entering hyperphagia before denning for winter and invitation to Department of Wildlife, Wildlife's Ducks and Donuts event. Staff also submitted multiple articles that were recently published as part of the edible Reno Tahoe's fall publication, which was primarily focused on hunting, wild food, and this is exciting news because edible Reno Tahoe distribution approximately is 20,000 publications per quarterly, issued 13 different counties. Our staff stories focused on teaching our youth and hunt responsibility and what steps are, are to start hunting. Um, media in October, the department had print audience of 6,154,000 and a radio audience of 120,434 and a national TV audience of 97,000. Stories include bear activity, interviews with public information officers in KOL 8 News and Las Vegas Sun, News 4 in Reno, KNRPR and Carson Now, and a story on coyote sightings in Henderson by Fox 5 News in Las Vegas, and a story how to properly dispose pumpkins so they don't impact local wildlife and KOL and Channel 8 News, on Channel 8 News. The department was also featured in multiple segments on PBS Outdoor Nevada throughout the month. And that completes my report. And if you have any questions. I have a question because I saw some information and maybe it was not accurate that you should take your pumpkins up into the, up into the hills behind your homes or up into the hills and dispose of them up there so the wildlife have something to eat. That's not the way to dispose. I didn't think no. so, but I didn't have pumpkins this year. So no, can you- that didn't come from us. I, so that, <laughs> that was uh, distributed somewhere from somewhere else. Yeah, probably some very uh, well-meaning folks just thought they'd feed the bears um, in our neighborhood. So, okay. Thanks, Chris. Any other questions for Mr. Vasey? Okay, thank you. Wildlife Diversity Division is up next. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, for the record, Jennifer Newmark, Wildlife Diversity Division Administrator. We've been working on a couple of different surveys. Uh, three fall sh shorebird surveys were conducted in Lahontan Valley um, at, by us in Stillwater National Wildlife Refuge and Lahontan Audubon between August 10th and September 3rd. 
The August 10th Lahontan Valley Survey observed the highest visitation of shorebirds with over 12,000 birds observed. The majority of these were documented at Carson Lake Wildlife Management Area. The dark kangaroo mouse is a state species of conservation priority and a sensitive species for our federal partners, most notably the Bureau of Land Management. This species is presumed to be rare, existing in more specialized habitat types and in small fragmented populations throughout the state. Diversity biologists recently conducted nocturnal small mammal trapping in low elevation sagebrush and salt desert scrub at seven sites in Northwest Nevada, where we were successful in capturing dark kangaroo mice in four locations. Diversity biologists helped conduct the BioBlitz at the Valley of Fire State Park on September 19th. Endow led multiple hiking groups and provided training on how to survey for, capture, and handle reptiles. Approximately 175 people were educated on training techniques as well as snake and Gila monster ecology. With this success, we have already scheduled another BioBlitz for the spring and data collected by these volunteers will assist us in both our species management and in some habitat modeling that we are currently conducting. Diversity biologists surveyed multiple talus patches at the summit of Mount Siegel in the Pine Nut Range and confirmed that pikas currently occupy the highest elevations of this mountain range. This is our first confirmed sighting of pika being present in this mountain range. This information aids our understanding of pika occupancy and persistence in isolated mountain ranges across the state. Ultrasonic bat detectors were deployed in multiple locations in Lake Tahoe Nevada State Park in 2021 to learn more about bat species richness and activity levels under two unique sets of circumstances. Detectors were deployed in summer to study the effects of tree removal on forest associated bat species. And then detectors were deployed again in the fall to study changes in those species compositions and differing activity patterns during fall migration. Also in the Tahoe area, more than 36,000 acres of high quality habitat were surveyed throughout the basin and the surrounding Carson range um, in the summer of 2021. A total of three spotted owls were found during their surveys, including a mated pair within the Lake Tahoe Nevada State Park. This pair was observed using areas of the park where they had not been seen in previous years, which helped expand our knowledge of habitats that need to be managed for spotted owls. That pair was also observed both inside and outside the basin, which highlights the need for cross-jurisdictional conservation measures since the Tahoe Basin boundary separates two national forests and uh, two different forest service regions. Endow has already met at a division of forestry foresters to discuss fuel reduction projects in the state park where spotted owl activity has been occurring. This will help protect crucial habitat from wildfire, but also retain forest characteristics that spotted owls need. And with that, I will answer any questions. Thank you. That's exciting. <laughs> Any questions for Ms. Newmark? We're quiet today. Okay, thank you. Will you please, Missy, let the record reflect that uh, Commissioner Olmberg has joined us and welcome Commissioner Olmberg. All right, next up. Fisheries is up next. Thank you, Tony. Uh, good morning, uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Some updates from the Fisheries Division. Uh, Fisheries Division has been very busy with field biologists transitioning from wrapping up 2021 field season survey activities to office time conducting data analysis and writing annual reports. The Fisheries Division has been busy filling several vacancies statewide. We're proud to announce that C.J. Ellingwood recently accepted the position of Eastern Region Fisheries Biologist in charge of the Columbia River drainage streams. Uh, that includes bull trout, red band trout, and Yellowstone cutthroat trout. While Kim Tisdale recently promoted to our staff fisheries biologist in charge of sport fish for Nevada. Both individuals bring, bring a wealth of knowledge, strong worth ethic, and great attitude to their respective positions. We are certainly will both excel in their new roles. From the fish hatchery front, all fish hatcheries have been extremely busy filling, fulfilling needs for annual fall stocking. 
Some of our trout allocations were adjusted due to low water levels caused by the ongoing drought. Gallagher hatchery will soon be gearing up for the annual spawning activities in December. Aquatic Invasive Species Program. Southern Nevada AIS stations are still fully operational as the boating season continues down south. Uh, the AIS station at Topaz Lake also remained operational due to a positive hit for a quagga villager in samples collected from Walker Lake. Because quagga mussels cannot survive in the alkaline waters of Walker Lake, it is assumed that the villager was washed down from somewhere upstream. Additional samples are currently being collected from all upstream rivers and reservoirs. Uh, in addition, Endow personnel, AIS personnel assisted the Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe during a very busy October 1 fishing season opener at Pyramid Lake. Fisheries statewide have received a much needed break as daytime temperatures have cooled with the beginning of autumn. Although some localized fish kills were documented, many waters throughout the state have weathered ongoing drought conditions surprisingly well. Because many of the state's most popular fisheries currently sit at all-time lows, much needed wintertime precipitation will be crucial to sustain many of our fisheries next year. We are all thinking, wishing, hoping, and praying for rain and snow. Um, as an aside to that, uh, we were really blessed with the uh, giant rainstorm that we received in Northern Nevada just recently. A lot of folks has, have uh, said, yay, we're out of the drought. And, and I, I caution people to say, hold on one second. That's It's a really, really good start, uh, but that's all it is, is just a beginning. Um, let's just hope it continues. Uh, from our Eastern region, Eastern region personnel have been busy wrapping up stream, lake, and reservoir survey work before the snow flies. Fall reservoir electrofishing and gillnet surveys have, conduct, have been conducted to assess how many, of, how many of Northeastern Nevada fisheries have weathered ongoing drought conditions. And our personnel assisted Great Basin National Park employees with the installation of alternative beaver dam analogs in streams containing Bonneville cutthroat trout in White Pine County, uh, subsequent to some recent wildfires there. Our White Pine County biologist is currently assisting uh, the local Ely, Ro Ely Rotary Club in planning efforts for their annual ice fishing derby. Uh, this ice fishing derby helps fund local scholarships and has been canceled the previous two winners. Uh, from our southern region front, as many Fisheries field activities are concluding in the northern part of the state. Fall marks the heart of the field season at many Southern Nevada waters. Las Vegas fisheries personnel are still busy with survey and monitoring activities for a host of native aquatic species down south. Similarly, as hot summertime temperatures begin to drop, fishing activity at many Southern region waters has picked up considerably. A number of bass fishing tournaments have recently been held at Lake Mead and Mojave. And from our Western region front, Granite Construction recently completed a new bottomless culvert at the spawning station at Marlette Lake. This new culvert will facilitate upstream movement of rainbow trout and lawn and cutthroat trout during the springtime spawning period. Relative to ongoing drought conditions, recent eDNA survey work in Humboldt County showed persistence of LCT populations in a number of streams where it was thought that they had possibly blinked out. Western Region and Reno Headquarters Fisheries personnel are reviewing the EPA proposed plan for the Carson River Superfund site. Uh, that includes a portion of Carson River from Mount House to its terminus at the Lahont, in Lahontan Valley, including Lahontan Reservoir, Stillwater, and Carson Lake. The EPA uh, currently recommends, um, the EPA recommendations that currently affect Endow include discontinuing permitting of the commercial harvest of Sacramento blackfish for human consumption and to discontinue stocking of game fish in the Carson River and Lahontan Reservoir. Endow staff will be attending coordination meetings and providing comments uh, on this matter in November. Uh, and that's all I have. I'll be more than happy to take some questions. Um, I have a quick question. The Superfund site, what's that? What was the reasoning behind that or what was the cause? It's a it's a legacy uh, Superfund site which deals with mercury contamination from uh, mining in the, the Comstock era. Uh, okay, okay, that's kind of what I thought, but I was just curious. Any other questions for Mr. Crookshanks? Okay, thank you. So we have uh, two reports remaining. First, uh, Data and Technology Services Division and. Uh, we'll have about two and a half paragraphs from them, and then we'll have about two and a half pages from the law enforcement division to close out <laughs> our activity report. Thank you. For the record, Kim Munoz, uh, Division Administrator for Data and Technology Services. 
the Hunt and licensing staff completely transitioned to a new call center phone system called Bright Pattern. They've been also assisting the Habitat Division with taking the Overton WMA duck blind reservations. Staff completely, or I'm sorry, completed the draft of the 2022 big game application dates that we will use for the commission regulation that will be presented to the commission in January. They've also been working on business requirements for Calcomai to add functionality into the system that would allow master guides to log in and see which of their clients have applied during the non-resident guided hunt application period, um, as well as view the results through the system. This feature would only allow a guide to see their own clients and not clients signed up under another master guide. In conjunction with the law enforcement division, staff have worked to identify the necessary regulation changes that would need to occur in order to implement e-tags in 2023. Our hopes are to have a commission general regulation to the January commission for you to consider. In conjunction with the game division, staff have worked to update commission policy 24, as well as the specialty tag unit closure procedure for bighorn sheep. Both were presented to the TAC committee earlier this week. In conjunction with the Con Ed Division, staff have worked to finalize the 2022 vessel registration postcard reminders that will be going out to all boat owners on December 1st. The Geographical Information System staff created a new automated tool and dashboard for viewing harvest survey results and harvest check-in data. They also created a new tool for fishery staff to automatically update the fishable waters map. They've updated the Overton WMA duck blind reservation spreadsheet and trained all the call center staff on how to use it and help out with quality control on the rep raptor nest observation data. Lastly, they started a process to gather business requirements for building a new urban wildlife log. Finally, the information technology staff finished up the upgrades to the internet for our Ely office, as well as giving the building full wireless capacities. They also got the Lake Mead fish hatchery onto the state network. And lastly, they have assisted the habitat staff with setting up a new sound database and assisted the Las Vegas Con Ed staff with setting up a whole new shooting range training rooms. And that's my complete report. With that, I will answer any questions that the commission might have. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Ms. Munoz? I don't see any, thank you. All right, I guess that makes me next. Um, from the law enforcement division for the record, I'm game warden Captain Brian Bowles. Uh, our chief Mike Manor sends his regrets. He's actually out patrolling in the Eastern region today. So uh, I get to fill in. Um, and as Director Wasley uh, noted, we have a bit, so I'll dive right in. For wildlife investigations, uh, for our game wardens, the OGT program and the reserve game wardens teamed up to conduct unit watches and saturation patrols over three separate weekend periods in each of areas 10, 7, and 26. An Eastern Region game warden and a Western Region game warden each assisted in the investigation of a big game animal that was reported as diseased and unfit for human consumption. One was near Battle Mountain and one was harvested in Area 7 but transported to Reno. Western Region Game Wardens have responded to and assisted with many nuisance bear calls and multiple injured or urban deer calls near Reno, Carson City, and Tahoe. Multiple feeding big game incidents are being investigated near Minden. An injured eagle was recovered near Fallon and sent to a rehabilitation facility. Eastern Region Game Wardens have responded to a reported sick deer where samples were collected because the deer had died near the Ruby Marsh. Eastern Region Game Wardens conducted a decoy operation with the deer on Harrison Pass. No persons attempted to unlawfully take the deer, although I do hear a few uh, gave it a second glance and a, a steely eye, but they, they moved on. Eastern Region Game Wardens investigated five separate cases, two elk, one antelope, and two deer, following an individual self-reporting incidents for improper sex or physical characteristics for the animal harvested versus what was allowed on their hunting paddock. Eastern Region Game Wardens are investigating a waste game case regarding waterfowl left in a pickup truck for multiple days in Elko, two shot and left antelope near Battle Mountain, multiple big game animals reported to be harvested on private property, a shot and left doe in Area 6, a shot and left bull elk in Area 6, a dead bull elk in Area 11, 
a report of an individual killing deer on the Ruby Lake NWR, a shot and left deer near Eureka, and a reported waste of big game near Battle Mountain. Eastern Region Game Wardens responded to a report of a subject actively shooting an antelope on the road, multiple trespass issues, and one warden contacted an individual who had just harvested an antelope in the wrong unit. Western Region Game Wardens investigated the possible unlawful killing of a black bear in Reno, a residency fraud case, multiple trespass issues, a possible poached deer, which appears to show signs of disease, and two separate dead bear calls. Four Western Game Wardens contacted 270 hunters over one weekend during the sage hunt. Southern Region Game Wardens are investigating the unlawful harvest of a mule deer, addressed trespass issues, dealt with multiple urban wildlife issues near Panaca, assisted in a livestock depredation issue near Alamo, investigated a deceased ram, and responded to a self-report physical characteristics violation harvest near Tonopah. Game wardens received a conviction in the Higby case in White Pine County. This case resulted from multiple electronic warrants, surveillance, and a warrant at the subject's resident in Fallon. The results were one, a felony conviction on a bull elk resulting in 90 days in county jail. Higby was taken into custody right there in the courtroom. A $1,000 fine, a $10,000 civil penalty, and 12 to 36 months probation following the jail time. And secondly, a gross misdemeanor on an antelope, resulting in a $1,000 fine, a $1,000 civil penalty with nine months probation. A game warden received a conviction in a poaching case following an infield arrest from his this past Memorial Day in Lincoln County. Barely was convicted of felony poaching, which includes a $4,000 fine and 56 days in jail. Now on to boating safety patrol. A Southern Region game warden arrested a subject for operating under the influence on Lake Mead. Another Southern Region game warden investigated multiple different watercraft collisions. Another Southern Region warden rescued two individuals who were stranded with their paddlecraft through the high winds at Catherine's Landing. A Southern Region game warden assisted in rescuing a sinking vessel on Lake Mead. Upon getting the vessel safely to the launch ramp, the operator realized that the drain plug was not installed. That's an expensive lesson. Public safety. A Southern Region Game Warden assisted at Clark County Parks Police and Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department with a search for a potentially suicidal subject in the Las Vegas wetlands. An Eastern Region Game Warden assisted local agencies with following up on sighting of a nationally wanted suspect near the Bruno River area. The report turned out to be unfounded. A Southern Region Game Warden responded to a motor vehicle collision with Nye County Sheriff's Office. One subject was deceased on the scene and the other was airlifted to Reno. A Southern Region Game Warden assisted Lincoln County Sheriff's Office locating a stolen vehicle. A Southern Region Game Warden participated in law enforcement night out in Mesquite. Two Eastern Region Game Wardens were in the area of a wildland fire and assisted in directing county and Bureau of Land Management units to the fire. A Western Region Game Warden found and revived an unconscious man near our Carson City uh, Endow Yard. The man was taken by EMS to the hospital. As it turns out, he ended up saving his life, I believe, by administering some uh, um, much needed medical care. Two Southern Region Game Wardens were the first on scene to a vehicle fire in the Spring Mountains and assisted with the efforts. Western Region Game Wardens assisted in two separate investigations surrounding threats made to persons over wildlife concerns. And at headquarters, three Game Wardens continued their training as instructors in advanced law enforcement rapid response training called ALERT to be able to teach active shooter response to the game wardens of Nevada in the environments that they work. <clears throat> a game warden captain, spoiler alert, it's me, and our law enforcement public information officer attended the National Association of State Boating Law Administrators Conference in Pittsburgh, game warden captain Brian Bowles, that's me again, the state of Nevada boating law administrator was appointed to the NASBLA executive board. Two game wardens have become instructors and have started training game wardens in de-escalation tactics as a new effort in law enforcement protocol and procedures for handling calls with the public. The chief game warden and game warden captains have held meetings with all field personnel and game warden lieutenants in each Endow region. A game warden captain and Western region game warden lieutenant held a regional meeting with law enforcement partners on the Nevada side of Lake Tahoe regarding this boating season and future plans for training and response to incidents in a coordinated fashion with all law enforcement in that area. You can see we're pretty busy. And with that, I'll end and kick it back um, to you for any questions and our secretary and director Wasson. Thank you, Captain Bowles. Congratulations on your appointment. Any questions for Captain Bowles? 
in law enforcement. It seems to me that, um, and maybe, maybe it's just because we're in, in hunting season, but there seems to be a lot more activity. Is that accurate or is, is that typically the case? You know, I, I think, um, it's busier now, of course, because we're in the hunt and we also have the tail end of boating season. So everybody's going in all, all of our different separate directions at once. But it also seems typical. So perhaps we're just preparing a more detailed report for you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Secretary Wasley? Anything uh, no, Madam Chair, that, that concludes our department activity report. And again, I'll, as always, I really appreciate the opportunity to highlight uh, just some of the activities occurring throughout our, our agency. So thank you for that. You bet. Okay, we'll move on then to agenda item 6B, litigation report, Deputy Attorney General Craig Burkett. A report will be provided on the Nevada Department of Wildlife litigation. Good morning. Good morning. Chairwoman East and the members of the commission, I'm happy to report that since the preparation of our litigation report, a month ago, we received a positive result from the Nevada Supreme Court. The court uh, affirmed a dismissal from the district court of a challenge to Nevada's predator management program, specifically the, uh, the statute uh, dealing with the 80% mandate for lethal removal of predators. Um, which makes it two straight cases in a row. We're happy to say that the Department of Wildlife and uh, I believe the Wildlife Commission was, was brought into one of those suits that we've had positive results for. So we are happy that um, we've had uh, two good results uh, in the last couple of years on challenges to departmental and commission uh, authorities. As they say, though, pride goeth before the fall. <laughs> so we'll maintain, we'll be, we'll stay humble and uh, we'll be ready for the next adverse result, which I'm sure will come down the road. Um, but that's really uh, all we have other than uh, Tony Walsh from our office is going to take over man handling of all of the Department of Wildlife uh, water law cases from here on down the road. And Tony, by the way, is exceptional. Uh, and uh, I'm hoping to groom him for someday when uh, I move on to retirement, <laughs> not tomorrow, but someday, I'm hoping he's gonna take over wildlife work because he, he has a desire for it. And uh, so we're happy to say that Tony's gonna take that over. And uh, he's young and, and uh, got a lot of enthusiasm for the work too, so. Um, and that's all I have for the litigation report. And I would be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Um, and we won't get too excited over the wins, but congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> any questions for Dag Burkett? I don't see any. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item number 6C. Do we have our recipient with us? Oh, there he is, okay. Fantastic. The Wayne E. Kirch 2018 award presentation. I think that's wrong. Is it 2018? It is, it is, it is wrong. It's wrong it's, in two ways. It says 2018 award presentation. And then in the write-up, it says 2021. It's actually the 2020. So it's, it's wrong in both places. Fortunately, it's, uh, it's an informational item. So yeah. we're, we're okay from a procedural standpoint, but uh, apologies from the department. No worries. Let me read the description and then I'll give give it back over to you. Um, so the Wayne E. Kirch 2018 award presentation, Chairwoman East. Chairwoman East will present the 20, I guess we'll fix it, to 2020 Wayne E. Kirch Award that acknowledges a deserving individual, nonprofit organization, outdoor sports club or business who have achieved significant results toward the conservation management or enhancement of wildlife in the state of Nevada during the last calendar year. And I think Secretary Wasley is going to provide a little bit of background on the Kirch Award, um, given that we have some new commissioners. So. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll just provide a little background on the award, a little history on the namesake uh, for everyone's um, 
awareness, but the, the Wayne E. Kirch Conservation Award is given annually by the commission. This is a commission award. This is your award uh, to, to give, and it's given to recipients who've demonstrated significant results towards conservation, management, or enhancement of wildlife. It's named in memory of Wayne E. Kirch, who served on the Fishing Game Commission for more than 25 years, if you can imagine, uh, the longest tenure on the board since its inception in 1877. Uh, Mr. Kirch passed away in 1989. So the commission's Kirch Award judging panel chooses a winner from a pool of, of nominations sent in from around the state. And the judging panel is made up of two wildlife commissioners, uh, Marlene Kirch, daughter of former Commissioner Wayne E. Kirch, and then four County Advisory Board uh, members or outdoor groups. So I, I want to uh, I want to read uh, two things. One is uh, a press release from 1977 when um, Wayne left the Fish and Game Commission uh, after more than 26 years. And then I'd also like to read some of his accomplishments during his career, just as background again on, on the namesake, and then I'll turn it over to, to Julie. So af after more than 26 years of service and leadership in wildlife conservation, Wayne E. Kirch of Las Vegas has recently resigned from his duties with the Nevada State Board of Fish and Game Commissioners. Kirch began serving on the Fish and Game Board in 1951 by appointment and was subsequently elected by Clark County voters to the 17-man commission for five four-year terms. During this period, he served as chairman of the commission and its executive board. After the state legislature changed the commission from a 17-man elected board to a nine-man appointed by the governor board in 1969, Kirch received successive appointments from governors Laxalt and O'Callaghan. During his service with the commission, Kirch proposed and championed the state wildlife management area concept and personally negotiated the purchase and establishment of the key Pittman wildlife management area. It was through his interest and dedication that both the federal Willow Beach fish hatchery and the state Lake Mead fish hatchery were constructed in Southern Nevada. Kirch has served continuously as chairman of the Colorado River Fish and Wildlife Council and as chairman of the Nevada Predator and Rodent Control Committee since 1952. Again, this was a press release written in 1977. As a member of the Pacific Flyway Council for 19 years, and as a former member of the Advisory Committee on Federal Land Law Revision. Kirch's many honors include recognition as Conservationist of the Year by Nevada Wildlife Federation, Honorary Life Member Award by the Western Association of, of State Fish and Game Commissioners, the Charles A. Ritchie Memorial Award from the National Park Service, dedication of the 14,000 acre Wayne E. Kirch Wildlife Management Area in his name, as well as numerous civic awards, including Nevada's Outstanding Citizen. Uh, at, at the uh, 1977 Western Association meeting in Tucson, Arizona, he was presented with a special honor award, the second of only two such awards given by the association in its prior 57 year history. Kirch had been instrumental in securing annual grants for the Nevada Department of Fish and Game in the amounts of 50,000 to 75,000, uh, which was a lot more money then than it might be now, uh, from the Law, Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority to be used to supplement the Fish and Game program in Southern Nevada. Uh, Kirch was the owner and manager of Wayne's Auto Body in Las Vegas and a member of the Bank of Nevada Board of Directors. Uh, I'd just like to, to lastly just kind of read through a, a couple of his uh, accomplishments through his career. Uh, served as a member of the Board of Directors of the Las Vegas Chamber of Commerce on uh, multiple occasions. Served a term as board a member of the Board of Directors and the Boy Scout Organization under the late Rex Bell. Served as chairman and or committee member of the International Association of Game and Fish Commissioners Committee for over five years. Served as chairman and or committee member of the Western Association of Game and Fish Commissioners Committee for 12 years. Brought all the major wildlife concerns uh, to Las Vegas during the last 12 years, including uh, international, excuse me, um, he brought all the major wildlife conferences uh, to Las Vegas during uh, a 12 year period, including the International Association of Game and Fish Commissioners, the Western Association of State Game and Fish Commissioners, and the North American Wildlife Conference. Served as a member of the National Flyway Council and represented the state of Nevada on the Pacific Flyway Council for 10 years, 
um, and had presented approximately 25 papers on wildlife management subjects on regional and national levels. Served on the Nevada Fish and Game uh, Commission, as I said, over 26 years, and uh, a bulk of that as chairman. Uh, some other positions held in, wild, in the wildlife field consist of a member and continuous chairman since 1952 of the State of Nevada Predatory Animal Rodent Control Committee, member and continuous chairman of the seven state Colorado River Fish and Wildlife Council, chair, committee member of four national and regional wildlife management committees, awarded life membership to the Las Vegas Sportsman's Club, awarded National Wildlife Federation Patron Conservation Award, received Sportsman of the Year Award from the Nevada Federated Sportsman, received two Outstanding Service Award by uh, state sportsman organizations, received Nevada Outstanding Citizen Award in 1964, and received 11 Home Club and District Rotary plaques and awards. Um, so no uh, shortage of accomplishments and accolades uh, to Wayne Kirch, a great namesake for this award. And we're very honored and, and proud um, to have a role in the commission's awarding of, of this year's Wayne E. Kirch Award. And for that, um, I'll, I'll turn it over to Julie um, from the Conservation Education Division who provides uh, support staff to the commission uh, for this award on this committee. Thanks, Tony. Um... We have our winner on and Tiffany is going to give him that award, but thank you, Tiffany, for your help with organizing this award and going over all the nominations. And we every year we have outstanding nominations and um, we're really glad that we can give this to this year's recipient. So thank you. Julie, and um, it's a, an honor and a privilege for me to participate in this process this year with, for this distinguished award. And so I'm going to read a little bit about our recipient and then um, have him maybe say a few words as well. So for the 2020 Wayne E. Kirch Nevada Wildlife Conservation Award, the commission would like to honor Leonard Warren. Len not only has dedicated many years of life towards conservation, but was able to accomplish conservation goals even during the challenging events of 2020. Len's work will benefit Nevada's wildlife and Nevadans for years to come. Len Warren is described by his colleagues and friends as a force of nature and a force for nature. Len has worked for many years for the Nature Conservancy. His time with TNC has led him to form many meaningful relationships in the name of conservation. In 2020, he succeeded in mobilizing interest, funding, and community partnerships to restore bird habitats and populations along the Amargosa River in Ash Meadows National Wildlife Refuge and throughout the Oasis Valley. Len has a determination, passion, and commitment to conservation that exceeds expectations. His work spans throughout the state from his habitat work in Southern Nevada to leading bird walks for the public in Northern Nevada. Len is always looking for ways to connect people to nature. He has often gone out of his way to put himself in a position to share his knowledge of nature with others, such as teaching rural school kids in Amargosa Valley on how to plant willow cuttings and mentoring a landscape architecture class at UNLV on how to incorporate wildlife into urban planning. In the words of his colleague, John Zablocki, if I said that right. Len is a rare combination of visionary thinker and tireless doer. He is as determined as anyone I've ever known to make a positive difference, not only for Nevada's wildlife, but in helping people to understand, appreciate, and find meaning in wildlife conservation. I hope the commission will join me in welcoming and thanking Mr. Warren for his efforts. Can we get a round of applause virtually? <laughs> Mr. Warren, would you like to say a few words? Yes, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, yeah. My name's Len Warren, as you heard, and I'm the Amargosa River Project Manager for the Nature Conservancy. And look at this <laughs> beautiful award with a bighorn sheep and a gambles quail. Um, it's very heavy and high quality and beautiful. And, I'm quite proud. Um, I like to say first that I'm going to accept this award on behalf of more than 20 other of my coworkers in the Nature Conservancy in Nevada. 
I'm often the one that gets on the front line and gets my name in the paper for doing different projects and so on. But there's a lot of people in our organization that work tremendously hard and um, each one of them are uh, equally deserving of this award uh, from uh, your commission. And um, the people that nominated me, I really appreciate their efforts on giving me some recognition. It was quite uh, humbling to listen to all the awards that Wayne Kirch received over his throughout his career. So this is my first one and um, I sure am quite proud of it. Thank you. Well, you're very welcome. Uh, there were some great nominations and yours rose to the top. So we appreciate you being here with us today. I'm sorry it couldn't have happened sooner, but um, it is what it is. <laughs> so congratulations. Anyone else have any comments or thoughts? Secretary Madam Chair, yes. if, if I might, I, I just like to congratulate Mr. Warren as well. Um, and thank him for all all he does to contribute to conservation in Nevada. We we appreciate you. We appreciate our agency's partnership with the Nature Conservancy, and uh, are are truly grateful that that you're out there uh, as a as a conservation champion and a conservation uh, warrior and and a doer. Because as we all know, um, it's it's far too easy to to sit around and talk about things. It's a lot easier to talk about them than it is to actually get out there on the ground and do them. So we we appreciate uh, all that you do for conservation in the, in Nevada. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. Uh, moving on to agenda item 6D, predation management fiscal year 2021 report, wildlife staff specialist, Pat Jackson. The game division will present the 2021 predation management report per commission policy 23. The department shall prepare an annual predation management status report detailing results of the previous fiscal year's projects the status report will be presented at the last commission meeting of each calendar year. Mr. Jackson. You're on mute, Mr. Jackson. Thank you. Hello, commission. Uh, Pat Jackson, staff specialist for the record. And I am here to present the uh, fiscal year 2020 predator report. Uh, this is informational only. Uh, I will be uploading the written Predator report to our website uh, this next week. Uh, I have uh, some slides that I will present and I have uh, three different projects that outside collaborators will also be giving a, uh, a short presentation on. So sit back, relax, and I'll get started after I share my screen. Sorry, you'd think I'd be a little better this two years into the pandemic. Okay. Do you need a few minutes? No, I, I have my screen up. It's just, uh, can, can you see that slide? I can see that it says started screen sharing, but we don't see anything beyond that. It's black. Okay. Stop sharing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chalk this discussion up to the Zoom update. So it's Zoom's fault, not mine. Probably. There we go. How's that? Good. Great. As I said, this is the fiscal year 2021 uh, predator management status report. So uh, a little bit about our uh, $3 fee uh, resume or bibliography. Uh, we have some manuscripts that have been published this last year. Uh, this is a title of, uh, of a manuscript. Uh, we are about to have over 10 manuscripts on ravens, common ravens and special uh, 
special session. And I would encourage anybody that's interested to go to your favorite search engine, uh, uh, type in Endow Predator Management, and then check, click on our $3 uh, Predator Bibliography to check out all those different uh, scientific products that have resulted all or in part from our uh, $3 Predator fee. A little bit about the $3 Predator fee. Uh, right now, it generates about $800,000 annually. Uh, 14,000 of that annually goes to the Department of Agriculture for administrative uses. The rest uh, remain for predator plans that are approved in the annual predator project that I present to the commission three separate times. It's also used for staff salary. And unlike several other types of uh, uh, state funding, this does not revert back to a general fund. It goes to a reserve account uh, if not spent and is available uh, from one fiscal year to the next. The three types of uh, appropriate expenditures for the $3 predator fee are the management of predatory wildlife, uh, research on lethal control techniques, and the protection of sensitive species. So a little bit about the budget summary for fiscal year 2020. Uh, in, in fiscal year 2019, which is the most recent year that we have accurate accounting for uh, when I presented the uh, uh, the fiscal year 2020 plan was $717,000 in revenues. Uh, we do have that 80% mandate, and so mandated to spend uh, just over $573,000 on lethal uh, predator management. And we did fall short uh, uh, the, this fiscal year 2020 uh, due, to, due to COVID. And I have this slide. If you, if you see this, I, I think everybody got the memo that we've been uh, living with a virus, and so I will uh, 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 give some examples on how uh, COVID-19 slowed down, halted, or altered uh, our, our plans and what we intended to do. So uh, on to the various projects from fiscal year 2020. Uh, project 21, this is a project to protect greater sage-grouse and increase nest success by the lethal removal of ravens. Uh, it's a collaboration with USDA Wildlife Services. Uh, we removed uh, just over 1,500 ravens this year, and uh, there were a slew of challenges with us getting the uh, removal areas to them a little later than ideal, uh, difficulty finding eggs, difficulty uh, having enough staff to deploy those eggs. And so we, uh, we, didn't, we didn't reach uh, as many lethal, we, we did not remove as many ravens as we had hoped. Uh, and we spent uh, uh, well under the allotted amount. Uh, project 2201, uh, this is uh, mountain lion removal for the protection of bighorn sheep in uh, hunt units 011 and 013. This is a California bighorn population. Uh, it's something we've been working on several years now. Uh, it's a collaboration with USDA Wildlife Services and private contractors to proactively remove mountain lions year round. And Wildlife Services removed three lions in 011 and two in 013. And we had a uh, contract to remove an additional two in 011. And uh, we were just over budget on, on this project. And I would say that the those two bighorn sheep populations are fairly static and that we end out, uh, would recommend continuing this project until uh, population viability is reached. And uh, those definitions of population viability are defined in our annual predator report. Uh, project 22074, very similar to the previous project. However, uh, this is for the protection of Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep. Uh, this project is a little further along down the road where it began as lethal predator removal, removing lions. Uh, we also deployed some GPS transmitters on sheep, determined that sheep really weren't being consumed by lions and transitioned to just a monitoring project. Uh, the population estimate uh, is currently 25. Uh, 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 I'm sorry, Rocky Mountain bighorns. And we have not had a known predation event since 2016. And we did have a slight reduction in uh, our overall population estimate. And that was because of the removal of some individuals that commingled with domestic sheep. And we would also recommend the continuation of this project until uh, it reaches uh, population viability as stated in our annual predator plan. Uh, project 37. This is uh, uh, a statewide uh, project allowing us, the department, to remove mountain lions uh, on a on a case by case yet quick basis. And so we work with area game biologists, and they reach out to me 
or uh, to wildlife services or our contractor whenever we believe mountain lions are, are uh, posing an issue predominantly with bighorn sheep. Uh, and then we also use this project to go in and, uh, and remove mountain lions prior to a, a, a bighorn sheep release. And then we use both USDA wildlife services and contractors for this. Uh, in this last fiscal year, we had wildlife services remove one lion in 032, uh, and then a, a private contractor removed several lions uh, over the course of the state. And uh, we really think this is an important project and recommend its continuation. Project 38, uh, very similar to the previous project, uh, but just allows us to remove coyotes uh, quickly on a case-by-case -case basis. I work with area biologists. This is predominantly for pronghorn protection. And uh, we remove coyotes in the spring to create temporary voids to increase uh, fawn survival of pronghorns uh, that sensitive time of the year. And we use wildlife services to conduct both aerial and ground removal. And we recommend the continuation of, uh, of this project. Uh, project 40 is a multifaceted management in Eureka County. Uh, several years ago, uh, Eureka County funded their own pinny juniper removal, uh, coyote removal, and then some horse uh, roundup was conducted. Uh, Endow came in after that and has been removing coyotes and also mountain lions some years to uh, try to allow this uh, deer herd to rebound. We've also put some GPS transmitters on does uh, during that time. And we use wildlife services to conduct those removals. In this fiscal year, 114 coyotes and three coyote dens were removed for the protection of, uh, of, of mule deer. We support this project until that population reaches viability. Uh, project 41, another project uh, uh, impacted by COVID, you can uh, summon and insert your favorite COVID Corbin joke here. Uh, we, uh, we only deployed eight Argos transmitters. Uh, I have not been, or until recently, I have not been able to hire technicians to go out and capture ravens. Uh, there's a long learning curve to that. And the folks that we had trained up uh, during COVID went on to greener pastures. And so there's another learning curve to go through to catch ravens to deploy transmitters. Uh, we, the department also hosted a raven workshop uh, a few months ago in Elko County. And uh, it was a, a really, I, I think, a smashing success. We, pro we provided a lot of detailed reports on some of the findings from this project. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we've got over 10 manuscripts coming out uh, on all, all sorts of things to do with uh, raven population estimates, uh, lethal raven removal, uh, whole nine years. And we, uh, we recommend continuing uh, this, this, this collaboration, which is a collaboration with us and uh, U.S. Geological Survey and peak coats. Uh, so now on to our assessing mountain lion harvest in Nevada. Uh, and instead of providing you with the details, this is the first of three outside presentations. So uh, Missy, if you have not already done so, please uh, allow Dr. Pete Mahoney uh, presenting privileges. And I will stop sharing my screen. And Peter, you are on mute. Try that again. Okay, that didn't unclick the first time. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Excellent. All right, first, I uh, just wanted to say thank you to the commission and to Pat for permitting us an opportunity to talk about the work that we've been working on for the past couple of years uh, with the Predator Program. Uh, to start, basically, this is part of the work that uh, I, had, I had worked with, uh, sorry, completed rather, while working with Dr. John Benson at the University of Nebraska as a postdoc. Uh, and what we- Hey, Peter, we don't, we don't see your uh, slides. At least I don't. Anybody, uh, let's see. If he was sharing slides yet or not. Right, it's the same try. Zoom update that got me. <laughs> uh oh let's try that again. How about now? We just see a black screen. Huh. Pat, what did you end up doing to solve that? Uh, I ended up uh, not having PowerPoint on presenter mode and I shared my screen, was able to present it in, in the view that you would have if you were drafting or creating slides. Right. And then after I successfully shared the screen, I then switched to presenter mode. So I don't know if that's the ticket or not. 
Let's try that. All right, can we see those slides at least to start? Not yet. Funny, I just tried this out yesterday and Zoom didn't have any difficulty. Don't know well, we had a Zoom update apparently last night. Yeah, because yeah, on my end, it's showing me as having shared, but it doesn't sound like it's coming through, huh? We can see that you're sharing your screen, but we don't see an image. Pat, do you happen to have those? Slides? Yeah, I was just going to say, Peter, if you want, I could try to share my screen of your slides and. Let's do that. Um, I think we can just play cool. the next slide game. Yeah, because unfortunately on my side, it's showing me a sharing. I'm not going to see my slides, but uh, that's odd. All right, I stopped sharing. we go. All right, great. Okay. Thank you. Sorry for the trouble and sorry for the delay there. I'll go ahead and advance the slide then if you would, Pat. All right, so to start Broad Brush, basically uh, the motivation behind this project and it's showing 44, unfortunately I, I updated this to project to, uh, 42, which I believe is the appropriate project number here. But the motivation behind this project was basically to help develop a tool to help support management uh, and provide a mechanism for evaluating mountain lion population trends within the state of Nevada. Go ahead and advance if you would. You can advance all the way uh, one more time or in, in a second time here. So basically, you know, often when we're evaluating population trends, we're often doing so using a, a broader time series uh, associated with population surveys and survey effort. Uh, given the notoriously difficult nature of, of trying to track and monitor uh, mount lines is often difficult to achieve. And so the way we get about this is often through population reconstruction, which is to include information related to things like harvest, demography, which is often achieved through, say, tracking and, and, and uh, using uh, colored and telemetered animals to, to tell us a bit more about survival and reproduction. In addition, we often have additional sources of survey data that maybe wasn't originally collected for the explicit intent of developing population estimates. But all of these items in concert can be uh, incorporated into uh, an integrated population model, as the name would otherwise imply. Uh, but oftentimes, you'll hear these types of models referred to as population reconstruction. So in essence, that's what we try to do, was to use these retrospectively to assess population trends in Nevada. Go ahead and advance, if you would, Pat. So uh, given the, the challenges associated with integrated population models, they being often quite data hungry, uh, we divided this project into two different phases to determine in part during phase one, whether or not it was feasible to construct an integrated population model using existing data uh, that was provided not only from NDAL, but from various collaborators on various projects in the past. Uh, this portion of the project was completed back in January, 2020. And we determined that, pro that possibilities associated with an, an integration, integrated population model were certainly feasible. Uh, to achieve, but but there were some caveats therein, uh, in the sense that we, I won't go through the specifics here. I'm certainly happy to address questions at a later stage. But the point being is that there were certain pieces of data that I think would allow us to generate a full IPM uh, with with you know with additional with longer time series and more comprehensive sampling than what was achieved in the past. Um, however. Uh, we did think we had sufficient data to move forward with actually developing the model, which is what we uh, strive to achieve in, in phase two and was ultimately completed in June uh, 2021. And uh, the beautiful thing about this model now is that at least the framework is established such that as new data or novel data come in, we can actually expand the model and, and develop more robust estimates as we move forward. Uh, go ahead and advance the slide if you would, Pat. You can go ahead and advance again. So uh, the focus of this talk in particular is going to be on phase two, uh, where I will be, uh, in essence, outlining, in essence, the, the the composition of the model, as well as, in essence, some of the, the results that we derived from that model itself. So this particular model that we have here is actually relying almost exclusively on agent harvest data, uh, which in this case represents a fairly long time series going as far back as the 1960s. Uh, and this provides, in essence, the back the backbone to the overall model. Go ahead and advance. Uh, tr uh, make it advance three times if you would, Pat, just to save myself the trouble having to do so. Uh, however, we're able to actually incorporate additional information into this model related to both unobserved survival, uh, non-harvest rates, and harvest rates associated with uh, uh, 
uh, uh, mortality processes within this population. In addition, we incorporate uh, information related to uh, litter size, uh, reproductive probabilities, and uh, male-female sex ratios within litters. Uh, given the fact that these patterns are not static, in essence, they vary from year to year, we also incorporated uh, uh, variables that allowed these, these particular demographic metrics to vary on an annual basis to account for interannual variation. Uh, but once we build this broader model, the goal was to ultimately derive an estimate of statewide abundance. Go ahead and advance if you would, Pat. But looking at the age at harvest data a little bit more closely, this is the time series I was referring to from the late 1960s. Uh, the data set that we had available to us at the time was through about 2014. You'll notice that basically there was uh, a trend in the early years towards increased harvest. Uh, we actually, as is market, marked here by a dashed line, uh, truncated the earlier portion of the time series in order to uh, ultimately simplify the modeling effort here so that we didn't account for those earlier trends. So largely here, this model will be focusing on 1987 and afterwards. Uh, but as we see here, this is broken down into the overall harvest and non-harvest rates of both uh, across age classes from adult uh, kittens and subadults, as well as unknown reported individuals. And as you can see, the harvest is predominantly composed of or comprised of uh, adult individuals within the population. Of course, this assumes that we're able to properly uh, age uh, class animals once they are turned in for harvest, which is very challenging in and of itself to do. Uh, and so we suspect that subadults in particular likely uh, make up some portion of that adult uh, segment of the population being presented here. Uh, the non-harvest component, important to mention, actually is referring to not necessarily natural mortality, but in fact, uh, mortality associated with non-harvest, or sorry, with non-harvest activities. So this could be predator removal. Uh, this could be, you know, uh, incidental take. Uh, it could be uh, animals that were hit by cars as well. So generally anthropogenically driven sources of mortality. Uh, uh, go ahead and Vince. If we look at this a little bit more closely, because females are such an important component of the population, uh, this also, uh, in essence, demonstrates the fact that uh, there is or appears to be, at least in more recent years, a slight male bias in terms of the overall harvest, which is to be expected in general, given the animals that are generally targeted in a harvest scenario. Uh, but it also suggests that our, our truncation of the time series post-1987 uh, was, was also uh, to at least deal with some of that uncertainty and variability we see in the harvest uh, during those earlier years. Uh, versus in uh, years after 1987, it seems to, in essence, stabilize with that slight male bias. Go ahead and advance, if you would, Pat. So the model, once built, basically, we were able to generate, in essence, a time series of, of abundances as far back as 1987. And this is, in essence, the model predicted estimates, which suggests the population is uh, bounded, in essence, between 3,000 uh, 3, and 4,000 individuals. Uh, uh, population growth, which is represented here by lambda on the top side of the figure, uh, it, in this case, values above one represent a growing population. Values below one, in essence, indicate a declining population. In this case, however, our confidence intervals, which are represented by the bracketed values, overlap with one, which suggests at least that we cannot statistically tease us apart from what, has, what, what, what uh, appears to be a stable population. I'll go ahead and advance, Pat. And if we look at the model predictive vital rates, uh, so in this model, we actually, uh, we incorporate some prior information related to vital, rate, vital rates from this population using both historical data as well as data from the published literature. However, age at harvest data, as one might expect, also helps to inform these vital rates. And so here we have uh, model predicted estimates, annual estimates for various vital rates that we uh, monitored uh, in this particular model. Uh, throughout, though, I'll be focusing your attention using bolded text, and in this case, looking at survival or the un unobserved survival component within this population. And this is largely referring to what we would likely believe are natural sources of mortality. Uh, what we see is that at least there was no apparent sex differences in, in, in unobserved survival, though this is in large part probably driven by the fact that we didn't have a lot of power to tease us apart. Uh, however, uh, it suggests that survival is approximately about 85% annually for both males and females. Uh, in, in a general sense, independent of overall harvest. Go ahead and advance, if you, if you would. If we look at harvest rates specifically, we, we did see differences in harvest rates between males and females, which was pretty apparent from the data itself. In this case, there appears to be a slight male bias 
but on average between the two, it's probably approximately 5% of, of Nevada's population is being harvested annually. And there is, of course, uh, a fair amount of interannual inter variation uh, from year to year. And this is probably related to, of course, not only hunter harvest effort, but also environmental conditions that might be more conducive to take. Uh, go ahead and advance if you would. If we look at uh, non-harvest rates, uh, we didn't see any difference between males and females. Um, we see an underlying signal of approximately 1.5% of the population uh, being harvested via non-harvest means and, and ultimately uh, dying as a result of anthropogenic causes. Advance if we would. If we look at it specifically within uh, the kitten age class, by the way, previously, I, 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 in case I wasn't clear about that, those previous estimates were specifically for adults and sub-adults combined. Uh, here, we look at the rates uh, which the model supported in essence separating out rates uh, specifically for kittens. In this case, harvest and non-harvest rates are statistically non-significantly diff significantly different from one another, and both appear to be less than 1% of the population. Uh, in general, this is suggesting that harvest and non-harvest related or anthropogenic causes of mortality associated with kittens uh, is, is relatively small within the population. Go in advance if you would, Pat. And if we look at the reproductive rates, vital rates associated with this population, we see that adult female fecundity, uh, which is basically annual productivity of, of females in terms of kitten production here, is, is just over one individual per year. Uh, we also see that, in essence, just over half of the female population is reproducing any given year. And this is likely due to the extensive parental care that, that these mothers often provide, uh, such that they're often on a two-year breeding cycle. Uh, in addition, we see that there might be potentially a slight female, uh, sorry, slight male bias uh, within the uh, within the litters, suggesting that the, that uh, females are slightly less prevalent within these litters, uh, and may explain actually why we see a slight male bias in the harvest overall. Uh, go ahead and advance if you would, Pat. So. There are, of course, some limitations to these models, as with every model. Uh, no model is perfect. Uh, in this case, uh, several uh, of the, the more important assumptions I highlight here, which is basically that our models here it really dependent upon a, a fairly robust and fairly accurate representation of the initial population size. Uh, this can be improved moving forward uh, if we find a means to, to conduct periodic surveys uh, for mountain lion abundance that can help sort of stabilize and bracket our expectations of population size. But despite that, uh, our models did seem to perform be, to perform quite well within within the constraints that we provided. A second assumption here is that harvest rates, non-harvest rates, and survival did not vary in relation to either harvest effort or environmental conditions. In other words, we had to take a fairly straightforward approach to this, uh, given the data that were available to us. But as new data become available, we can actually expand this to explore these things a little bit more closely uh, to better understand, in essence, other factors uh, and how those other factors might be influencing uh, of vital rates, but specifically uh, survival in this case. So some pot potential solutions to this, of course, is to continue with telemetry tracking efforts, uh, specifically targeting a representative sample of mountain lions across the state in the various management units so that we can develop reliable and robust estimates of, of, of survival. The, the final assumption here I'm going to highlight, though, is that this was informed by uh, accurate vital rate estimates, which I've already kind of highlighted with respect to survival. But this also applies to reproductive rates. And of course, if we take a uh, more direct hand in the monitoring of individuals in this broader population, we can hopefully develop uh, uh, more, more present day estimates or accurate estimates for present day uh, fecundity, interbirth intervals, you know, in other words, how frequently they're breeding from year to year. And then of course, what the sex ratio is uh, amongst the kittens therein. And all of this, of course, if you wanna go ahead and advance uh, to the next slide, uh, will give us a, a more solid and more robust model with, with greater precision in our estimates in the end. Uh, so as, as in summary, uh, what we see is that Nevada uh, mountain lion population appears to be generally stable, at least between the years of 1987 to 2015. Uh, with Pat's help, we will probably push this through using the most current harvest data that we have available to us. Um, the present model provides a nice solid framework for expanding as additional data become available. Uh, in addition, you know, I think the hope is long term is that this model can be turned into a more spatially explicit model that will not only provide robust population estimates uh, statewide, but also allow us to drill this down a little bit more closely and evaluate populations at the management unit level. And so with that, uh, if you go ahead and advance, Pat, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. I should highlight that, of course, you know, John and I, you know, we both have worked with mountain lions in other states. We've never worked in Nevada, so we are always welcome. Uh, we always welcome feedback with respect to people's individual perceptions, as well as, uh, you know, their given past experiences uh, with mountain lions in the state of Nevada. And feel free to email us. Does anyone have questions for Dr. Mahoney? 
Commissioner Rogers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you may have answered it, uh, Mr. Mahoney, on the on the previous slide, but you know your harvest number percentage and non-harvest percentage on the mortalities. I think it was five percent on the uh, harvest rate, and then the non-harvest rate about one and a half percent. With that six and a half percent, as I figure, overall um, uh, harvest and non-harvest, what do you feel that that is uh, doing for our mountain lion population? Is is it increasing year over year? Is it relatively the same? Is it declining? Uh, just curious your thoughts on that. No, it's a great question. And one that, um, you know, at least as far as the broad picture, you know, it appears to be not at least driving the population down. Uh, whether or not the population would actually increase in the absence of it is, is difficult to say, and I haven't actually explored that. Uh, one of the things that, you know, we've talked with Pat about potentially pursuing in the future is to actually look at that uh, from a viability perspective and see to what extent, you know, perhaps perturbations to vital, uh, sorry, rather harvest rates might have on the population moving forward. And so it's, it's really, I think, a separate analysis, but one that could certainly be done either in this framework or by taking what we've cleaned here and applying it in a population viability context. Okay. Other questions? I don't see any. Can you tell us um, what is the the age, the kitten age? I was just curious. Yeah, I, I wasn't clear. No, it's a great question. I wasn't very clear about that. But the you know the kittens in this case we we refer to in essence as dependent young. Uh, here in the in this particular model, though, given the way it was structured, we treated that as any individual that was uh, you know twelve months or younger. Twelve months or younger. Okay. And that in, a, that in and of itself will vary from population to population. So kittens can be considered as, as old as 14 to 16 months, depending upon um, how long they reside with the mother. Okay. All right, other questions? Commissioner McNinch. Thank you, Madam Chair. I guess I didn't have a, a question necessarily. I just uh, a quick comment. It, it definitely, uh, your presentation, um, Certainly gets the mind working, uh, Peter. I appreciate the uh, uh, work that you're doing, and and uh, it's been one of the most difficult uh, things is how do you how do you establish a, a reliable uh, estimation process for you know predator uh, populations. So um, I do appreciate the time and effort that's gone into this. Um, uh, I think it uh, it provides a lot of um, a lot of thought, uh, a lot of data that's uh, got my mind working. Trying to trying to understand it first of all, and make sure that I I understand it. And um, you know the applications. What does it mean? Is it uh, does it imply uh, you know potential um, increases in take? Does it imply uh, you know scientifically that uh, uh, you know maybe increases aren't necessary? Because uh, I guess the tie-in for me would ultimately be. What does it mean for um, the prey species? Um, you know, is it is it necessary uh, to increase harvest? Um, they're going to take they're going to take deer. <laughs> they're going to they're going to eat things. That's what they do. Um, and where does it become uh, additive to the mortality? I guess is is really the the tie in for me. And I don't know. Pat might have ideas on that, but um, I guess for me, the, the fact that we're taking a step here is a, is a big deal and. Um, I do appreciate the work, and certainly um, you've got my my mind trying to process and, and understand it. Uh, ben, Pat, are we going to? Is this uh, is this report going to be available to us? Is this uh, presentation going to be available to us so we can look through it again if we want? Uh, Pat Jackson, staff specialist, for the record. So uh, my PowerPoint slides, uh, Dr. Mahoney's PowerPoint slides, and all other slides will be available, and then in the written. Uh, report in the uh, uh, attachments there, uh, Dr. Benson, and Dr. Mahoney's report will be available uh, to everybody. Yes. Thank you. All right. Other questions? Commissioner uh, Weiss? Yeah. Um, and maybe you said this. I apologize if you did, but um, where are your values for non harvest, the non harvest mortalities coming from? Are those all reported? You were mentioning the incidental takes and the vehicle mortalities and stuff. So is that all reported from the public or? Precisely. Those were all reported, um, you know, from, from specifically Endow, as a matter of fact. Uh, Vice Chair Cavilia. Yeah, you, uh, 
Now I thought it was a great report. You did you did talk about telemetry. I know telemetry is um, an expensive deal to get. I would it putting out more collars. Would that be something to continue with this project to get a, a better model? Is that you kind of mentioned it in there a couple of times? Um, that would that create a, a better population model, or would that be a? I guess how many lines would you have to to call or to to be for that to be beneficial, the telemetry data? No, it's a great question. And, and I unfortunately didn't have a lot of time to cover it here, uh, but it is outlined. We provided various recommendations as far as, um, you know, how, how we can improve components of the model within actually two reports, our phase one report, as well as our phase two report. And so I, I would encourage all who are interested in, in, in what our recommendations might be to, to, to pursue that further. Telemetry, I mean, the truth of the matter is that we can glean a lot of information from, from marking animals. Um, it is, as you highlighted, an expensive venture, uh, but we often get a lot of uh, value returned in terms of the data that we ultimately uh, receive. And so, you know, one of, the, one of our goals here, uh, aside, of course, uh, from deriving, in essence, more robust estimates of survival through, you know, known fate processes, but also, you know, looking at reproductive rates by monitoring females, uh, the other key kind of component here that's lost in this is the fact that, you know, monitoring colored animals also provides us with better spatial context and where they're using space, how large their home ranges are, uh, and, and in essence gives us a, uh, you know, an indirect measure of what densities might be like as well. Uh, and, and the challenge with mountain lions in particular is that it's really hard to survey them and there's really no effect, cost effective way to do so at a statewide scale. Uh, however, as a trade-off, there are some opportunities there, and again, we highlight some of that in these reports, where we can perhaps use space as a surrogate for that, uh, and space, in this case, I'm referring to space used by these cats to, to derive a, a better understanding of, of what densities might actually be like on, this, on the landscape, and that can help, again, constrain the model and give us credit and greater precision on our final estimates. Does that answer your question? Commissioner Cavilia. Uh, yeah, and I guess the question for Pat, I mean, is there any intent to expand, expand this further with potentially doing some telemetry work? Uh, so Pat Jackson, staff specialist for the record. Uh, and I, I don't have uh, a, an answer for you on that right now. I, I will chime in that the department does support continuing this project and on this existing fiscal year, I'm continuing to work with Dr. Benson and Dr. Mahoney uh, to create a, a more usable uh, model known as R Shiny uh, for department employees. And then we're also in the works to uh, uh, publish this, this model. Uh, you know, it, we think this is a solid and defensible model and having this uh, captured in a peer reviewed manuscript uh, uh, only adds to its validity. As far as increasing our understandings of, uh, of, of our mountain lion population in the state, um, that's really not only up to me, but uh, you know, Upper Brass at Endow and, and you as a commission. So um, it's something I would be interested in, but we do have a long list of other conservation issues and challenges in the state. And so um, I, don't, I don't know where uh, conning more mountain lions uh, to inform our model. Uh, sits on that list. Okay, other questions? All right. Is, does that conclude your report, Mr. Jackson? Uh, for, for this project, we do have two more quick presentations. Okay. So I'm going to briefly share my screen. Okay. Uh, project 43, uh, this is a, uh, a lethal project. And actually, if I may back up a little bit, uh, uh, project 42 is the first project that I have shared that's considered a non-lethal project. Non-lethal projects uh, qualify for Pittman-Robertson funds. And so if you look at uh, this budget, 25% of these funds came from the $3 predator fee. The other 75% came from Pittman Robertson. Uh, and that we, we collaborate and use those funds uh, when we are not lethally removing animals. And so that was the first project that I presented on. Project 43 is a lethal project. 
uh, and this is the removal of uh, meso predators to protect various avian species on wildlife management areas. Uh, and we use wildlife services to, uh, to do this, to uh, conduct ground efforts to remove these meso predators. And we recommend continuing Project 43 uh, uh, pending, uh, pending funding availability, which I don't see that changing anytime soon. And you can see the removals of, uh, of various uh, uh, meso predators uh, across Mason Valley and Overton wildlife management areas. On to Project 44, uh, this started out, uh, we, have, we, the department, have attempted to uh, introduce and establish a bighorn sheep population in the Delamar Mountains for some time. They're there, but not as robust as we wished. And so uh, there have been historic attempts to remove lions. It's a very arid and difficult place to remove lions. When I came on, we, we continued that again. That evolved into uh, GPS marking lions uh, and only removing the individual lions that were consuming sheep. Uh, visiting their kill sites, uh, we had the realization that they were consuming a very impressive volume of uh, feral horses. And that led to a collaboration that's going to result in uh, an outside presentation uh, from uh, Dr. Stoner and Dr. Schoenacher uh, may be with us. She'd like to introduce herself as well. So I will stop sharing my screen. And if uh, Dr. Stoner could share his. And I have his slides if he's not able to, to share. Okay. Oh, and I also see, uh, I see Kate. Uh, if you guys would both introduce yourselves. Why don't you start? Hi, I'm, I'm Dr. Kate Scheneker. I'm a, a research ecologist for the U.S. Geological Survey at the Fort Collins Science Center, and I'm the um, program lead for the Wild Horse and Burrow um, program at USGS. It's a research program, and we study feral horse herds all across the West. Welcome. And I'm David Stoner. I'm in the uh, research faculty at Utah State University in the Department of Wildland Resources. Uh, my background has been in mountain lion uh, interactions with their prey and, and uh, harvest effects. So thank you for your time this morning. Thanks for having us. This project is just it is technically four years in, but it's taken, um, we, we've ramped up in the last year. And so what I'm going to present this morning are a few updates on some preliminary data, our objectives, and, and where things are going and, and how this, this is shaping up. Um, so let me, <laughs> I will try the screen share and we'll, we'll see what, what happens here, if it works or not. Yes. Can you see a uh, title slide there? Yes, Terrific. we can. Terrific. I, and I, I'd like to thank Pat for inviting us with these. This project got kicked off uh, several years ago. The three of us met at the Mountain Lion Workshop in Colorado, and we had some uh, very provocative discussions on this topic because, as you know, feral horses are a um, uh, rather difficult management conundrum in the West. And there are few, if any, natural checks on that. And so one of the things that has come to light, uh, not recently, there's been a, a bit of evidence for this over the last 30 years that, that they may be an important prey resource for mountain lions. And so my title here reflects one of our underlying objectives, which is is the incorporation of feral horses in the diet of mountain lions a product of chance encounters or, or just opportunistic, or is it in fact um, supporting populations in, in these very arid and um, prey to pauperate parts of the state? Um, as you all know, Nevada is in a unique position with respect to this This problem in that Nevada has more wild horses than all the rest of the West combined. And in fact, if you look at this map, the, 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 between the uh, herd management areas, herd areas, and wild horse and burrow territories, it forms a nearly contiguous distribution across the state. So these animals have, are established and are, are uh, 
really not in isolated pockets anymore. They, they have a, a fairly continuous distribution. Um, as I mentioned, there have been several other telemetry studies done in Nevada and, and then in California as well, showing that horses can uh, constitute in, in some places a significant part of the diet. And so as Pat referenced with this project, uh, the, the focus was on bighorn sheep and their vulnerability to mountain lion predation. And as we looked at what the, the lions were eating on that unit, this is uh, hunt units 241 and 242 in the southeastern part of the state. Uh, it turned out that horses uh, form a significant part of the diet. It's still very much a, a deer-based economy for these animals, uh, but horses are, are important. And so uh, radio telemetry was deployed. We're looking at predation. And then, uh, as, I, as I noted, uh, we, we formed a, um, a research collaboration several years ago with, with uh, Kate's agency, the USGS, uh, funding the graduate student we have on it and purchasing some of the telemetry collars and, and helping with uh, financial contributions. Utah State has uh, produced some uh, in-kind contributions, and the BLM is a... Uh, a partner, um, they are conducting gathers and some of their local staff have been very helpful to us. Uh, so this is the background, horses and Nevada is the driest state. So it, it really is a difficult situation. Um, our overarching questions here were, were quite simple. What, what percentage of the diet is comprised of horses? And within this, refer, referencing back to my title, are, are lions actually selecting for them? In other words, have they learned to, to seek horses as a reliable food resource, or is it simply that these horses are in deer habitat and are, are getting caught in the crossfire? Uh, and then importantly, the, the BLM's primary management intervention for uh, containing uh, abundance are, are gathers that are they're performed at odd intervals. And this really gets to the bighorn sheep question is, if the BLM is conducting large scale gathers and removing a lot of potential prey biomass, what do those mountain lions do in response? Do they shift their diet into uh, to bighorn sheep? That, that's our, our primary concern. Or do they increase deer consumption or they... they um, compensate by depredating livestock, other, other prey resources that they might not have relied on had those horses still been there. So the, the question is about the role of horses in, um, as a novel prey item and how does that influence the predator prey dynamics in, in this system. And then uh, lastly, I, I, I'm aware that one of the commission's concerns or questions is, the role of horses actually subsidizing mountain lions and allowing them to, to exist in areas they might not occur otherwise, or is there some kind of compensatory predation on mule deer? So we're, we're looking at um, their home range size and fertility rates to try and get an estimate of, of the role of horses in, <clears throat> do, do they, do they, are they supplementing these lion populations? Um, the, the map on the left just shows our study area. The, the yellow dots represent a camera grid that we've just established this summer. And the uh, pink polygons represent uh, three uh, fires that occurred in the summer of 2020, uh, where they, the BLM has gathered horses in an effort to prevent uh, range degradation and, and enhance uh, restoration efforts uh, in response to those fires. So our progress thus far, uh, since 2017, we've deployed 31 radio collars on mountain lions, a, a roughly even split between the sexes. Um, as noted, we put out 56 cameras, and this is to measure prey abundance. We think the critical variable here in getting at this question is estimating the deer to horse ratio. In other words, how many horses are there relative to deer in, in the, the, uh, on the study site and how does that compare with what the lions are eating? So it's a, a, a classic use versus availability kind of design. Are, are the lions eating deer uh, horses out of proportion to their availability or, or 
or are they selecting against them? Or are they eating them underneath their availability? Um, we have a graduate student that's just started who has spent the last six months in the field. We have a lot of data coming in. Um, while he is in, taking classes, we have some technicians that are holding down the fort. And then importantly, the, the treatment effect here, the BLM conducted a, a large gather on the Delamar and Clover herd areas last, uh, just about a year ago, it was early December, in which over 450 horses were removed again uh, as a response to restoration efforts for the range fires. Um, it, and so what we're looking at scientifically is how these mountain lions may have changed their predation behavior, their home range size, their movements in response to that gather. And again, this, this overnight loss in, in potential prey. So these are some preliminary results. Uh, the data are still coming in and there's a lot more to to be said about this, but on the x-axis, you see all of our collared mountain lions. The y-axis is the percent of the diet comprised of either deer or horses, uh, with the deer and the, the yellow and horses in brown. And there are some patterns are starting to emerge in this, in that we have a few animals that really seem to be dedicated deer hunters. And this is typical around the West. Uh, mule deer really are the primary prey species uh, over most, most of North America. Um, however, uh, don't, you know, stay tuned. This could change. Some of these bars are based on very small sample sizes. So some of these animals are fairly new. They've, they've just come on the air and we have not visited a lot of kill sites. So this could change. Our second category are these animals that supplement their diet with horses where they are still primarily deer hunters, but do indeed kill horses. And then, then lastly, these are our, our dedicated horse killers where they are largely consisting on horse flesh as a, uh, a food item. Now, if we look at this, we break it down by, by sex, we'll see two things. Uh, we have the, the females over here on the left. Uh, the females thus far fall more into the category of dedicated deer hunters, uh, though, uh, as, as you can see, there are some that, that do take horses. It's our males where we see these, these, um, these animals that are really uh, relying quite heavily on, on horses uh, to make ends meet. And again, because of the timing of putting animals on the air and how much time we've had to follow them in the field, these data will change. But this is in accordance with what previous research has demonstrated that with these unusually large prey items, and a horse is a massive animal, um, we see males predominantly being the ones who are, are taking this high risk prey item. Now, I should note that among the horses that are being killed, they're disproportionately foals. By and large, these are juveniles, uh, but not all of them. There actually are a few sub-adults and adults that are turning up, uh, um, which has been quite impressive to see. Um, when we look at seasonal patterns, it's again, we expected a spring pulse that coincides with the birthing season. And indeed spring is the period when more horses are taken, but it's pretty much year round. This is uh, suggestive that, that horses are an important resource and that it's perhaps not just incidental, but that they are, are reliant on, on this resource to some degree. And if you want to split it out proportionally, it's about a third, a third of the um, carcasses we picked up are horses, two thirds deer when looking at just those species. However, it's important to recognize there are other food items in the diet. The third most common prey item that we found are coyotes. They com comprise about 10% of the diet. We found, found a handful of elk, and a smattering of feral cattle and uh, feral uh, pigs. So a, a little bit of everything in these dry systems, beggars can't be choosers. And so they're capitalizing on everything that's available, but number one deer, number two horses and number three are coyotes. A, another caveat to this, a horse is a big animal, even a foal's the size of a, a full grown deer. 
Um, so in terms of biomass consumed, these numbers are, are actually biased. And if we look at the, uh, the total caloric value, what we'd see is something that approaches 50-50. Now, those, those calculations are yet to be uh, conducted, but the, the size difference uh, will influence these values. Um, I, I um, wanted to show you this video. This is footage that our student, Peter Iacono, took last summer. This is the Stewart Canyon burn. This is where the gather took place last Christmas. So within six months, we've had horse bands of horses colonizing this burn. Um, and remember, the gather was conducted specifically to... Um, keep these animals out of the restoration area. So they seem to, um, let me get out of this here. Um, um, they seem to be, whether moving in from outside or, or whether the BLM missed a few, it, it's unclear at this point, but um, those are our preliminary results. Uh, very interesting system, a lot going on here because of Nevada's position with having such large horse uh, populations. It really uh, puts the state in a uh, unique position for this, this um, uh, conundrum, wildlife management conundrum. And uh, we are really uh, pleased to be working with NDOW. Uh, feel very fortunate. It's a very interesting scientific question interesting management question. And um, we will be back next year with an update to uh, fill in as, as data come in. And, and with that, I'm, I'm happy to uh, take any questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. Stoner. That was just fascinating to me. <laughs> um, we've been looking at this horse, horse issue for some time. And I, my curiosity has been with Mr. Jackson, you know, how many of lions are, are consuming horses and been asking that question for a couple of years. So I was really excited to see this. Um, do we have any questions for, for Dr. Stoner or Dr. Schoenaker? Commissioner Olmberg. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Madam Chair. Um, my question is, is did, when they did the horse removal, did they do, did they uh, remove uh, or remove or reduce the, the horse population to uh, the appropriate management levels, or where, where did, what, what stopped the collecting, or what, what was uh, the dictating factor in how many horses they, they removed? I can answer that okay. if you want to add to it, David. Um, no, they just removed horses from that area. It was considered an emergency gather. And no, these one of these areas is a horse herd area, and there really shouldn't be any horses in this area. Um, so it's not a designated herd management area. BLM is allowed to zero out those HAs, the herd areas, uh, but they can't because they don't have the resources or the time or enough vendors to come and do the removals and or set up the traps. And um, I mean, I think that's, that's a problem all across your state right now. But um, no, they just they just captured as many as they could in a certain amount of time that they had with a, a helicopter to gather them. Other questions? Okay, I don't see any. Thank you very much for this. I'm I'm looking forward to hearing more next year. Yeah, one, one last tidbit uh, a takeaway here regarding uh, the, the question of are, are these horses supporting higher densities of lions? We, we cannot answer at this point. But what I can tell you is that about 16% of the animals collared dispersed into Utah. So they left the study site altogether. Several more dispersed into other parts of Nevada. And that the home ranges so far are very large. Uh, we we suspect that the potential for competition between horses and mule deer may be at the core of answering the question of are, are, are these densities artificially high 
or not. And that is actually a, another project I'm collaborating with Endow on. And so there we will, um, the, the picture should be filling in uh, in the next year or two. Great, thank you. Okay, one last call, any other questions? Okay, thank you. Mr. Jackson, is that it? Uh, one up? more. Okay. One more. Uh, let me share my screen again. Uh, on to uh, Project 45. This is our uh, passive black bear estimate, a collaboration with the University of Montana and Oxford. Uh, it is probably the most impacted by COVID, the genetics lab that they use to look at those uh, hair snares uh, was greatly set back. And so we are going to be presenting the findings of this project at the January commission meeting, uh, which is probably more timely uh, since we'll be discussing bear harvest at that time. So uh, uh, just so you know, we uh, it's, it's been a lot of work. Uh, uh, over 100 cameras have been distributed, uh, uh, over 3 million photos and 500 hair snare samples. Uh, and we do uh, recommend continuing this project in some capacity. And this project is currently kind of molding or meshing with project 46, which is the last project that we will talk about and is our last outside presentation today with Dr. Uh, Solter. I hope I said your name right, Sean. Yep, that's right. Great. So I, I have your slides if you can't share your screen. All right, I will give it a shot. And if I could do a slightly better introduction, uh, uh, Sean is a postdoc with the University of Montana. He currently lives here in Reno, uh, does a lot of the field work. And this is a not a presentation of findings, but a presentation of what has been done as far as uh, uh, study design and field efforts have been made. So uh, anyway. Okay. It's telling me that I can't share while you're sharing. Uh, well, I uh, apologize. Okay. Okay, can everybody see that okay? Nope. No. Not yet. There we go. Okay, thank you. Okay, all right, thanks for that introduction. Uh, so again, as Mr. Jackson mentioned, uh, this is a project that we're just getting off the ground here over the within the past year. Uh, We've implemented some of the data collection in the field, but we don't have a lot of data yet in hand. And I'm just gonna kind of be running through kind of what our ideas are behind the conception of the project and what we hopefully are, will be able to uh, deliver with this project. Uh, and I just wanna thank my collaborators, uh, Josh Millspa, University of Montana, my supervisor, and then our other collaborator, Robert Montgomery at University of Oxford. Okay, so mule deer in Northwest Nevada. Okay, oh so when I talk about Northwest Nevada, we're talking about, about these 10 or so hunting units, uh, pr primarily in Northern Washoe County, uh, also in uh, Eastern uh, Humboldt or Western Humboldt County. Uh, and basically this used to be a very robust mule deer population in past decades, but it seems uh, appears to have undergone this pretty precipitous decline. The perception is there's much fewer deer in this area than there used to be. Uh, but however, at currently, despite the, the idea that it, this population has declined, we don't really have a good uh, idea of what the current population levels are in this region and what the uh, potential causes or limiting factors for this population is uh, in this region. Uh, so that's uh, kind of how this project uh, came about. Uh, again, after we were already doing some non-invasive surveys for black bears to the south of this area, uh, we wanted to see if we could get a handle on what's going on with this population with non-invasive survey techniques, uh, principally uh, cameras. Uh, so we gridded out this area, um, primarily in, in the mule deer habitat within the area uh, at a 49 kilometer square resolution. So that's about five and a, by five uh, miles, uh, each of these grid cells. 
Uh, and then as of now, uh, we have 191 ca uh, camera traps deployed uh, across this area. See, we've done a pretty good job of covering uh, a, a lot of ground in this area. Um, and in addition to the camera traps, to try to get an idea of what are the possible factors that are limiting this population, we've also going to put out uh, 30 remote weather stations at a subset of these locations. Uh, that's kind of where those stars are there. Um, yeah. And what we're hoping to get out of this uh, basically is being able to put out the camera traps. We're hoping to get photos of, or we're, we're going to get photographs of deer. Uh, fortunately for deer, as opposed to other, uh, species, they're easy to assess via camera traps. So we're hoping to be able to use some of the newer, uh, statistical models to be able to estimate, uh, sex specific populations for mule deer, uh, in this study area. Um, hopefully for each of the hunt hunting units individually, and we'll, um, but certainly across the area as a whole, um, and another nice thing about camera traps is that they also provide additional data on other interacting species, uh, whether they're predator or competitor species. It's, uh, uh, it's good that I'm following Dr. Stoner's talk here because uh, these are certainly some of the issues that we're thinking about up here as, as factors that are regulating this mule deer herd. There is a pretty large feral horse res, uh, presence, although there has been a large roundup that was just conducted by the BLM. Um, and then there also is obviously the idea that their um, predation by mountain lions could be limiting this population of mule deer in this part of the state. Um, so conceptually pretty similar to the, what they're looking at in the southern part of the state, um, but a little bit different method, methodology. Uh, and then also, as I mentioned, we're putting out these remote weather stations. Uh, these things are, are, are pretty nifty. Uh, we can put them on the landscape and then collect data for the better part of uh, a year uh, without having to be um, visited. Um, and they're collect these things are collecting information like daily temperature, daily humidity, uh, and probably most importantly, precipitation uh, uh, over time. And this is just kind of a look at some of the uh, information, some of the data that we get. So here's a station that's been operating pretty close to Reno over the past several months. And as you can see, we can get pretty fun detailed data on daily mean temperatures. And again, this daily uh, rainfall, um, which we're obviously thinking is probably particularly important as far as regulating productivity in this system. As you can see, there's that large precipitation event that recently came through um, in the past couple of weeks. And ultimately, we can use this information to try to do some vegetation productivity modeling to get at, the, at whether this could be more of a bottom-up regulation type of situation where they're more limited by the forward, current forage conditions that are up in this area, as opposed to maybe principally by predation. Obviously, most of the time, those two things will be wor working in concert, and we should be able to hopefully tease apart some of that uh, with these multi-pronged data collection method methodology. And then just a little bit more novelly, uh, kind of some of the idea, one of these ideas that we've come up that we're, uh, we'll hopefully be implementing uh, within the next few weeks here uh, is because NDAO will also be capturing mule deer and placing radio collars on them, which will mesh nicely with some of our um, uh, the, uh, goals as far as estimating the abundance of this population. But one thing that really hasn't been looked at before and we think could be potentially be important is the role of the kind of uh, poor forage conditions driving uh, uh, tooth wear or poor dental condition in deer, and that could ultimately be affecting their habitat selection or their survival. So we're actually going to be taking these dental molds of all the deer that we capture and put GPS collars on, and then we'll be able to quantify what the actual condition of the teeth are of these deer and ultimately how that influences survival and habitat selection. And potentially, I think, we, again, we think that could uh, hint at potential limitations of forage for, for example, in the deer population, if we did see a signature of, you know, poor de uh, dentition and, and effect on survival. And just kind of to briefly wrap things up again, this is a conceptual talk, but basically this is kind of just how we're hoping to bring together some of these different data collection methods. We can also include GPS collars here too, to basically use the camera traps to be able to get, um, a, estimate the total population size by this area of bisex, and then also using the camera traps to look at relationships with these other species and how well does mule deer popu um, population levels correlate with wild horse or feral horse use or mountain lion uh, occurrence across the landscape or how does on the other on the other side of the equation, how does uh, these kind of forage conditions driven by uh, seasonal precipitation or temperature um, affect this population. Um, so yeah. And with that, I'll just take any questions. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? Mr. Solter? 
Yes, Vice Chair Cavilia. Yeah, I just have one. And in, in your in your grids, how are you guys? Where you picked a location to put the camera within the grid? Are you are you like put them on water holes, bedding areas? Like how do you pick? I, I guess you want to get the most bang for your buck, right? One camera within that grids. It's a big area for one camera, right? I'm just, I'm just curious how you guys are selecting the camera. Yeah, and actually we're doing the complete opposite. So a lot of these newer statistical methods that are trying to estimate populations uh, over large areas really rely on the cameras being completely kind of randomly placed out there uh, and just happen to you know encounter air, um, animals as they move around the landscape randomly, basically. Um, so for the most part, the cameras, if we can get to the center of the grid cell to completely randomize it, that's where we place the camera. If not, um, we try to get as close to as possible there. And yeah, certainly you're not going to get as many, uh, pictures of animals as say, and say, as if you would put it on a water hole or something, but, uh, from our preliminary stuff, it's pretty clear that, you know, we're still going to get deer and that's going to help us be able to actually extrapolate when where we the rate at which we encounter deer to density across the entire landscape and ultimately scale that up to population size. Any other questions? Oh, go ahead. Follow up. No, I said thank you. Okay. Oh, okay. I'm really hopeful that this project will give us some good information. Yeah, I think we have a good setup to to for success at this point, and uh, yeah. I, other questions? Okay, Mr. Jackson. Uh, th thank you. I, I would like to uh, one, acknowledge John Ivonic, our new area game biologist for, for Northwest Nevada, Washoe County. He has been uh, really pivotal in helping with this, particularly the uh, working with an orthodontist to take those molds of deer teeth. That's a fairly novel technique. Uh, and I understand he's been working hand in hand with Sean on that. I personally am really excited about that idea. Uh, we all know that we have less deer in Northwest Nevada than we used to. Uh, in my world, it's very clear that many people believe it's predators and I'm not saying that it's not, but I, I'm really curious if that is the whole picture. And so uh, novel techniques such as this, looking at tooth wear, wondering if do our deer basically reach senescence sooner because their teeth are wearing out faster. So that's, uh, I'm really interested in, in questions and ideas like that. Um, I have one more slide. It's a picture of a bighorn sheep titled questions. So I'm not going to share my screen again, Okay. But <laughs> I will uh, entertain questions uh, on the presentation as a whole. Okay. Questions for Mr. Jackson, Commissioner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Pat, you really did just kind of summarize what's been what's floating around in my head here is that the whole idea of um, taking a really holistic approach to seeing what might be happening out there. And the uh, the tooth wear thing really hit me. I mean, we've heard about it. You know, we've, it's been brought to us before, but you really do lose sight of it um, if it's if it's not something that we're talking about. And uh, um, so that's something that I'm pulling out of this is a potential of, for so many different variables playing a role in this, um, you know, it, uh, you know, bad teeth, less health, more vulnerable, less able to get away, all those other factors. I mean, it, it, it really does play an important role. So um, I do appreciate the holistic approach. I really, this was really interesting to me today. I, I uh, to see some of these um, projects uh, come in front of us for updates or some preliminary results, whatever the case might be. It's, it's, uh, it was really nice to see uh, some presentations and, and see uh, what's been going on out there. It's been, a, it's been really um, thought provoking for me. Thank you. Are there Welcome. questions? Vice Chair Villa and then Commissioner Rogers. I, I do have one, one more question, Pat, and I'm not a biologist and absolutely don't pretend to be, but on the tooth wear, isn't how do you guys and I'm just curious on the process um you have to know the age of the doe or the buck in regards to the how are, how do you get how do you know the age versus the amount of tooth wear right because that's basically what you're studying so how's that how does that work if that makes sense Sean do you want to chime in on that 
my understanding is that we'll also be helping pulling some teeth and then maybe get some cementum estimates on some, uh, maybe at least a subset of these deer. Uh, that's kind of where you look at the layering of the teeth. It would be different than, and I think they're smaller teeth that can be pulled that are not super functional for the, for the deer. Um, I think that's one, that's one option that we'll have, um, that to try to actually tease apart how old the deer are versus, um, you know, what, whether it's a younger deer that has a lot of tooth wear or just a, a pretty old deer. My understanding is that that initial mold of the teeth will be really more informative the second time that we put our hands on that animal, whether it be a recapture or a harvest in a, in a hunter turned it in years later to see that the difference in those teeth. Okay, Commissioner Rogers, you had a question? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, Mr. Jackson, yeah, great presentation today. Very, very informative and uh, obviously a lot more obviously to come on that in the years ahead. But just a couple of questions that I had regarding some of your earlier slides, and you may have touched on it, I might have missed it, but you know, we were talking about the predator fee and the, the revenues that that generated. And the two questions I had were, were one, what, the, what happens to those unused funds? Was, uh, was one question that I had. And then the second question I had, there was a slide on ravens. And you mentioned that, that we didn't hit the number of ravens removed that you had hoped. And I was just curious what, you know, what number did you hope or, you know, was the, was the goal? And then what's that mean for, for uh, 2022? So anyway, uh, thank you for Pat Jackson, staff specialist for the record. So uh, two questions and I'll attempt to answer the funding one first. The, 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 the $3 fee funds do not uh, revert back. And so they are, if we don't spend it in uh, a fiscal year, they're available for expenses in uh, future fiscal years. And so instead of reaching an 80% mandate uh, year to year, uh, it will be our goal to uh, reach that uh, on a three-year average. So because we spent less in fiscal year 2020, we believe that we could spend more in fiscal years 2021 and 2022 and, and moving forward and, and catch up, so to speak. Uh, and then as far as the Raven numbers go, we are currently... Uh, uh, operate under a, uh, a Fish and Wildlife Service issued depredation permit with a cap of 2,500 ravens. Uh, in the findings that we uh, have with the U.S. Geological Survey, we have uh, we are we are requesting an increase, and then we are also working with USDA Wildlife Services uh, to be prepared and staffed to uh, to to meet that number. So, I was actually having a conversation with. Uh, USDA Wildlife Services, Nevada State Director Mark Ono yesterday. Um, this is These are my words, not his, but if it wasn't for the last minute, nothing would get done. And right now is the last minute for him from an administrative standpoint to start the paperwork and the administrative efforts to uh, start advertising and hiring to have staff in the field come this spring. So uh, we are moving the ball on that to, to ramp up Raven removal this upcoming year. Other questions? Commissioner Allenberg and then Commissioner Weiss. Yeah, I'd just like to thank Pat. I think it was a great presentation. Um, very much thank all of the outside presenters. Um, I really appreciate all of the work and effort that you've done in, in these projects. Uh, and you're, uh, I, I, I thought it was super informative and uh, appreciate it of it all. Thanks, Pat, and everybody else. Thank you. Commissioner Weiss. Hey, yeah, I'm excited to look into some of those Raven reports that you're putting out. But in the meantime, can you tell me a little bit more about the methodology for removal? Are you egg oiling or are you taking um, adults or what uh, What are you doing there? Uh, Pat Jackson, staff specialist for the record. So uh, the short answer is the vast majority are removed with a corvicide known as DRC 1339. It's very genus specific, so it, it will uh, potentially take a, uh, a magpie and a couple other things in, in the corvid family. But uh, by and large, uh, the methods used to inject that toxicant into a hard boiled chicken egg uh, is very species specific in how it's consumed. And then if other things such as mammals consume it, uh, they are quite literally not physically able to consume enough eggs 
to reach the LD50 to, uh, to, uh, to be uh, lethally removed. Now that said, we do have on our depredation permit with the US Fish and Wildlife Service permission to remove nests and also to oil eggs. And that is part of uh, Project 41. Uh, for the sake of brevity, I did not have the USGS provide a presentation today, but that would, they are also looking at the viability of those techniques to ensure that we have uh, uh, as many tools in the lethal and non-lethal toolbox as possible. Okay, other questions? Thank you, Mr. Jackson. This was really, really a great presentation. I appreciate it. It helps us understand some of your projects and I think um, the public too. So, Director Wasley, did you have anything to add? I see you. Uh, nothing substantial, just uh, thanks for the opportunity to present this and thanks to Staff Specialist Jackson and, and all of his collaborators. I, I think this is a really, really good example of the kind of capacity and resources and uh, knowledge that we're bringing to these management challenges. And I very much appreciate um, the opportunity to share some of these preliminary results and these approaches with, with the commission. So thank you, Madam Chair. You bet. Okay, with that, we're gonna take a 15 minute break. So let's come back at uh, 1050, 1055. Thank you.
Okay, if I can have everyone come back, please. All right, we're going to move on, but I first want to recognize and um, ask that the record reflect that uh, Commissioner Perini joined us during the last agenda item, so we're happy to see your face. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. That. Okay, agenda item uh, 6E, Tag Allocation and Application Hunt Committee TAC Report. Committee Chairman Tommy Cavilla. A report will be provided on the recent TAC committee meeting. Vice Chair Cavilla. Yeah, thank you. Um, we met on this last Wednesday on November 3rd. I think it was another productive meeting. Um, real quickly, I'll go through what we went over. The, the specialty tags closed unit procedure review. So that's gonna be in regards to the sheep tags, the sheep specialty tags. Uh, the department's got a new um, proposed method to uh, what, what units will be available to those uh, tag holders to hunt. The committee recommended it forwarding that to the commission. I think we'll look at see that at the January meeting. We looked at a potential mule deer waiting period. Uh, we discussed that, uh, this was brought up by members of the public. The committee did not, did not see any value in that. And I guess we're gonna drop that item. We're not gonna pursue it any further. The other, the next item we discussed was the junior hunt program. Uh, we had a quite a bit of discussion on that and that's, it's gonna stay within that committee too. Um, with policy 24, we're gonna review both of those at the same time. We did not look at policy 24 this last meeting, but uh, we will be looking at policy 24 and uh, some proposed changes to the junior hunt at the January TAC committee meeting. And then uh, finally, for a future committee meeting, we're going to look at um, just kind of delve into looking at possible tag transfer programs or a mentor program or a um, novice hunter programs and kind of see what the what it would take for each one of those to to go into effect. I'm uh, just gonna have it at a, not saying we're gonna proceed with any of those, at, but just have a discussion about them at the committee level. And that was, um, that was basically it. That's what we went over. Any questions for Vice Chair Cavilia? Okay, thank you. Um, Commissioner Keel has not joined us, so I understand that Mr. Scott will give us the report on the Mule Deer Enhancement Oversight Committee, which is uh, 6F, the Mule Deer Enhancement Oversight Committee, um, Chairman Keel and Game Division Administrator Mike Scott. A report will be provided on the recent Mule Deer Enhancement Oversight Committee meeting. Mr. Scott? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the commission. Uh, for the record, Mike Scott, uh, Game Division Administrator. <clears throat> On uh, October 27th, there was a Mule Deer Oversight Committee meeting. Um, there was a, a number of things that were addressed, uh, changes um, that, that went through. I'll read you those. There was also some correspondence that came from the Washoe uh, subcommittee, uh, the Washoe subcommittee uh, had some complaints about uh, the process and uh, the proposals that were brought forth. And we're going to work through those. There's a meeting with Washoe on Tuesday, and uh, we will deal with those. But um, with regard to some of the changes or uh, uh, suggestions that were made by the uh, Oversight Committee, there were a couple minor revisions to the charter. Uh, the charter is is now finalized. Um, they they suggested that each subcommittee hold another meeting if if necessary to confirm that members agree with the projects and uh, that you know everybody is in agreement with the projects that go forth. Um, it was suggested that uh, that would include signatures from 
uh, both the Endow representatives and at the very least, probably the, the CAB representative um, so that we know, okay, these projects are approved by, by each subcommittee. Um, <clears throat> we did have a list of 34 projects. Um, I think 23 of those were habitat projects and 11 were non-habitat projects, which non-habitat includes um, collaring, uh, collaring projects for um, tooth collection, things like that. And then there were, I believe there were five predator projects that were brought forth. And uh, one of the things that was, was apparent was that a lot of the, the habitat projects were not necessarily what we would call shovel ready. Um, they, were, they were projects that, that we need to go forward with, but they don't have NEPA complete. And so if NEPA is not complete, we really can't proceed with them at all. So uh, we're, we're sending a memo back out to uh, all of the, the staff uh, and our game and habitat staff that will direct them to make sure that if they bring uh, projects forth, if they uh, have project proposals that they need to be, um, they need to have NEPA compliance documents complete. Um, the, the BLM representative requested that each subcommittee have um, provide a list of the BLM and Forest Service participation and the names of the, the participants from the, the federal land management agencies. Um, we do, we do, we have requested uh, participation, but I'm not sure we're getting it in all places. And it, it truly is crucial to have those partners um, in attendance and, and uh, be part of this whole process. Um, <clears throat> oh, uh, with regard to the non-habitat projects, it, it, it's, it's pretty apparent that we need to separate out the predator projects versus the non-habitat projects and make sure that, that there's some clarity there on those, um, for those differences. And uh, one other, well, two other things, the, they, the subcommittee or the committee requested that if there are spring protection projects that we make sure that, that uh, those contain either landowner permission um, or, um, they ensure that that livestock will have alternative water um, if we do fence off a spring. Um, the only other thing that that I think was uh, included was the oversight committee supported uh, the annual schedule that was proposed, um, which um, would require all the projects be submitted by August 1st. And one of the challenges that we face with with when we get into the fall is is uh, I guess ironically that hunting seasons um, make it really really difficult to get a quorum uh, in attendance at a lot of the subcommittee meetings, and so if we can do that during the summer, uh, maybe we can actually get participation and get those projects completed earlier. And uh, if, if it doesn't happen, you know, it's not the end of the world, we can, we can go into the fall, but I would prefer to have um, August 1st be the deadline for those project proposals. And um, it, I, I'm hopeful that that will work um, going forward. So uh, with that, I don't have anything else, um, but I will be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Mr. Scott on mule deer enhancement? Yes, Commissioner Barnes. I guess I really don't have any questions. I just <clears throat> want uh, everyone to know that, you know, this is really a major undertaking um, that the department is taking on right now, specifically uh, Mike. Um, it's it's going to require some patience because um, it's going to take a little bit of time. There's going to, there's, well, we're already seeing challenges um, that are evolving. There's going to be more challenges come up. Um, so like I say, it's, this is, um, it's something that there's a tremendous amount of interest in, a lot of passion from um, a lot of people, and it's just going to take a little bit of time um, to work through. And I think we saw that at the, at the last uh, oversight committee meeting. And so I just think that it's just something we all need to be aware of. It's going to take, take time, require a little patience, but, uh, but we're going to get there. This is, uh, like I say, this is not something we're going to fix overnight. Um, there's projects we can get done uh, in a quicker fashion than others. So, like I say, it's just something that I think we need to keep in mind 
and uh, and keep moving forward. But it is is going to take a little bit of uh, patience and uh, time to address some of these challenges we're we're faced with and we're going to be faced with. There's going to be more to come. Okay, thank you. Other comments or questions? Okay, thank you, Mr. Scott. Um, moving on to agenda item number seven, Administrative Procedures, Regulations, and Policy APRP Committee Report, Chairman McNinch. A report will be provided on the recent APRP committee meeting. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the APRP committee did meet yesterday afternoon, and um, we had a, we took a really big bite out of the apple. So there's a uh, there was a lot of discussion. We we considered um, ten separate policies yesterday. There's uh, a couple that are coming before us today, um, and there's a, a number that are still um, just in the air, uh, having work done. So uh, I'm going to try to balance um, getting into too much detail with. Uh, giving you an idea of where we're at here. And if people have questions, if any of you have questions, um, you know, I, I think I'm prepared to answer uh, about specific policies, but I will definitely tap into Kaylee to help me out here and, and uh, the committee members if we, um, if we need to be more specific. Uh, so at yesterday's meeting, um, we, did uh, we did discuss uh, commission policy three, which is appeals, commission policy 31, Lahont and Cutthroat Trout Management Guidelines, Policy 33, Fisheries Management Program. Policy 40, Statewide Boating Safety. Policy 51, Wayne E. Kurtz Conservation Award. Policy 63, Protecting Wildlife from Toxic Ponds. Policy 64, Input on sale, Land Sales Transfers and Exchanges. Policy 65, Designation of Wildlife Management Areas. And Policy 67, the Federal Horses and Burrows. Um, some of these will uh, move to uh, the commission for commission consideration in January. Um, uh, minor changes, clarifying changes, edits, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, so in January, you can expect to see policy 31, uh, the Lahont and Cutthroat Trout Management, uh, policy 33, Fisheries Management, uh, policy 63, Protecting Wildlife from Toxic Ponds, policy 64, Input on Land Sales Transfers and Exchanges, Policy 65, the designation of wildlife management areas, and policy 67, the federal horse and burrows. Um, and I'll add a quick note on that. That, that uh, policy will be coming to us. Um, uh, the department did a fantastic job of uh, collaborating and coordinating with um, uh, the Coalition uh, for Healthy Nevada Lands and, um, and uh, putting something together. There was discussion, uh, some public input, uh, that prompted us to discuss whether to um, uh, reference some legal action as a provision of that policy as one of the, the points. And um, uh, there was interest from the committee to have that conversation, uh, but pro uh, moving this, this uh, uh, policy forward and, and completing it is, uh, you know, there's a timeliness to it. It'd be nice to get it done. Uh, so we've decided to bring that in front of the commission and have that conversation about the um, what kind of tone we'd like to strike um, and how a legal action uh, uh, bullet point in our policy might uh, affect the tone that we're, that we're trying to establish or, um, you know, where, where we're at. And we felt that it was more important for the whole commission to have that conversation. So we'll just bring it as a, uh, you know, and, and do it as a from the beginning to the end with, with the commission and see if we can get through that. Um, but we anticipate that there won't be too many issues with the others. Um, there will be some minor uh, suggested changes, but um, we can go through those later. Um, let me see here. Uh, I think I'm going to leave it at that, um, Madam Chair. Kaylee, is there anything that you think we should add uh, more specific um, today? Uh, we will be hearing here in a second uh, commission policy number one and 10. Uh, we do need to hear these twice um, before we can proceed with. Uh, 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 putting them in place or reaffirming them, whatever the case might be, uh, repeal, suspending, whatever whatever we decide to do. Uh, so today will be the first readings on those, and we'll talk about those in a moment. So, Madam Chair, or Commissioner Cavilia, Kaylee, if you guys have any comments or uh, staff, um, please do. I just want to clarify the 
the point that you made about the legal um, discussion for the Fair Force Policy 67. Um, we don't have the authority to file a lawsuit. It would be encouraging the governor's office or the AG's office to do that on our behalf. Um, but I just wanted to clarify that, that we do not have the authority to, to pursue a lawsuit um, on behalf of, of Endow or even um, this issue. So I just yeah. wanted to make sure that that was clear. That's a good um, clarification. It's, uh, and that's why we bring it in front. It's important to have that broad conversation. And so we're all on the same page, whatever we decide to do, so. Right. Any questions for Commissioner McNinch? Okay, uh, seeing none, we'll move on to 7A, which is commission policy one, general guidelines for commit for the commission first reading, APRP committee chairman David, David McNinch for possible action. The committee will have a first reading of commission policy one, general guidelines for the commission and may take action to repeal or revise the policy. The commission may advance the policy to a second reading for possible adoption at a future meeting. Okay, um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I, before I move on, thank you, Kaylee, for putting my uh, um, my uh, summary together for me. It's very, very helpful, and it's and it's um, it, it's really helpful, and I appreciate you doing that for me. Thank you. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna let Kaylee get us started on Commission Policy One, if you don't mind, Kaylee. Yes, thank you, Commissioner McNinch, uh, Kaylee Musso, for the record. Um, you should have Commission Policy 1 in front of you. It's the marked up version. I apologize um, when I make the marked up version in Word a PDF. It kind of makes the formatting a little bit funky. Um, however, you can see that uh, we did amend Commission Policy 1 to incorporate changes from um, our bill in the last legislative session. So in the 2021 session, most of you We'll remember that um, Endow's bill provided a provision in there um, to allow an exemption for us to accept money into the Wildlife Trust Fund. We can only accept up to $250,000 per emergency event. Um, and there were circumstances that came along with that provision. So um, I also added into this policy that annually we must submit a report containing the following information. So it would contain the unanticipated emergency event for which the gift donation bequest or devise was received. And then the amount the gift donation bequest or devise, the amount of the gift donation bequest. And then um, see the amount of the gift donation bequest or devise that was expended for the an unanticipated event. And then the private source from which it was received. Um, and so since that was a new, addition to the wildlife trust fund provisions from the last legislative session, I felt it was important to include in this policy since it does discuss um, the wildlife trust fund. Other than that, this policy covers um, just the commission's official duties, um, how agendas and support material are handed, handled and then the compensation for you guys. But we are available for any questions. Okay, any questions for Ms. Musso or Commissioner McNinch? Okay. And again, this is just the first reading, so you guys won't do anything with this um, unless you have changes to bring forward for the next meeting. Otherwise, um, it will be up for a second meeting next commission me or second reading next commission meeting, and you can adopt it then. Right. Okay. Yes, uh, Vice Chair Cavillia. I just I just have one thing, Kaylee, and I'm sure you caught it, and it's just a typo on the second paragraph of number seven, um, the end of that first sentence. It says. After interim finance committee, I believe it's supposed to say annually, and there's just a. Yes, and that's something that came across when I okay. saved it as a PDF. So I was looking at my Word version, and it was correct in that. So I apologize, but thank you for um, double checking. Okay, other questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, this is an action item, so we'll take it out for public comment. Do we have any public comment on? Item 7A, which is Commission Policy 1. Just raise your hand. If you have any public comment, oops, I'm not at the top of the, there we go. 
Okay, I don't see any, so I'll bring it back to the commission. Do we need a motion to, we don't need a motion to approve, do we? Since it's a second, do we need a second hearing? No. Okay, hearing no. Okay, so any further comment? Okay, we'll move on to then item 7B, which is commission policy 10, heritage tags and vendors, first reading APRP committee chair, David Mitnich for possible action. The commission will have a first reading of commission policy 10, heritage tags and vendors, and may take action to repeal or revise the policy. The commission may advance the policy to a second reading for possible adoption at a future meeting. Okay, Commissioner McNinch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so with, with policy number 10, I did notice a couple of things here, Kaylee, um, and unfortunately we just, um, with the material that we had that's out there, I, rather than address it behind the scenes, I thought we'd just bring it up here. So um, under number one, I'll let you go through, but I'm, I'm kind of planting the seed for a couple of things. Uh, under procedure, um, I think our conversation during the committee meeting was to, um, to have that just as the first scheduled commission meeting of the calendar year without February. And then as you and I did discuss just in passing the uh, under number six, um, just as clarification, I'm, and I know that you'll touch on this, that that was proposed for deletion. It's it, the strike through is not real clear on that, but uh, those are the two things. And uh, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Commissioner Ninch, uh, Kaylee Musso again for the record. Um, I was planning on just sharing my screen since the PDF version of the marked up document is, again, uh, difficult to read. So I'll share this really quickly with you guys. So Commissioner McNinch was correct in that we changed number one to, to read the first scheduled commission meeting of the calendar year. And that was because um, the commission doesn't always meet in February. It just depends how the weekends fall sometimes. And most of the time we meet um, the very last weekend of January. So that was the reason for this change. Um, we also added G, which is an explanation of if or how the auction will take place online or via phone. Um, most of you are aware that our heritage auctions, uh, once COVID hit, all moved to online platforms or phone auctions. Um, so we wanted to add that provision in there. Now we expect that could continue in the future for some vendors. Um, and then again, we did delete number six, which reads a vendor may not allow a wildlife heritage tag to be auctioned, resold, bartered, or traded at another fundraising event without the approval of the commission. Um, and vendors don't usually have any control over this and they don't usually know if the tag that they auctioned has been resold or not. Um, but Deputy Director Rob is on in case he has any more he wanted to share on that piece. Jack Rob, for the record, uh, I only know of one time that a tag has been re-auctioned and that was years ago, uh, but the department is aware that tags are often times resold after the event. But every one of those that we're aware of since about the 2013 timeframe, uh, the original auctioner, uh, auction successful bidder uh, sells that tag at a discount because he has a conflict on his calendar. I have not seen one sold for a premium in years. Okay, any questions? Seeing none. Okay, I don't see any questions. We do have some public comment. So we'll open it up for public comment. Uh, Jeanette Dean. Yes, here I am. Hi. Am I on mute? Am I on video or just voice? Just voice and we can hear you. Okay, just voice. Um, I'm here to comment on item 11, but on the other items, I'd just like to add, uh, I'm an environmental policy advocate, a UNR alumna, Jeanette Dean. I'd just like to say that I object to any hunting allowed for predator animals. So 
if a tag for a bear is allowed, I would Ms. object Dean, to that. Ms. Dean, you, we aren't taking public comment on other items at this time. It's only on item 7B. Oh. Which is, yeah, so you'll have to wait until either the agenda item comes up or until public comment comes up at the very end of our meeting, okay? Sounds good. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Sure. Okay. Do we have any other public comment on item 7B, which is uh, policy 10 heritage tags? Okay, I don't see any public comment. So we'll bring it back to the commission. Further discussion? Yep. Thank yes, you. Commissioner thank, McNitt. Thank you, Madam Chair, very briefly. So Kaylee, when, when we bring this back, could you also uh, check the formatting from the deletion of six. Okay, you've got you're on top of that one. Thank you. Okay. All right. So we'll bring this back in January. Okay. No other comment. We'll move on then. Thank you, Ms. Musso. Agenda item number eight: the modernization of statewide elk species management plan. Staff specialist Cody McKee for possible action. The Nevada Elk Species Management Plan was approved in 1997. Over the last 25 years, the department has adopted various techniques, technologies, and harvest guidance designed to improve elk management in Nevada, and some of these practices are not specifically described within the ESMP. Further, certain portions of the ESMP may be outdated and may re require revision. The department requests the commission's approval to begin the evaluation and review process of the ESMP. Mr. McKee. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the commission. Can you hear me well? All right. So the current version of our statewide elk management plan has done a really remarkable job of carrying elk management um, through, the, through the 21st century, um, despite being nearly 25 years old. With that said, the landscape in Nevada has changed dramatically, as well as our state's increasing status as an elk hunting destination. So further, um, our understanding of elk demographics, as well as their movements are improving. We've instituted new harvest objectives since 1997. Uh, we've also added programs, new programs that address depredation concerns. Um, and while it's not a new program, our elk incentive program is not specifically described within the elk management plan, the statewide plan. Um, one important aspect to keep in mind as we discuss uh, the elk, the, the statewide plan, is that this provides management guidance to local sub plans. It does not currently identify or include population objectives for specific herds. So it's merely an umbrella plan that guides management across the state. So for some for these reasons, as well as just a desire to, to include more up to date information within the statewide plan, like uh, species uh, densities for various cervids, um, as well as distribution maps, the department's asking the commission for permission to begin an evaluation and a potential revision process of the statewide plan and and. Our request to do so is part of a, it is stipulated within the statewide plan. So that's why we're coming uh, to you guys today to ask for, for this permission. And, uh, you know, I don't have any, any presentation or any slides to, to present today. I'm sure I will as we go through this process, um, but I would be happy to, to address any questions uh, or concerns and, as well as just listen to comment. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. McKee. Any questions for Cody? No? <laughs> I have one. Um, Cody, how long do you think this might take? What's the process look like? That's a great question, uh, Chairman Eats. Cody McKee for the record. So this is my first foray into elk planning. It's been a long time since we've, we've even updated our sub plans. My best estimate, and I think it's conservative, would be a 12 to 18 month process. And, and part of that is we're just, gonna, we're just getting underway with our season setting and quota process beginning in 2022. That tends to be a pretty big um, 
resource demand on our biologists as well as staff. Um, we will be able to hopefully initiate the process within that timeline, but I think that it's the summer and fall where we'll be able to make the most headway. Right now, um, the first steps that, that I foresee occurring is contacting the potential steering members for the subplan. So the 1997 plan out, uh, includes 24 steering members that aren't department biologists or department personnel. Um, I'll, I'll do my best to attempt to contact the folks that may have, um, that may be now holding those roles that are identified. Um, and from there, we'll, we'll hold a meeting, identify the places within the plan that we would like to revise um, or um, update information, and then begin the revision process from there. So it'll probably be uh, multiple meetings um, where we come with an updated plan, receive input, um, and then eventually present the commission with a, with a final plan for approval. Okay. Questions? Vice Chair Cavilla. Uh, just real quick, Cody, I know like the Bighorn, we're doing the Bighorn management plan right now too. And there's department staff, there's commissioners, there's NGOs, there's guides, uh, the group, on the elk management plan, is it kind of, is it all department or is it going to be comprised of some people outside of the department? Uh, Commissioner Cavilia, Cody McKee, for the record, the the steering committee is is actually ma the majority of the members are comprised of outside uh, folks from different entities, so um, NGOs, the Cattlemen's Association, uh, land management agencies, so. The department will probably comprise a very small portion of that steering committee. Um, again, it was 24 members in 1997. I don't know if we need to go that big this time around, um, but again, we will, we will reach out to, to all of the, the various entities that are gonna be interested in this statewide plan and make sure that they have an opportunity to be involved and provide input. Yeah. If you haven't looked at the plan, it is on our website um, or Cody can send it to you. It's pretty lengthy um, and it is pretty dated. And we talked about it a little bit um, the last, in the last few days. Um, you mentioned disentangling the sub plans from this. Cody, can you speak to that a little bit? Uh, Chairman East, Cody McKee for the record, can you, um... Can you kind of elaborate a little bit on? Yeah, because I think I asked you about um, population estimates and um, and some of the objectives, and and you mentioned maybe t pulling those apart so that the overall plan is just a lot more robust. Yeah, certainly. Um, you know, with the commission's discretion as well as you know buy-in from the various committee members. The department could evaluate the incorporation of some of the aspects of the various subplans, um, which may include those population objectives. Uh, but again, I, I, I certainly wouldn't want to take that step without getting input from the people that are involved. Um, you know, population objectives are, are a very hot topic currently. Um, as I pointed out, there's Nevada is becoming an increasing is, is increasing in, in its status as, a, as an elk hunting destination. People want to come from, from all over the West. Um, and, and, and with that, we are seeing greater interest in increasing our population numbers. Um, however, we wouldn't want to, want to um, blindly establish new objectives or increase objectives without receiving the proper input uh, from the various stakeholders. Um, I would point out, um, as of uh, this, this most recent legislative session, we, we provide a summary to the legislation on you know, expenditures from our elk damage fund, um, as well as the number of complaints that we received, and as well as our account balance for that. And we kind of use that as a barometer of what kind of private land issues might, what, might, we, might we be dealing with with our elk population. So currently, we estimate our population to be at about objective in 2014, we estimated it to be around 18,000. Um, and with very aggressive harvest, um, we were able to prove that we can use hunting as a tool to 
get our numbers down to where they need to be. Um, and within the last two years, the number of um, uh, complaints that we've received that have required a, a damage payout has been less than a handful. Um, and the, the amount of money that's also being distributed is less than $10,000. So within each calendar year, in comparison, we're accumulating about $400,000 a year from the $5 elk damage fee. And again, we kind of use that as a barometer to understand what's going on in the Nevada landscape, especially with conflicts among, amongst our elk populations and the various land users. Um, so I, I think that's an important consideration as we go through this process. If it's the, the commission's uh, direction, we can certainly try and evaluate ways that we might be able to incorporate specific aspects of the sub plan um, into the statewide plan. Um, but again, I think I, I would certainly want to hear, um, get everybody's input before we before we went too far down that road. Okay, thank yes, you. Madam, Madam Chair, if, if I might uh, add, if, if I understood your question, I think there's a, a distinction there where that statewide elk species management plan is an overarching document that guides the elk management objectives for the entire state. And, and the current version, for example, provides a really wide range of bull ratios. Um, the objective, I think it's from 15 per 100 uh, to 40. And so you have this really large range. And then the sub plan process is a totally separate process that will occur after the elk species management plan is updated. And that occurs, there's, there are various ways that that has been accomplished. The most recent example is the Humboldt County plan. Um, but there was a, the Bruno River effort, which is 061071, that was a, a environmental assessment done by the forest. Uh, there was a wells uh, resource amendment that was done by the BLM that included Spruce Mountain and the north end of the Cherry Creeks. So some of them are, have been county driven, some of them have been part of county, some of them have been BLM. Uh, and that's really just kind of who's taken the lead on it. Some have been forest, some have been agencies, Central Nevada Elk Plan, Humboldt County Elk Plan. So I think when Cody says, you know, disentangle them, I think the, you know, we've got to walk before we run, and that is modernizing, updating that species management plan that'll guide uh, the species management for as a whole at a really high level. And then, uh, you know, if there's a desire or interest, then we would uh, look at those specific geographies, how they were done last time. Does it make sense to do it that way? Or is there a different approach um, and, and follow uh, some of the guidance that's in that statewide species management plan for those sub plans? Okay, thank you for that. I may have misunderstood. We, we spoke pretty briefly yesterday, so I appreciate that. Any other questions for Mr. McKee? Okay, this is an action item, so we'll go out for public comment. Do we have any public comment on item number eight? Modernization of the statewide elk species management plan. Really, no public comment? Is it working? <laughs> okay, we will come back. You need a motion from us, correct, Cody? Yes. Yes, that's correct. Okay, do I have a motion to approve the update of the statewide elk species management plan? I'll make the motion. Oh, Commissioner Allenberg. You guys are so quiet today. To, uh, uh move forward with the modernization of the statewide elk uh, species management plan as presented. Thank you. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second by commissioner or vice chair Cavilia, unless that was for discussion. No, motion second. Okay. So we have a motion by commissioner Allenberg and a second by vice chair Cavilia to approve the modernization of the statewide elk species management plan. All in favor, please raise your hand. And opposed. Motion carries eight to zero with Commissioner Keel absent. Okay, thank you, Cody. Um, agenda item number nine, adjustments to meeting intervals for coordination and oversight teams 
responsible for overseeing elk, uh, existing elk management subplan. Staff Specialist Cody McKee for possible action. Language in several local elk management subplans stipulate the coordination oversight team hold annual meetings to discuss various aspects of elk management within the planning area. Achieving a voting quorum during these meetings has been difficult in recent years. The department requests the commission's approval to hold COT meetings with, re with requests by team members to address emerging, emerging management needs rather than on, on an annual basis. Sorry, there's some additional words in there. Okay, Mr. McKee. Uh, Chair or Madam Madam Chair Cody McKee for the record. I, I this this request really came out of a, a need or a, a necessity. We've just had a really difficult time getting our our cot teams together the last few years. Part of that's probably COVID nineteen, um, and I think another another important important thing to consider these coordination and oversight teams were formed sort of at the beginning of our elk planning process. Um, at a time when um, there were a lot of elk conflicts, a lot of concerns among stakeholders about elk on the landscape, and they wanted to ensure a, a formal process that they could provide their input. What we're seeing the last few years is, is the concerns um, are, are really decreasing, and the need to hold these meetings is becoming more of a um, um, just a requirement of the pl sub plans and not necessarily a need. So what we're hoping to, to see is if uh, particular members of these coordination and oversight teams feel that there's a management need, um, maybe potential private land conflicts or uh, hunting issues, that they can contact members and that a meeting will, will be held um, in its place. Okay. Questions for Mr. McKee on this topic? Commissioner McNinch. Thank you, Madam Chair. So Cody, have you, have you um, put this out to the members of those uh, pots? Um, in particular, I'm curious, uh, the landowners, because I know that this is what was driving a lot of the conflict early on was the, the tolerance, trying to build tolerance with the landowners who were being impacted. Um, have, do you know, are they okay? Is there with, you know, when you have it, when you have an annual meeting, at least there's a, a place that they can put on their calendar. They know they can take an issue, but um, if we change that, um, you know, and they're waiting for uh, a meeting to be, that's, that's a, to be scheduled routinely or annually. Um, and we change that dynamic. I don't know. Um, I don't want it to become a, one of those things where, um, you know, they're waiting for something that's not coming their way unless they ask for it. Commissioner McNich, uh, Cody McKee, for the record, that, that's a really good question. I, I have not reached out to, to all of the landowners um, that may be affected by this potential change. Um, from, my, from my perspective, it's still getting at, um, you know, addressing those issues when they come up, and it may provide a more expeditious way for them to, to provide their input. Um, what we could do, um, provided this, uh, this suggested change is approved is send out letters to, to um, coordination team members as well as other affected entities to inform them of the new process should a need arise. That would, that would make it better for me. So I appreciate that suggestion. That, that, makes, that makes it a little, a little less concerning I'm making the change. So thank you. Okay, other questions, comments? Yes, Commissioner Barnes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I'm kind of discussing uh, one of the questions that uh, Commissioner McMinch just uh, had. You know, I kind of like this idea because, um, you know, you never know when an issue is going to come up um, with elk and, and private land. So, so if we're flexible enough that when an issue arises, we can go ahead and, and have a meeting, have a discussion and, and maybe take care of a problem, really maybe even before it becomes a problem. Um, so it doesn't get quite so contentious, you know, and, uh, and I have uh, talked with, uh, with Cody about, well, this whole, the whole elk plan and, and these two, because uh, there was a time when, you know, um, it, it created a lot of uh, 
tension kind of between landowners and, and sportsmen with with the elk and uh, and I think the last few years the department has has shown a commitment um, to us that they want to keep keep elk numbers um, kind of where it was originally discussed where they're where they're not creating a lot of issues there's always going to be something but but it hasn't been so bad and, and maybe that's why we haven't had a lot of these meetings is is because things have been going fairly well and and I hope we can we can keep it that way and and keep this, these lines of communication uh, that we have going and, and, and work through this process. And hopefully what we're doing is going to, uh, going to help to, to continue that process. And, and that's what I'm, what I'm looking forward to and hopeful for that, that as we go along, we can kind of maintain where we've been the last few years. Great. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Vice Chair Cavilla? Uh, just procedurally, Cody. Do if we were to if we were to approve it, do you guys need to provide some language as far as how the the requested meetings would take place and all that? Is that something we need to look at? Um, you know what I mean. Just versus just saying we're going to do it versus having something in writing. You know that that's everybody's agreed upon a process. Commissioner Cavilia, Cody McKee, for the record, it, you know, if, if the commission is comfortable um, in, in the notification that we provide team members and, and other interested entities, we can outline what that process would look like um, and just provide direction that this is um, sort of the more, more recent direction for the COT team meetings, um, if that would, if that would provide the commission with more comfort in how we go about this process. It kind of sounds like that would be, that's the request. So, Commissioner Allenberg. Yeah, maybe, maybe um, a question for Cody here is, uh, maybe, maybe I'm misunderstanding or I just want a clarification on, uh, is the COT uh, membership for the, for the individual, uh, the sub plans different than the state, and if so, how often do they change um, a membership of that, or you know, is it is it on annual basis that they would have normally taken care of uh, people that maybe are are retired and not interested in participating no more, uh, and and filling that in with the need to have people there is is that when it happens on an annual basis? Or? Uh. Commissioner Allenberg, Cody McKee for the record. From my experience, um, the last few COT meetings that I've attended, the, the only purpose for those meetings was to reassign uh, new members. Um, some of the, the sub plans stipulate that the membership can only be a year. Um, but even then we've had challenges getting those folks to be involved. So uh, like the most recent humble uh, elk plan meeting, there was a change of membership, but I believe that occurred behind the scenes. It was with the, for the maybe one of the land management agencies and they just provided contact information for the, for the new member. Okay, other questions or comments for Cody? I think seeing how that's framed might be helpful too. So, okay. Okay, seeing no other questions, I'm gonna take it out for public comment. Do we have any public comment on this item um, eight, nine? Okay. Okay, I don't see any public comment on agenda item number nine, so I'll bring it back to the commission for a motion. Commissioner Rogers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, I'd like to move to make a motion to approve the adjustments to meeting intervals for the coordination and oversight teams responsible for the overseeing the existing elk management sub plan uh, as proposed and discussed. Okay, do we have a second? A second by Commissioner McNinch. So we have a a motion by Commissioner Rogers and a second by Commissioner McNinch to approve the adjustments to meeting intervals for the COT for the overseeing of existing elk management subplans. That's a mouthful. 
All in favor, raise your hand. Opposed? Motion carries eight to zero with Commissioner Keel absent. Okay, we're going to move up um, agenda item number 12 as we discussed uh, this morning under the approval of our agenda. So interim heritage proposal, project proposal review, uh, Habitat Advis Division Administrator Alan Janay for possible action. The commission will hear an interim heritage project proposal from the department. The department has an opportunity to purchase the 1,550 acre Licking Ranch north of Battle Mountain in Lander County to provide the match for Pittman Robertson funds. Mr. Janay. Yes, thank you. Uh, for the record, Habitat Division Administrator Alan Janay. Um, Good afternoon, Chairwoman East, members of the commission. I'm going to try this sharing of the screen. Let's see if this works. Can you see? Yes. All right. Let's try this. How does that look? Are you seeing the slide presentation or the full screen view? The screen view. Okay, good deal. All right, so um, introduction is, um, if you'll remember back to June of 2020, uh, last pre-COVID meeting um, in Yarrington, um, there was a discussion at that time relative to heritage project proposals and uh, the ability to consider projects during uh, outside of the normal, you know, application period, which is that June or January to June process. And if you recall, there's NRS that stipulates that the department may at any time expend from the account any portion of the money uh, in the account, which exceeds $5 million. So that balance, that principal balance above 5 million that is now, you know, reaching 10 million, um, probably more than that by now, that is available for her expenditure. Um, and so there was a discussion at that June meeting of how to proceed with, you know, contemplating uh, a scenario where there may be interim projects. Um, NAC also provides that, you know, outside of that January to June process, if at any other time of the year, the commission determines that money is available to fund an additional project, the may, commission may do one or more of the following, request, accept, or approve applications at such time for conservation projects, which are urgent and which present unique opportunities. So this is an opportunity that we felt pretty strongly that the commission should hear about, um, be aware of, and possibly even consider um, knowing that we have that, that principal balance. As I said, this is the, the numbers as of 2020, 9.842620 um, above. So that, that is right now close to 5 million over that $5 million uh, threshold at which commission could approve. Um, the opportunity that lays in front of us is there's a, a ranch that we have been interested in for a number of years. It lies on the Humboldt River. Um, it was a property that we were interested in back in 2005 when the current owner uh, purchased it. And uh, he has held on to it and managed it as a uh, operational ranch and, and haying operation. And now he is looking to uh, sell this ranch and he approached us um, to see if we were interested in this ranch, um, knowing that we had a previous, you know, uh, wish to see something like this, you know, in our portfolio. And also that he wanted to see the conservation values of this pro property, uh, continue he wanted he he really likes the uh the wildlife values that are on this property and wanted to see the management continued to maintain that into the future and so he reached out to us we had discussions with him relative to this and um 
also assisted by state lands and Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation in putting this deal together. And um, while our initial conversations were possibilities of a conservation easement, um, his, his ultimate request was to sell the property. And so that's what we're bringing in front of you today. Um, understanding that this is in that interim period of the heritage process and um, basically what was determined by then chairman johnston was is that um, he was fine at that time and the commission was fine at that time to basically bring projects as as they were considered urgent and if needed outside of the normal timeline. And that's why we brought this interim project to you. As I said, the project that we're looking at is this Licking Ranch. Uh, it, it eventually would be, our hope would be a wildlife management area. It's the acquisition of the 1,568 acres and the water rights that support that. The budget of the program or of the project is only looking to heritage for 330,000 of the purchase price. What that would be is, is 75, the 75 or 75% uh, of this would come from Pittman Robertson grant that we have with the federal uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service. And so we would get the 75% from that using the match of the 330 out of the heritage plus a bargain sale from Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, because this will be a simultaneous sell of, the owner will sell the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation will sell to us immediately and they will take off 150,000 off of the asking price and sell it back to Department of Wildlife. So that'll be an in-kind donation. Right here, it says 1.92. Um, that actually factors in a $50,000 buffer just because, when we go through these acquisitions, we sometimes see some miscellaneous, uh, I apologize. Um, we, we see some miscellaneous items that uh, come up, uh, a last minute appraisal, title reports, things like that. And so we like to buffer those in. So what you're looking at is total project funding of 1.92. Any funds that aren't used out of that 50,000 contingency would be returned return to the you know, associated pots. If it was whisper, it would be you know, unutilized. If it was heritage, it would be returned at that 75-25 match. So now on to the, the sexy part. Um, is the property is, just north of Battle Mountain. It lays along the Humboldt River. Um, this gives you a, a relative overview. Um, basically, if you're headed north towards the Eisenhood Range, um, you'll cross the Humboldt River and the property lays on the east side when you cross the river. Um, people that are familiar with the area, this is where you always see the wild turkeys. Um, Zooming in on the property, uh, you can see this is a great picture um, that came out of the appraisal um, that this shows just how it's part of that humble rock creek uh, floodplain. And you can see just how uh, well fed by water and, and the historic flow patterns across here. And so it does have the convergence of, of rock creek and uh, the Humboldt River that, that come through it. But you can anticipate that during those flooding years that each of those small historic channels are holding water and providing benefit to wildlife. So um, it is a, an outstanding property. It is uh, one of the few places on the Humboldt that has that historic vegetative component, um, provides habitat to a multitude of wildlife species. This is an example. This is just one of those small channels. This isn't even the Humboldt River. This isn't even Rock Creek. This is just one of the side channels that was inundated with water because of water tables at that time. So this shows you some of that wetland benefit, some of that habitat value. Um, when we talk about you know, the values to wildlife, um, there have been uh, 
diversity uh, counts out there and there are nearly 100 bird species that, that occupy the property. Uh, includes waterfowl, shorebirds, passerines, upland species. Uh, as far as game, you know, we do, we have the mule deer, uh, wild turkeys that I mentioned earlier, quail, pheasant. We've actually even had a, a collared elk or two walk through the property in their movements around the country. Uh, a lot of questions that I've received since this has hit the uh, agenda was, you know, the management of the property and how Andow manages our properties. We do um, manage our properties right now, approximately 80% of the properties that we hold, um, we do actively manage with historical uses. Like uh, you can see here, we do have grazing, we do have farming. Um, and so the farming and grazing that you know have created and sustained the, the conditions on that property on the Licking Ranch, we would look to continue those. Those are great situations. You can see in these pictures here is oftentimes on some of our other areas, we do uh, agricultural leases for uh, farming or haying. And what we do is work out with the, the leasee, you know, a percentage of leftover crop for wildlife values. And you can see that here in these, these pictures is that we often leave some of the edges uh, for wildlife. Um, to increase some of that, you know, components of habitat that aren't as readily available um, unless it's a seeded situation like the sunflowers on the left picture. This one has some of that uh, wheat and barley that was left standing and we'll come back and we'll knock that down. Um, but huge value. Um, another question that I received is uh, what about, you know, property taxes to the county. If you look at this, you can actually see um, by NRS 361055, um, all lands and other property owned by the state are exempt from taxation, except property acquired by the state of Nevada and signed to the Department of Wildlife. And so we are the only state agency that actually pays property taxes to the counties on the properties that we own. And so that'll be sustained into the future uh, going into those county uh, coffers. As far as management going into the future, this is an example of one of our uh, conceptual management plans. This is something that I announced earlier, we're going to go through on Carson Lake and Pasture, which just came into our uh, portfolio. And, and that's what we would do on this particular property is we'd go through and we would go through a planning process with the public. Um, and we would, you know, lay out this piece, which is kind of that introduction, all the values that are on there, the description of the property, the wildlife habitats associated with it, um, the hydrology, the existing management, describing the farming and, and uh, other pieces. And then we would actually dive into the management. Um, and that's where we think about goals and objectives and management actions. And a lot of that is around wildlife and habitat and public use. Um, you know, this, this would be intended for, you know, uh, recreational opportunities, bird viewing, uh, you know, waterfowl hunting. There's big game on here. Um, but, you know, it's all about trying to connect the public to the wildlife and the wildlife habitat. So um, there's that piece in there and then there's facility development and maintenance, um, but there's, there's quite a bit when you look at in the habitat and wildlife management, it lays out you know, farming practices and those properties that have grazing, we lay that out as well. And so that would be you know, how we would go into a management process on a property that we acquire. But with that, that's just a very quick overview of what we're looking to do. And um, I look forward to your guidance on, on how to proceed. And I'm gonna stop sharing. Hey, thank you. Any questions for Mr. Janae? Mr. Allenberg. Thank you, thank you Madam Chair. Um, Alan, I, I'm just assuming that uh, without you know, with just leasing uh, the grazing rights and things like that, that 
the revenue generated from the pro uh, property in keeping in, into those uh, traditional uses will be more than sufficient to cover the taxes? Is that, is that the thought? So sometimes um, what we have is, is we have numerous wildlife management areas across the state. And so uh, we use some of that uh, income that comes back off of those agricultural and grazing leases um, to sustain some of those uh, fees and, and management costs. But also we have uh, the uh, Pittman Robertson grant that actually manages we, we get a substantial portion of the budget for management of those properties off of that, that WISP for funding, that Pittman Robertson, you know, excise tax funding that, that comes to the wildlife management areas to sustain and staff those properties. Other questions? Mr. Chair, Ron Perini. Okay, Commissioner Perini and then Vice Chair Cavilia. Just a simple question or not really a question, just information that I think. In the Mason Valley one that we have in, in Arrington does such a great thing for all the people wanting to come into areas, they can actually have um, the possibility to go hunting and have an enjoy that day. What you're showing to me anyway, and I think the more that you do this, that's a real positive thing. How many times do we always hear from people around here at least saying, where do I go? How do I go and get, an, op an opportunity to have um, even dove hunting or if I can go quail hunting or whatever it may be, they have no idea where to go. This, what you're doing here, I, I think it's ex absolutely perfect. And I know that it costs a lot of money. I know a lot of work that has to be done with that. Like in Mason Valley, the same idea, well, it has a lot of work. But on the other side of it is we're sure enjoying it. So I'm always 100% for what exactly you said in any of those kinds of areas. That's just a thought. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Cavilia. Just two quick questions, Alan. The, the, as far as getting it designated as a WMA, what, what would the timeline be? And then the second question is, as far as the condition of the property, do you guys anticipate having to do any, I've never seen it, you know, I've driven past it, but any sort of cleanup or anything, um, do you anticipate initial costs to the department you know, once it's purchased? So those are those are good questions, and uh, we do have some. There are two old, uh, dilapidated uh, mobile homes that are on that property, and we have asked, um, based on our experience with acquisitions in the past and trying to clean things up, and some of the hurdles that the that that creates, we have actually worked with them in this purchase agreement to make sure that those are off the property. Um, there is one other uh, shop that is on the property that is uh, serving and functional now, and we would actually use that as part of our infrastructure and, you know, housing equipment and things on the property. Um, there will be small costs. Um, what we know is, is there are, just like anywhere in this state, you can't find a, an acre without a weed. Um, there are some, some weeds that need to be taken care of, and, and the you know, the historic uh, agricultural lease that's on there. Those guys have been doing, you know, their fair share of that. Um, but as we would take it over, we would be, you know, helping and assuming, you know, some of those pieces that aren't as, as involved in the agricultural production. So we'd be cleaning up some of the more native habitats that are on this property. Did I answer all your questions? I think he asked about the timeline too. Oh, the timeline too. Yeah, sorry. That was your first question. Lost it in the shuffle. Um, it would be just like Carson Lake Pasture. Once the uh, acquisition was complete and the property transferred, we would be coming back um, to modify Commission Policy 65 to include it as a wildlife management area as it was designated. As, as Once you guys designate, then we would include it into NAC and define it and then go through the process of a conceptual management plan. And so it would be, you know, well into the system. The intent with this is to hopefully get in and have this acquisition finalized in the early part of 2022. Um, so I would anticipate that this is, you know, designated and, and moving forward in a management plan, hopefully by the end of 2022. 
Anyone else have questions for Mr. Janae? Commissioner Barnes. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I guess as far as the livestock industry is concerned, we always have concerns when we see uh, land being taken out of uh, private interest um, into government management. Um, we don't like to see private property moved into, uh, into government hands. We also believe that it's not our business um, to step into what somebody wants to do with their own private property. So in this case, where the, where the owner has the, the desire to sell to the department, we don't feel it's it's um, our in our interest to to get in and tell him how he should be doing it. So so we kind of have some conflicting uh, views and ideas um, on this on this whole acquisition. Um, we do like the idea that they want to leave it in um, in agriculture, which is that that's the reason that the wildlife benefits are there is because the agriculture um, is there and the practices that, that they employ on that property. That, that's why it's there. And, and, um, and we'd like some assurances um, to make sure that, that that's how it's gonna be um, if we're gonna continue uh, to support this. I have, uh, I visited with Ms. Mr. Mr. Janae about this and, and he says that is their plan. Um, I'd like to see that written in a plan because I know as long as uh, Tony and Alan and, and all those guys are involved, that's how it's gonna be because I believe what they, in their word and what they say, but they may not always be there. And at some point down the road, um, want to see that that, that that property is maintained you know, as such. And something else I think it's, that we need to be mentioned that, uh, you know, as you cre create these wildlife management areas and you open them up to the public, you know, the reason that a lot of this wildlife and stuff utilizes these areas is because there's really not a lot of disturbance there. And as you open them up and, and create more access for people to enjoy, which is, which is great, that's why we want to have it. But it may push some of this wildlife out. So I think as, as, as they look at the management plan, it's going to be important um, to keep in mind how you, how you maintain what you've got. You don't want to, you don't want to lose what's there. Um, you know, and, and I know when you're along the river, you better... Uh, you better leave some money there for an annual maintenance because along the river, you're going to spray weeds this year. You can kill every weed you have there this year. Next year, there are going to be just as many or twice as many. In flood years, they're going to come in. You're going to, all your diversion structures could be washed out. Um, there's just a lot of maintenance. I know on these ranches, the, the budget for our maintenance annually um, is big. It's one of our biggest costs. And so, when you're preparing a management budget for this annually, there's going to have to be money allowed for maintenance, whether whether it's a leasee or when you start leasing things to people for, for short periods of time, they're not going to want to put a lot of uh, capital into maintaining a lot of that stuff if, if they're only going to be there for a short period of time as well. So there's just lots, lots to consider um, as we go as we go forward. And then I have another question for, for Alan is, um, and I guess I'm approaching this as the, as the Heritage Committee Chairman, is this something we, uh, we, we take care of today? Do we need to, uh, does it need to go to the, to the Heritage Committee for a meeting um, fairly soon? Um, what, I guess what's kind of the, the process we're, we're gonna go through? I know um, some of the, um, reports I saw from the cabs, they didn't see this, they didn't discuss it at their meetings. So do we need, do we need to go, do we need to carry this out a little bit further for more um, public comment? I guess, Alan, I get, those are the questions that I have. Like I say, I'm kind of approaching this as the um, chairman of the Heritage Committee, where, where we proceed from here and, and what do I need to do as, as the chairman at this point? Thank you, Commissioner Barnes. Yeah, and, and just going back to the management um, piece is that, you know, these management plans that we put together, minimum lifespan on those are 10 years. Um, and so when we write that document and we say, you know, we're going to continue meadow hay, um, that, that's solid. That's going to be the management guidance on that property for 10 years minimum. 
and uh, I can't imagine this property without an active uh, haying operation. Um, I don't know if you remember the the lead in picture, but that was the old biologist, Battle Mountain biologist, Larry Teske. And he's standing there in, in you know, armpit deep meadow hay. And uh, if you didn't cut that for two years, um, it would be it would be a pretty decadent <laughs> jungle um, that would be a pretty tough piece to, to recreate and, uh, you know, uh, sustain wildlife. It, it, start decreasing in values. But yeah, so the management, you know, uh, will lay that out in the public process. And it is something that will be uh, memorialized in that in that 10 year conceptual management plan. Um, as far as the, the process, really, the, it's kind of a, a catch 22 because I'm coming back to the commission here. Um, the, the process by which uh, then Chairman Johnston said, "Is we'll handle them as they come, um, knowing that he's no longer chairman. Um, it's it's kind of in front of the commission as to how you wish to handle this. Um, we wanted to make sure that we got it in front of you. Um, as far as the uh, other processes that we have to go through, we have to go in front of the interim finance committee to to get their authority and approval to you know can." continue in this process, and that'll be in early December that we go through that process. But we wanted to make sure before we had any other public discussions that the commission was well aware of what we were trying to do. And then as far as the, the heritage application, how you guys handle that, um, that's kind of an open-ended conversation to the, to the commission. And if it was to come back to the heritage committee to then be pushed through there and come back to the commission, or if it was uh, to be heard a second time at the next commission meeting, I'm at, at, at your direction. Okay. Do you have a recommendation, Commissioner Barnes? Based on Mr. Janae's response? I you know, I do not. That's kind of why I asked the okay. I asked the question again. With what you know, what's the maybe a, is that something we asked the DAG or I mean, what what do we do? Do we even need to go to the Heritage Committee at all, or is it something we can take up just as a commission? So I guess that's kind of why I asked the question. Okay, Deputy Director Rob, do you want do you want to answer that? Jack Roth, for the record, I, I do believe it can be approved today. The way it's agendized and the way that I read everything, it can be approved today. Uh, we are going to move forward with the purchase. We had earmarked other funds to complete this purchase. But in review of all of our accounts by Director Wosley, our Deputy Director uh, Bonnie Long, our Lead Fiscal Person Jordan, and uh, Alan Janae, we reviewed all of our accounts. We believe that this is the best way to stretch out all of our funding dollars to maximize our ability to do good things on the land for wildlife and the sportsmen and the people enjoying the vast wildlife. So this wasn't our original thought. We were going to use pure sportsman dollars, but when reviewing all the accounts uh, in the past couple of weeks, this is what we came to as the best expenditure of funds at this point to utilize the match. Okay. And I'll, I'll add to that piece is, you know, I, I felt strongly, I thought this was something that the commission would want to be part of. Um, you know, I think this is, it's gonna be a, a, a legacy project. It's gonna be something that, you know, to Commissioner Perini's comment, um, there's going to be a lot of people that'll use this through the years, and I think the you know the opportunity for the commission to be involved with this was a was a very strong feeling. Okay, Mr. Alberg. Yeah, if it helps, uh, I'm in, I'm in a hundred percent agreement with uh, Commissioner Perini and uh, and and Alan on this. I, I think that it's it's a great great thing to to happen, and I'm, I'm super glad that 
that, that the heritage funds can be used in this matter. Thank you. Anyone else have comment? Okay, seeing none, we'll go out for public comment. Um, I'm going to take um, cab comment first. So if you're with a, if you're representing a cab, we'll take your comment first. Mr. McVickers. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi. <clears throat> Uh, I, the only comment I have is I'm in support of the project and the property, but in other properties that have been purchased by the department, it, closer to our area, um, the Black Rock Station, that place needs a little uh, money put into it, in my opinion. I'd like to see the, the old stone house fenced instead of having the livestock inside the house. And I've been asking for a few years, but... Uh, if we're going to be willing to spend this kind of money on more projects, I just hope we can take care of the ones we have. And that was all I had. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gonzalez. <clears throat> Sorry, I don't remember raising my hand. Oh. <laughs> Okay, it's been up for a while, so. Uh, sorry, I'm it's waiting. Okay. For, I'm just waiting for the uh, comments for contest banning. Okay. I apologize. No worries. Thanks. Thank okay. you. You bet, Mr. Pollock. Hey, Bryce Pollock here. For the record, speaking for myself. Um, touching on a little bit of the history of the Argenta Marsh, um, uh, Commissioner Perini's uh, comment comparing it to the Mason Valley uh, area it was spot on. Um, in, the, in its prime, the Argenta Marsh was a 46 square mile recreational paradise, and um, it was channeled in the 1950s in an effort to deliver more water to the Rye Patch Reservoir. This property, the Licking Ranch, is... Uh, a once in a lifetime a rare opportunity in terms of habitat because it's one of the uh, portions that was never channelized. So the river in that portion has maintained its sinuosity and it's a sportsman's paradise in terms of fish, big game, um, uh, waterfowl. Um, it also uh, is adjacent to a property that's already held um, in public hands and would create one large uh, open public area um, because of that. Uh, the, also with the continued ag use, as Commissioner Barnes touched on, um, it really uh, is the best possible proposal I could see to appease all interests and uh, comes, comes across as a win-win um, in, in a lot of ways. So I would urge you to, to jump on this opportunity um, to open you know, more areas to the public in general is, is rare. But to open a property like this one uh, to the public is genuinely uh, once in a lifetime. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pollock. Any other public comment on agenda item 12? Um, I see S. Smith Turk. Please go ahead. Yes. Uh Actually, it's Tom Turk. I'm sorry. Uh, it registered under our email. Um, I'm speaking as a sportsman, conservationist, um, participant in ranching and farming and knowing the area along the Humboldt River fairly well. Um, the comments so far have been really good and strong in support of that. Uh, I support Commissioner Barnes's concerns and also uh, comments made about beneficial use and maintaining it in a productive and uh, uh, either an active ranch or farming, uh, keeping those interests alive. I think that is what draws and supports a lot of the, uh, the game that the species that are there. Um, we've seen some examples of other projects that were purchased and left kind of go fallow up in Northeast Nevada. And uh, it, it, I think it's been more of a detriment in the long run, but it's taken us 20 or 30 years to see that happen. Um, speaking of the main Ranch and some others that uh, areas I know up north on uh, uh, 
Oh, towards uh, garbage and that. So uh, my encouragement is to, to keep it active. I agree with the leasing back and uh, uh, doing the best we can. I, I, I think it can be overrun by the public. We can love it to death with its utilization, uh, whether it's fishing, hunting or otherwise. So uh, I do support the purchase of this. I think it's a great opportunity and thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you, Mr. Turk. Do we have other public comment? On agenda item number 12. Okay, I don't see any. I'll bring it back to the commission for additional comments or a motion. Additional comment. We have a motion. Okay, I'll make the motion. <laughs> uh, I move to approve the interim heritage project proposal review uh, for the licking for the purchase of the licking ranch in Battle Mountain. Do I have a second? I do, Ron Pretty. Okay, so I have a motion by myself and a second by Commissioner Perini. All in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, so I got seven. Uh, opposed. Are you opposed, Commissioner Barnes? Okay. The uh, motion carries seven to one with Commissioner Barnes opposing and Commissioner Keel absent. Okay. Um, we're going to take a break for lunch. So why don't we come back at 1.15? Does that work for everyone? Okay. And we'll, uh, per we'll proceed at 1.15 with agenda item number 10A. See you all then. Thank you.
Okay, if we can all come back, it's 115. everybody pops in here. So missing a couple of commissioners. <clears throat> Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, Misty, will you let the record reflect that Commissioner Keel has joined us and welcome Commissioner Keel. Um, okay, we're going to get started uh, with agenda item 10A, Commission Gen General Regulations Adoption Public Comment Allowed. Commission General Regulation 499 bonus point only application period Management Analyst Megan Manfredi for possible action. The Commission will review language amending NAC 502 chapters that would decouple the hunt application periods from bonus point purchase periods, remove the requirement for a seven day bonus point only purchase period, and allows for the creation of a separate period for bonus point purchases to facilitate a more timely draw process and potentially provide increased opportunity for customers to obtain a bonus point in the future. The change also outlines the definitions for awarded or successful relative to obtaining a big game tag. So I'll turn it over to Ms. Manfredi. Thank you, Chairwoman and members of the commission. Management Analyst Megan Manfredi for the record. I apologize for the late submittal of the official language as we did not receive it back from LCB until a week ago. Um, but as a reminder, this change will allow for the ability to set a period for bonus point only purchases if the commission commission so chooses you know, or determines the necessity for one in the future. Um, so after reading some of the cab comments and action reports in their minutes, um, I did want to say that the department does not currently plan on recommending setting a bonus point only period for this upcoming season outside of the two planned application periods. But again, this change will allow for the potential to do so if the commission determines that is the direction that you would like to take in the future. Um, but if adopted, what would be in effect during the 2022 application season would be the elimination of the seven day bonus point and withdrawal period that Im immediately follows an application period. Uh, the ability for the department to offer bonus point purchases for all species in an application period and not have bonus points limited to tags being offered um, within the draw, so specifically for the second draw, and then as well as potentially providing draw results to the public closer to the close of the application period and includes an explanation of what it means to be awarded a game tag. Um, but I would like to request one change to the LCB drafted language, and if approved by the commission, request that change be included in the motion for adoption. So this change would, uh, we would like <laughs> this change that we would like um, falls within the, the first sentence of subsection nine of the language. So the department requests that the last half of that first sentence be stricken out and it's from the comma to the period. And so the sentence that I'm referring to uh, currently reads, the commission may establish an application period for a person to submit an application solely to earn a bonus point then the comma, which must follow the posting of the results of all drawings of big game tags for that season. Um, and so we would like from that comma to the period be stricken out, the which follows the posting of the results portion of that sentence. Um, and I will post that into the chat for everyone to know what I'm talking Madam about. Chair, if I could for a second, Megan, I'll be yeah. honest with you. There's, there's a lot of stuff on here. And I didn't get to the section that you're referring to. Could you give us a page number and 
Um, yeah, you just typed it in there. Okay. Page four. Okay. Yeah. That was where I was looking. I just couldn't catch up to the reading. So, all right. Thank you. Yeah. So it's that new portion of that subsection nine. And it's in that very first sentence. We just want to remove that, the portion of that sentence that states, which must follow the posting of the results for all drawings of big game tags for that season. And so this request will allow for the potential for bonus point only periods to either overlap with the draw or even be set before. Um, but that portion of the language we are requesting to be removed restricts us on when a bonus point period can be set. So removing it allows for more flexibility. And again, I apologize that the change is not reflected in the language provided, but we were kind of in a crunch to get the LC language noticed to the public and provided to you guys as the commission as soon as possible. Um, but with that, I hope that makes sense and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thanks. Um, I see that Commissioner Almberg is back with us. Um, does anyone have questions for um, Megan? Commissioner Barnes. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I, I guess if I get you, Megan, kind of to, to refresh my memory, make sure I'm not missing something here. But as we've been going through this process, it seemed to me like it was designed to uh, to make it easier for someone that's wanting to acquire bonus points, make it easier for, for sportsmen to do that and, and simplify some things. But some of the comments that I've heard from people and even some of the cabs, it seems like there's a lot of confusion there. Um, <clears throat> and so when I've ex been explaining it to them, it's, you know, it's, it's to make it easier. Um, to get bonus points and do this. So, so I wanna make sure that I'm not missing something because it seems like it's created some confusion. Yeah, so the ease of what we are discussing is mainly during that second draw period. And so currently how that system is set up is that we can, we as a department can only offer a purchase of a bonus point for tags being available for that draw. And so uh, last year, for example, I believe we only had mule deer antelope and cow elk available. And so those were the only three points that you could purchase during that time. Whereas like if somebody missed out in the, the uh, first original big game draw application period for maybe like a sheep tag, they couldn't get one in the second draw period. And so the change to this regulation would allow us to offer a point for all species, regardless of the tags being available in the draw. Well, when I explained to them that we were doing this to help them out and make it simpler, I was not lying to them. <laughs> you were not. <laughs> Deputy Director Rob, do you have something to add? Yeah, Carl, for the record, we know this is going to be a pretty big change that uh, we're going to have to communicate thoroughly. Uh, we're going to send out quite a few emails. Uh, we're going to make sure that this information is available in the hunt application guide. And then as we always do as an agency, we have about 10, 15 people that monitor social media on a regular basis and uh, different hunting forms, whether it be monster mealy, and then we check in with different uh, application services and everybody. And when we determine what needs to be uh, communicated at what time and where we work with those individuals to make sure we get as much information out as we can to the broad audience. That doesn't mean there still won't be some confusion about it and there will be rumors and everything else, but we're going to do our best to, to be in front of it and then monitor and then uh, adjust when, when we see we need to adjust. Okay. Other questions? Vice Chair Cavillia. I guess I have a, a question and a comment, and I think I already know the answer to the question, but you'll still be able to apply for a bonus point during the regular application period, right? Like it, so if you didn't want to put in for antelope, you want to put in for everything else you can apply. But the other thing that this does is this gives the slackers that miss the application period an option to, to get a bonus point. It's what it does. So those are just my, that's my comment on it. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Commissioner Rogers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just curious, 
uh, Ms. Manfredi, that in, in your due diligence um, in, in evaluating this, um, I, I can't see any, but just curious what, if any, um, detriments that you ran across or potential detriments to applicants for uh, bonus points under what's being proposed here? So I guess the only detriment would be we are removing that seven day period to apply for a bonus point or withdraw your application that follows the close of the application period. Um, if you would consider that a detriment, I guess it depends on the person. Um, but we are, we are then offering in the second draw portion, if you miss out on a bonus point in the, the big game, the main draw, you still have the option to apply for it in the second. And so I, I guess, yeah, it depends on how you look at it on if it's a detriment or not. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, I don't see any. Um, okay, so with that, we'll take it out for public comment. Uh, cabs first, please. Mr. Dixon. Hello there, uh, Chairman East, how are you today? Hello, great, thank you, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to kind of echo the, the concern raised by uh, uh, Mr. Barnes, is that in our cab, there was a lot of concern about, there's going to be confusion. And, and, and Jack talked about it to some degree of how we would do education, but I think as we roll this out and make this change, we should do everything in our power to over communicate the change uh, at the first part as well as have um, the ability to have maybe a 24 hour hotline with Calcomy or at Endow uh, for people to get confused. Cause I think the first time you roll this out, you're just gonna have confused people. I mean, I tried my best at my cab <laughs> to, to have this discussion. This was the second time it came up and uh, there, there was a lot of confusion about people and, and worry that uh, it would be harder for people as uh, Commissioner Barnes said, not easier. And so, I, I think it's gonna be easier. I tried to explain it, but I think we're gonna to need to over communicate it and maybe look at possibility of having a helpline. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Other comments? Public comment, Mr. Reese. Can you unmute yourself? Okay, there we, you got me? I do, are you now a councilman or a commissioner? What is your new title? I am now a county commissioner in Lincoln County. Congratulations. So I'm no longer on the cap, thank you. Okay. Uh, so moving forward, so if I understand it correctly, it, let's say somebody uh, wants to keep on putting in for a sheep tag, but they missed the first draw completely. So if I understand you, when you go to open up the second draw for any leftover tags, you are also opening up for anybody that missed the original draw so they can at least continue to buy a sheep point, uh, even though there is no sheep tags being offered. Is that correct? Perfect. I, I think Mr. I Barnes is dead on. Yeah, yeah so. when it's this will be very easy to explain then. I, I got it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reese. Other public comment on agenda item 10A. No. Okay, we'll bring it back to the commission. Other consideration, questions, a motion. Commissioner Rogers. Yeah, if there's any other discussion, I would uh, move to make a motion. That would be great. I don't see any other discussion. Okay. Yes, I would like to uh, make a motion for approval of Commission General Regulation 499, bonus point only application period. And I'd uh, like to make a motion for approval of that as presented with the noted changes to subsection 9 of omitting the, uh, I don't want to word that, but omitting the one uh, uh, sentence, if you will, following the comma as noted by Miss Manfredi. Okay, do I have a second? 
I have a second by Commissioner Weiss. All in favor, raise your hand. Okay, opposed? Motion carries nine to zero. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to agenda item number 11A, Commission General Regulation Workshop Public Comment Allowed. Commission General Regulation 503 LCB file, we don't have a number yet, predator and furbearing contest, Commissioner McNinch for possible action. The commission will hold a workshop to discuss potential language on predator and furbearing contest proposed by McNinch, Commissioner McNinch. And if I may, just before we get started, um, uh, I know this has been a long um, and somewhat arduous process, and I appreciate everyone's patience as we've gotten to this place today. Um, and we know that there's a lot of passion on both sides of this issue. And with that, I'd like um, anyone that plans to speak in public comment about this to please keep your comments respectful. Um, we have probably a lot of public comment coming on this. We've seen a lot of email and correspondence. And so I just ask that you continue to keep uh, your, your comments respectful toward the commission and each other. Uh, with that, um, Commissioner McNinch, do you have something or um, prepared or would you like me to start off with discussion? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The, the only thing that I, I wanted to uh, throw out there was, um, you know, we've got some draft language here just, just for purposes of having a conversation over something. Um, and in, uh, in line with that thought process, there had been conversation early on. Uh, Dag Burkett had kind of made a suggestion at one point. Um, I might have even asked the question, I don't recall, but um, outlining the provisions of enforcement, um, pr enforcement provisions uh, would, be, would be important. So um, I, I mean, I've got some language. I'd kind of bounced some stuff off long, long ago uh, before it kind of backed off on the process to, uh, to kind of calm the waters and see if there's other pathways that we could go down. Um, and we really haven't revisited it since, but there was some provisions in, in the, uh, some work that Vermont did that, that uh, seemed pretty straightforward. Um, if we progress with this, I would like to have that as part of the conversation, um, you know, to, to specifically uh, include in the uh, in the uh, the regulation what the enforcement uh, the enforcement provision so that it's clear you know what the what the penalties would be if for violating so I throw that out there um, I've obviously I've I've always got plenty to say I'm going to do my best to hold off um, uh, hear what everybody has to say and then uh, you know um, maybe bring up some thoughts. Um, uh, I've got some clarifications I want to make, and I, I've had a lot of time to reflect. I've had a lot of folks challenge my thought processes, and um, I've kind of taken a different approach between these last the, the last meeting and this meeting. And uh, I, I do have some things that I want to share, kind of a, uh, trying to really clarify how I'm looking at things and why, um, why it's important to me. So uh, with that, Madam Chair, I'll kick it back to you and let you get it started. Sorry, I keep muting myself. Director Wasley, did you have anything you wanted to state before we start our discussion? Uh, I, I do, Madam Chair, and I, I appreciate um, the opportunity. And I know we're gonna wade into uh, a really difficult place here. And I have been, <clears throat> I guess, tossing and turning um, for the past, three nights and trying to reconcile some of my own thoughts and emotions around this issue. And I, I think, uh, I think it's appropriate uh, for me to, to share some of those. And I, I just, I want to say that I, I wish we were in person. Um, this is so much easier to have these really difficult discussions and in person, um, not to mention the fact that I don't have to look at my camera in this virtual space and see just how old and tired I actually look. So uh, perhaps uh, 
um, January we'll meet in person. But I just I want to say this is an incredibly difficult issue, and it puts the agency, it puts the commission, and it puts me myself in a in a very difficult position. And um, there's not a, a simple solution. It, it's hard. It's complicated. It's emotional, and therefore, by definition, it's 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 messy. And I know that what I'm about to share will undoubtedly offend ind individuals on all sides of this issue. And my intention is not uh, to be an equal opportunity offender, uh, but to offer thought and perspective acquired from the opportunity to, to serve the state and you all in this role for now approaching nine years. And it's not a judgment on the thoughts and ideas of others, but simply sharing my own thoughts and ideas surrounding this, this topic. I wanna start uh, just acknowledging the broad statutory charge of the Nevada Department of Wildlife. It's, it's for all animals and all citizens, in addition to the public safety charge of our, our law enforcement officers on, on the waterways. And the commission uh, provides broad policy guidance to the department on, on that charge. And how we at the department and you as the commission reconcile that, that broad statutory charge for all 895 species and all 3.2 million people with a relatively narrow funding model is at, at the core of many of these challenging issues. With that narrow funding model, uh, we have customers, clients, um, if you will, who are, are deeply invested emotionally, financially in their, in their pastimes and their pursuits and their activities. My job as, as director of the agency is, is to oversee the fulfillment of the agency's statutory charge. For me, that means taking care of all the species for all the citizens. And one of the most important and key ways we do that is by ensuring the future of hunting and fishing as they remain the primary funding mechanisms for conservation and the primary funding mechanisms for the, the, the Nevada Department of Wildlife. And so <clears throat> before I go any further into this issue, I just, I want to share a little bit about what what drives me and and consequently probably some of my own um, thoughts and perspectives. And I'm I'm a hunter conservationist. Um, I was on a successful mule deer hunt with a friend in Elko County last month. Uh, I was scouting bighorn sheep in Nye County with a lucky friend last weekend. Uh, going bird hunting uh, this weekend, and I'll be pursuing elk for myself and desert sheep uh, for a friend beginning later this month. And because I hold a political position and sit before you in a coat and tie doesn't mean that I don't understand the passion and dedication of Nevada sportsmen and women, because I am one. My family homesteaded the Nelson Ranch north of Valmy in 1860, and very little of that ranch remains today. It was sold to Ellison Ranching in 1911. Uh, nothing really more than the, the footings uh, remain in the old home site. However, there remains a, a Nelson pasture, uh, Nelson Creek, uh, USGS uh, gauging station, uh, named the Nelson gauging station on, on the Humboldt River. Um, and I, I take a, a certain pride in, in that, that kind of uh, tenure in, in Nevada, and I take a lot of pride in um, in conservation and, and hunting and angling in, in this state. This issue of, of coyote contest remains super divisive and super emotionally charged. Sides are chosen, uh, perspectives challenged. The emotions around this issue have left little space for, for people to consider the merits of the issue, absent the perspectives of their adversaries. Uh, we let our perspectives be driven by the perspective of our adversaries. We're focusing on the messengers instead of the message. And it's, I think, clouding our ability to evaluate the merits or lack thereof of the contest in and of themselves. Everyone on, this, on all sides of this issue are, are so convinced they're right. Uh, we're surrounding ourselves with like-minded perspectives, validating our views, and again, affording little, if any, room for evaluation of bigger picture consequences. The department has remained mostly on the sideline during these debates. Opinions, even within the department, run the gamut from, from those uh, who participate to those who are vehemently opposed. Uh, our department and the views in our department are, are a microcosm of the views in, in society. Uh, we've shared our professional opinions regarding what contests are and, and what they're not uh, to you, the, the commission. and. Uh, sometimes uh, media that's looking for those those perspectives, but we've tried to remain in purely uh, informative, you know, biological science, uh, 
and biological science, not, not social science, but biological science uh, support role. I just wanna clarify, uh, contests are, are not uh, threatening coyote populations, nor are they in and of themselves saving mule deer or other game populations. Contests do not and will not replace the need for strategic predator control for the benefit of other species, nor do they save the agency any appreciable amount of money. Coyotes are very successful predators. They've been here forever and they will continue to be here. They're, they're verminized, they're demonized for what they do. Um, and I understand that. There are many situations in which their numbers require control. The department, regardless of the outcome, of this issue, the department will continue to remove coyotes in strategic and targeted efforts wherever and whenever necessary for the protection of other species. This proposed regulation, this draft straw dog proposed regulation proposes no limit on coyote hunting. It poses no threat to the number of coyotes taken. It proposes no change in the status of the species as unprotected. It proposes no change on an individual's right or ability to gather, call, or kill coyotes. The regulation as proposed today would prohibit three things. Collection of entry fees, promotion of events, and awarding of prizes or rewards. And the actual words in the regulation may be different than, than those that I, I chose to use here. When I focus on the issue of animal contest and, and this issue in particular, there are a few things that shape my perspective regarding possible act, actions and outcomes. And I, I wanna go through three, three areas. One is the agency role in charge as it relates to the public trust responsibilities under the public trust doctrine. And, and that is the wildlife belongs to all the citizens of the state. Hunting and fishing are, are a privilege. These activities are privileges granted to hunters and anglers by society writ large whether by informed and active support or by apathetic indifference. And because they are privileges, whether we agree or not, they're subject to loss or erosion based on public perceptions and public support. Our actions need to be sensitive to the fact that our preferred recreational pastimes are subject to some level of public acceptance and support. A second item I wanna mention is, is relative to the numbers. Endow is responsible for 895 species in Nevada. Approximately 8% of those are recreationally pursued by hunters and anglers. Two reports released last week show the annual contribution of hunters in terms of total expenditures at $394 million a year and $414 million a year respectively, which is significant. That's a huge economic contribution. Despite that level of economic contribution, it remains that hunters are in the extreme minority of citizens in Nevada, 2.35% of our citizens. Take that 2.35%, double it, triple it, quadruple it, or increase it, increase that percent by, by 10 times, and we're still outnumbered by over three to one. Our actions must be with the awareness of our broader societal, societal irrelevance. The third item is ethics, conservation, and the North American model of wildlife conservation. What do they have to say regarding contests? Killing contests are ethically upsetting by virtue for most members of society. Hunting should not be a competition as such behavior ultimately degrades the value of life and undermines respect for the animals being hunted. Aldo Leopold in a Sand County Almanac wrote that, I quote, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. The North American model that we often propped up as the anchor of modern wildlife management disapproves of, I quote, frivolous killing. Wildlife Society in a 2019 issue paper stated their policy is to discourage contests that adversely affect I quote, the public's appreciation of wildlife resources, end quote. The Wildlife Society further suggested that, quote, making a contest of it may undermine the public's view of ethical hunting. I fully recognize that hunting ethics are largely subjective and an individual choice. In my ethics as a hunter, I hope to defend a deeper and more profound sense of hunting than what I fear coyote contests say to the general public about hunters and our ethics. 
Hunters need to be conscious of the public image we pro project and the way in which the public perceives us. And I'll leave one, one final thought. If it's not good for the image, it's not good for the future. And Madam Chair, I, I know that that's probably a, a stronger statement than, than many uh, commission or viewing public uh, anticipated from, from the department. And we have, we have uh, sat uh, on the sideline, as, as I indicated. Um, really, what my biggest fear uh, around this issue is, is for the future, for the future of conservation, for the way that, that we as, as ethical sportsmen and women are viewed by a changing society and the consequences on a whole host of other activities. And I think sometimes we, we oftentimes have a shared um, desired outcome and where the disagreement is, is on the best way to achieve that. And I think this is a, is a manifestation of that where in many instances, uh, many of us want the same thing and the debate may be uh, whether uh, giving a little here is a way to uh, preserve the future or whether it hastens the demise. And my fear uh, as a sportsman and my fear as a director of the Department of Wildlife is an unwillingness to consider um, what society writ large feels about a certain activity will hasten the erosion of, of privileges that I hold near and dear. So I'll, I'll end at that, Madam Chair, and thank you for the opportunity to share some thoughts. Thank you, Director Wosley. I appreciate your comments. Um, do we have other discussion from the commission? Mr. McNinch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Tony, I really appreciate your comments. I was gonna save mine for later, but uh, in light of that, I, I feel, you know, um, Tony was talking, I did a lot of, lot of researching. I, I looked into a lot of stuff. I, I, I wanted to make myself more aware. Of, um, we talk about the North American model for wildlife conservation. And we talk, um, we talk about how it's the foundation. Um, you know, it's, it's where conservation started in the United States and Canada. And we talk about the two prominent uh, champions, long-term champions of the, uh, of the model. Uh, that being the Wildlife Society and the Boone and Crockett Club. And um, I really tried to understand, you know, what, what is it that's driving my, my concerns? And, and um, Tony kind of mentioned how a lot of his stuff is founded in that North American model of wildlife conservation. That's where I'm finding mine is. Um, to be quite frank, um, if hunters aren't successful, I don't believe conservation is. And that might offend people that's where I'm at. I've never been, I've always, I've been, I'm always, I've always been a, a, an advocate of, of hunting. I've never been an anti-hunter. I've got differences of opinion on how certain things should be done um, or if they should be done, but, uh, but I'm an advocate for hunting. I, I'm, I have no problem with that. It's a very viable uh, wildlife management tool, um, which is really what the North American model of wildlife conservation is. That That's what it is. It's, um, there was a need, a great need to conserve wildlife and maintain relevancy um, for sportsmen. And uh, that's where it came from. And um, I do see it as the foundation of conservation for species in the United States and Canada. And if the model were to be applied around the world, it would help there too. Um, I found myself reading a technical paper that was uh, sponsored by the Wildlife Society and the Boone and Crockett Club. And it was done in December of 2012. It's very prominently posted on uh, the Wildlife Society's website. It's easy to find. And one of the, the statements that stuck out to me uh, the most, and I'm going to read it. Um, there's lots and lots of stuff in here. And, and like Tony, there were, there were things in here that, that talked about, um, you know, in all fairness, it, these are recommendations. These are these are recommendations for how to move forward and how to continue to, to maintain relevancy and how to continue with the conservation model that's so important. And um, but it it made recommendations on a on a variety of issues. You know, um, the perspectives on uh, animal rights groups, uh, the ethics of hunting, the um, you know the governance of it. 
uh, lots and lots of recommendations, lots and lots of uh, thoughts. So in all fairness, I'm representing a very small portion of this document here, but it really kind of summarizes where I'm at right here. So I'm gonna read it. So this is a, a summary and recommendation from that technical report, again, put together by um, sportsmen, sportswomen, advocates of, of uh, hunting, fishing, uh, organizations, represent, representatives of organizations. Um, I actually know a handful of these people. I've actually met them and talked to them um, just in uh, attending WAFA conferences and things like that. Um, but this is one of the recommendations and it says, governance models that are not in concert with contemporary societal needs or address only limited special interest risk having the wildlife management enterprise lose relevancy to society. Too much is at stake in terms of biodiversity and human health to warrant this risk. The institution of wildlife management needs to take bold steps to ensure that governance fosters relevance. That's what it boils down to for me. If the sportsmen aren't relevant, then I think it endangers and erodes the public support for uh, which in turn, uh, we lose support for the agency, we lose conservation opportunities, and that's what it's pulling down to. There's so much more I, I would I would wanna say, I don't speak as uh, um, succinctly or eloquently as Tony does. Um, I've got a billion notes here, but really that's what it's boiling down to for me. And this isn't, this isn't um, just saying what I think needs to happen. Uh, you know, I'm sharing with you my thought process this is why it's been bothering me. It's a core issue for me. Um, I'm not trying to make arguments. Um, I'm trying to plead to, uh, to you know, our foundation, the North American Model of Wildlife Conservation, if that's really where we're founded. Um, I'm finding my way through that. Um, there's certainly other things in there, like I said, but, but this is where I'm finding, you know, if we wanna maintain conservation, and continue with those practices. It's important that we that we consider these things. So that's where I'm at. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner McNich. Commissioner Alberg. Uh, I'm glad I, I let uh, the two speakers go first. Uh, I uh, I agree with what's been said. Uh, I know I'll be targeting together because of. Uh, my view, I've been asked a, a ton of, since I've been here, what's my agenda? My agenda is exactly as described, it's to preserve um, these activities into the future, looking down and that's it. it it's it's, it's uh, the wildlife is number one and our uses of them are, 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 are completely secondary. Um, and uh, in order for us to continue, and, and, and it, it really bothers me that we've not been successful in and, uh, you know, it's very clear in American values or the, the state values that we've not done a very good job at uh, telling, you know, the world what, what the, the, the wildlife conservation of the North American model is even all about and where the funding comes from. And we're very far, super far behind the education curve and the, the messaging curve out there. Um, it, it was one of the reasons, again, I wasn't very popular before with supporting spending that money on that messaging, but education is, is, is huge in, in what uh, conservation is all about um, and how important it is to be able to manage all species uh, now and, and well into the future, it'll never end. The demand on, on uh, management will just get uh, more significant uh, as time goes by and more development, we'll have more obstacles to cross and, and the impact to wildlife will, will continue to to increase, not decrease. Uh, and so uh, anyway, I, I appreciate the comments that have been made. Um, I, I'm in alliance with them. I, I think uh, this is one of the issues that sent us backwards with it in the court of public opinion. And I think it's very damaging to the, the future of management of wildlife. And uh, so uh, I, I'm, okay, I'm okay with the language it's, that's in front of us. Um, I, I would like to hear more from Commissioner McNinch for myself on uh, more of what uh, you know the, the what goes with it, what you're proposing. What uh, you mentioned, Vermont's uh, uh, penalties or, or uh, you know the other the flip side of this. If, so, if you could ask you to, to get a little bit more into that, I'd appreciate it. 
Okay. Madam Chair, do you want me to do that now? Uh, sure. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Allenberg. I'll, uh, I'll just read. And again, you know, the numbers and stuff, it's just kind of a, um, a framework for it is really what it is. You know, the, the, the amounts and stuff like that would change, but it basically, uh, the provision that's in there, it does, it basically states a person who violates this section may be fined not more than X dollars nor less than X dollars for a first offense. Upon a second and all subsequent convictions or any conviction while under license suspension related to the requirements, uh, a person who violates this section shall be fined and not more. And it basically it doubles, their provisions kind of double, uh, it's a little more than that. Um, so there, so it kind of outlines a, a fine structure um, and it goes on to talk about um, a person violating provisions of this part uh, shall receive points for convictions in accordance with the following schedule. Um, and, it, and it goes into a point system. So, it, so the framework would uh, discusses uh, basically demerits and um, uh, for participating in a coyote hunting competition or holding or conducting a coyote co uh, hunting competition. So that's kind of the framework. Um, you know, all or part, uh, there is uh, there is a structure absent something specific that would be in place. Um, I'd have to ask Dag Burkett to help us with that. But if we don't have something in place that specifically uh, details, there are provisions that uh, would be used and applied in its place. Craig, did you want to add anything to that? Burkett, are you? No, oh, he's listening. <laughs> Ms. Musso? Sorry, I was I was accessing our remote website to review the enforcement provisions that I'd reviewed before that I thought that um, Mr. McNinch was interested in discussing and I was trying to kind of give you guys a summary of what they are. And, and what I was, just to be clear, and I have no idea what the commission intends to do with this, but before, as a word of caution, before you would do anything with this petition, I would recommend that you take a look at uh, the, an enforcement provision and add that to it because it has no value whatsoever without an enforcement provision. And so what I communicated, and again, this is entirely within the commission's discretion and I'm loath to participate in policy making. So I wanna be clear that this is just ideas for the commission in terms of enforcement. Uh, the Vermont state statute speaks to a very simple means where there's no misdemeanor, there's no criminal um, uh, element to it, basically a fine that graduates based on offenses, you could certainly attach uh, demerit points to it, I suppose, depending on, I have to look at the NAC and whether you could do that. Another uh, statute that I'm looking at now simply says, any person who violates this section is guilty of a misdemeanor and upon conviction thereof shall be punished by a fine of $500 and assessment of blank demerit points. So those are two different options you have. I would simply say if, again, I have no idea what the commission intends to do today. I'm simply offering that as a word of caution before you would do anything, if you adopted these ideas or a petition like this, you should attach a, an enforcement provision to it. Um, and those are just two options. Thank you, Dag Burkett. Ms. Musso, did you have anything to add? Uh, no, thank you, Chairman East. I was just going to say what Dag Burkett did, but he beat me to it. Okay, thank you. And, and for me, Madam Chair, I guess uh, the, the, real, the real portion would be the fine. I'm not, I'm not as concerned about demerit points and stuff like that. It's certainly, um, you know, if there's continuing to be issues or something, then, you know, it would be like anything else that we've done. We could consider it. Um, additional. So keeping it simple, uh, really straightforward with just fines, uh, like it would be for um, a speeding ticket or something along those lines is really was really the framework that um, I had in my mind, at least. And uh, in my very limited conversations with Dag Burkett, 
several months ago, six, seven months ago, um, it's, it seemed that it would be plausible to do something like that if we chose to go down that path, so. Okay, thank you. Vice Chair Cavillia. I guess I'll wade into it. I, I do have a question to start with. Um, initially, when all this, all these discussions we've had the last few months or the last few meetings, you know, it was, a, it was, it's basically focused on coyotes, but then we, you know, within the proposed regulation, you put predatory animals and fur bearing animals, fur bearing animals captures a lot of other species beyond predators. Um, can somebody at the department just list every single one of the animals that would fall under that category to begin with? Because I, I believe there's quite a few. Yeah, Director Wasley, do you have? Uh, I don't, we could, uh, we could call on staff to do that or we could simply, you know, if the commission has a, um, you know, a desire to see it narrowed or focused on, you know, a, a single species or a subset of species, uh, we could we could call them out. I think it was LCB that that chose that language, um, and I think uh, I think Kaylee might. And I'm sorry to put you on the spot, Kaylee, but I think Kaylee might have the history on that because as we as uh, as we talked about the best way to uh, capture that, I think there was um, I think there was some change of that based on what existed presently in statute, but I, I, I don't think we're tied to anything in particular. I think this is a starting point, a straw dog, if you will. Um, but I don't know. Um, and I guess maybe, a, I don't know if our, our fur bearer, I don't think our fur bearer biologist is on there, but we could probably pull up NRS and read through the list of fur bearer species with that would be covered with the current language. But if there's a desire um, to go a different direction, then and you know that's fair game too. Okay. And I know I don't believe there's a lot of other contests outside the Kyle contest, but there are some. But you, I just you want to have it all out in the open. You tend to capture all of that, right? Um, and I guess I was trying to decide whether to vocalize my opinion on this prior to or after a public comment. But I'll I, I'll just wade into it now. Um, we talk about the North American model of wildlife conversation or of conservation, and it, it is subjective. You know, the one that, and I, I could see both sides of it. Wildlife can only get wildlife can only be killed for a legitimate purpose, and we have one side that says killing these cows for a contest is absolutely not legitimate. Uh, the, the individuals in the contest they believe it's absolutely a legitimate purpose, right? That. And this, this is the whole thing. Both sides, it seems to me like both sides speak in absolutes, but they're not really absolutes. The truth is somewhere in the middle, right? We hear, we hear from both, both sides, the same thing with hunting ethics. We hear all this, uh, we hear all this stuff about, you know, the ethics of it. Well, you know, ethics are subjective. It's completely across the board. What, what somebody might agree to do, I don't agree to do with it, you know, but that they're ethically to them, it's perfectly fine. Um, you know, the, and I guess one thing that I, ha I have to bring up because it has really bothered me and this, this, and, and Dave's brought it up for, since I've been on the commission, this has been the most um, decisive issue that we've discussed. And I put a ton of thought to it. And I'm sure all the other commissioners have put a thought to it, but um, it has not been mentioned yet. And I, I just want to bring it up, this threat, this threat that we need to regulate or it's gonna to go to the legislature really bothers me. Um, and it seems like that threat has gained steam the last couple of months, start getting brought up more and more. You read all these opinion pieces in the news and it gets bring up, brought up more and more and it, it really bothers me. Um, and I think the, that, that side of the argument, I don't know, they, they think they've gained steam on that threat. And it's, for some people, you know, you, put, you threaten somebody and you might get the, you might get the inverse reaction at that point. You know, and I and I don't know. It's, I'm just I'm just laying it out there. It bothered me that that they've it's gained so much steam this this perceived threat, and there then you may go to the legislature and change the makeup of the commission, and you may not, right? But um, to try to threaten the commission to pass a regulation, it just it really has bothered me. I sh I have some more thoughts. I'll stop there, um, but I just wanted to get that out. Thank you, Vice Chair Cavilia. 
Um, I, I want to clarify just once one moment, Commissioner Perini. Yes, there's a threat from the from the public, um, but we've also received a letter from a legislator that suggested that he would manage this through the legislature if we don't. So I just want to make remind everyone of that. Um, and I, I sympathize with you, Vice Chair Cavilia, because it it is it's definitely out there. Um, Okay, Commissioner Perini. You're on mute. I probably there you got go. it. <laughs> but you know, I think everyone that's here right now been thinking about this, I think a long time. And I think what David mentioned that up and how we had talked about with the coyotes, sometimes I got thinking one way and thinking a different way. But I can tell you this is, is I wonder if we really understand about coyotes. And what I'm trying to tell you is this, you know, sometimes what I was hoping, and I don't think it, it can happen now, it couldn't happen, is whether or not if we had coyotes um, uh, being shot because we had people that were contents looking for that and trying to, to harvest those things. Um, there's no way right now that whether or not how many of those that got shot, how many didn't get shot, whatever did on that kind of stuff and is dealing with money. And what I was hoping to see would is to have a license. And even though we can't do it the legislature because it's not available right now, but we really don't know the history of what really, of how many coyotes is there, what's going on, what is all the issues? What of all the different kind of ranchers, for example, where they have problems with, with sheep, so we have cows, we got all that sort of stuff. And then we hear about all these things about the, uh, the, the actual coyotes coming and doing things in a, in a negative way, but nobody really understands that. We don't even really know how many numbers there is in Nevada. There isn't. Nobody really understands what that is to 100%. And what I was, was trying to think about was the fact is if it had a license where somebody did have a content thing going and they did use that and find out exactly if it made a difference as far as, is there really that many animals that got harvested and got shot? Or does it really hurt? Is there more of those dogs going away? How about the time that we have with all our, we talk about the wildlife animals. We're talking about those. We're saying where the coyotes are getting worse and worse about killing things. And then, you know what, I, I just wonder about those kinds of things. And I worry about the people that live right across the street here. And they talk about the coyotes where the cats are, are, are dead and the other dogs of their own are dead. There's just different options that are going on at all times where people are saying about the coyotes. Are they too many of them out here or is there not enough? Is there people that really truly want to see those coyotes or should we not do that? And I have seen it sometimes where people have had some real problems. They truly have with the, with the coyotes. They truly have. Then I see a lot of people say it's really nice to see them and all this sort of stuff. I guess what I'm trying to tell you is, is that we really don't know what happens. We don't really know how many there is. We don't even know what is really going 100% for the content things versus not. Are we gonna be able to be able to organize that to see whether or not we're making a big nervous or just to change it? I just don't really know what to do on this thing. I really have a problem with it. You know, the coyote thing has been here. I've been raised here my whole life. They've been here all the time. There's always nine new little babies done every year. Um, we see them all the time. We don't see that. But we see people that really raise so much havoc about the fact about coyotes. They truly do. And what I'm hearing to is the content thing. If they just say, we're not going to do any more contents from now on. That's what we say is the A number, as I say. Is it okay? I took, you know, the content thing's not there anymore. But then those people that love the coyote so much is sometimes what they'll do is say, okay, I'm going to start going with B and having them not being able to be shot at. I'm worried about those things. I'm worried about people that really grow all that stuff. And all of a sudden I won that one. Now I'm going to go for number two and I'm going to change it again to maybe have the coyotes can not be shot at all. I'm worrying about that. And I'm saying there's a lot of people that are so much in favor of that coyotes 
don't really understand about, again, the ranchers. We have the people's living in people's next to their houses. We have a person that got shot, in a, I mean, actually bit in the stomach one time over at Harris Casino. I saw that and they had to bring them into the hospital. They don't realize that there's a lot of, dis, a lot of problems with those coyotes. And they think they're really, really nice, but they're really not. There's a lot of problems with that. And I guess what I'm trying to say on that, it's a mix of all kinds of things. Are we really doing and understanding exactly about the coyotes? Do we really understand how many, how many there is in the state of Nevada? I'm gonna bring that up again. Are we still having things with the ranchers? We're having all those problems. Are we having problems all the time, except we have people that say they look real pretty and they're fun. I'm just wondering about that. And I would like to see more information about that before we can make up a mind one way or the other. That's just my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Perini. Other comments? Commissioner Barnes. All right, well, everybody's jumping in, so I guess I'll, I'll jump in too. Um, and boy, I, I gotta tell you, I'm no different than anybody else. I probably spent more time thinking about this um, for quite a while than just about any other issue that uh, was discussed on this commission. And to be perfectly honest, part of that really upsets me because um, I wish we spent this much time talking about mule deer, for instance, um, than this. But, th but this, is a, this is a really a big issue. Um, you know, I know at the beginning when Director Wazi was talking, you know, how it uh, really challenged him. Well, you know, it's really challenged me too. Um, I really had to think a lot about, uh, about my perspective. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of kind of where, where, where I've been, you know, where, where I'm going with my thought process in all of this, but it's, it, but it's been a good reflection, um, kind of on, on who I am. And one of the, uh, some of the comments, the emails and stuff we received, um, we've all received them. Um, we've been called a lot of things, but, but in one in particular, uh, um, I was called a traditionalist and, and it was meant um, in a negative connotation towards me, but I thought I, I am a traditionalist, and um, and I really be appreciated being recognized as such, and uh, so I guess that's that's kind of where my views um, lie. And when I look at this, um, I do kind of have 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 problem. You know, I understand that the social issue and that uh, that a lot of people are really uncomfortable with the perception with with this. But when when I break it down, I kind of, you know, are, what are we regulating? Um, you know, they're really not doing anything illegal um, per se. It's, it, it is that issue. And so, so that's kind of where, I, where I've been struggling. And um, I kind of know what we're going to hear in, in public comment, but, I, but I'm going to, I want to hear what we're going to hear in public comment. And uh, I guess those for now, I guess that, that's kind of where I'm going to leave it. Kind of where, where I've been here for the last few months. Thank you, Commissioner Barnes. Anyone else? Commissioner Rogers. Sure, long as uh, everyone's jumping in here, I'll, I'll give my two cents. And really as I, you know, as one of the newest members of the commission, I, I have really found myself doing much more listening on this subject than I have talking uh, over the last number of meetings. And you know, I have, like everybody, I've heard everyone's comments on both sides of this issue. I've read, I'm sure like everybody else, the thousands upon thousands of emails that we've received on both sides of this issue. Um, I've also taken it upon myself to reach out to a number of different sources uh, to, to really gather as much information as I possibly can to make an informed decision. Uh, I, I think I owe it to myself, I owe it to this commission, citizens of the states and the wildlife to really, uh, again, put in the time and effort to understand these, these issues. And of course, we have a commission, same thing. We spent a tremendous amount of time looking and evaluating the subject. And, uh, you know, with that said, I, I do believe that it is really an emotionally white hot issue for people more than it is about a wildlife contest. 
Um, I've also, you know, found as I've, you know, talked with many of the cabs throughout the state, I, I don't think there's one cab that supports this ban. Um, NGOs that are specific to the state of Nevada. I don't think there's a, a, a single Nevada-based NGO uh, that supports this, this ban as well. So, you know, unfortunately, again, and it, it's maybe a microcosm of our society, but, you know, people have, have run to their corners and, and, and dug their heels in on this issue. And, um, you know, I also agree with a lot of the things that that Commissioner Prini was just talking about in terms of some of our knowledge on it. Uh, also agree with some of the things uh, Commissioner Cavilli was talking about uh, in terms of the ethics side of things. But um, again, white hot issue and, and um, it's, it, 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 it's a tough one. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But with my research, not a lot of support out there for this. Okay, thank you. Other comments or thoughts before we I'm gonna reserve mine? Um, Commissioner Weiss. I will round it out here. Um, <laughs> I know that uh, also being a new commissioner, I have really been listening in on this issue. Um, there has been a lot to absorb. This has been going on long before I came on. Um, I've also been getting all of the emails. There's a, like we've already talked about and mentioned a lot emotionally charged, but there are some people who are really looking at the facts and, and have established, well, we know that we're not reducing population by having these contests, um, that they still feel one way or the other about whether or not they should move forward. And I hear those comments. I want everyone to know that because it's been a lot to absorb. Um, I do think that I am aware and cognizant, and I think that a lot of people on the commission are, that um, banning a contest, none of us want that to become a slippery slope into any sort of other hunting activities. And the wording here like does not do that. Um, we are talking about something that does not control population, that um, doesn't really affect population one way or the other and uh, it becomes then more of an ethical issue and more of a what does the public, greater public want issue. And, and it's become really clear what that is, um, that most people do not want these contests to proceed. Um, so I think that is something that I need to consider uh, in my position. And also I can appreciate just pointing out again that, um, that hunting of coyotes, you know, trapping, all of these things, all of these regular activities are not going to be affected by the ban of a contest and that we're specifically talking about that and that I have no interest in limiting those other activities that we're just talking about this thing that affects a mass amount of population at any given period that is paid, that is contested. Um, but that's, it's been a lot. And so I appreciate everybody's patience as I absorb what's going on with this issue, but that's kind of where I'm at with it right now. Thank you, Commissioner Weiss. Anyone else? Commissioner McNinch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, before we move on, I just was hoping to uh, clarify a couple things. Um, I know Commissioner Cavilia had brought up the uh, fur bearing component. So um, the provision that's written in here was largely is verbatim out of Arizona. It included the fur bearer. And the reason for that um, was that uh, due to some of the side bets that were out there, you know, hey, while you're out um, uh, calling coyotes, if you run across the bobcat, then, you know, uh, whoever brings in the most bobcats will win extra money. It's like a, a, a side $25 thing or 50, whatever. Um, for me, if that needed to come out to to um, to resolve issues, um, I'm certainly open to that. It's 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 minimal. Um, I, I think um, I'm certainly willing to um, consider that. It, it, there's no doubt in my mind that it's you know it was just included as part of uh, the Arizona stuff that was written in, and that's what I'd asked the department to put down. So um, so they were just kind of honoring my my request by including that language. I think so. 
Um, I just wanted to point that out. And uh, a couple of other quick things. Um, this is not a biological issue for me. I, there's, you know, maybe in some weird cir circumstance or somewhere along the way, uh, there's benefit or there's adverse impacts uh, from uh, removing coyotes. Um, but biologically speaking, I'm totally on board that, this, that there's no impact. It's not an issue uh, biologically for coyotes. Um, I also understand that ranchers and farmers, uh, they do, there, there's no doubt in my mind, some of the folks that we've heard from, there, there's no doubt that, that they've had issues here and there, some maybe more so than others. Um, and uh, I can empathize with that, um, trying to deal with those situations. Um, I fully support um, people protecting their livestock, their pets, their families, uh, whatever it is that they, they, they need to protect. Uh, through lethal removal of, of predators or, for that matter, anything else uh, lawfully. And uh, so I don't have a problem with that. And, uh, and I support them in those efforts. I just disagree that, that this is a, a, the best way to do it um, through these contests. Um, Commissioner Barnes, I would wear your traditionalist tag proudly. <laughs> um, that's not a bad thing. Um, I think that the folks that are, are putting labels on all of us with respect to those are, um, you know, anything to, to justify uh, your label or where you stand on the issue. Um, I want you to know that what that means to me is that you have certain uh, viewpoints and certain attitudes towards wildlife that are, that are categorized a little differently than others. And it doesn't, doesn't make you anything less <laughs> to me. Um, and I hope, I hope that that's true for, for most people. I'm sorry that you guys are getting labeled this. I've been labeled a lot of things too, and it is, it is upsetting um, uh, because you'd like to think that you're, um, you know, to be labeled like that, it, 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 it's, it, it can be hurtful. Um, but um, I respect the fact that some of you guys carry traditionalist values. Um, I respect that some carry the mutualist values. And for me, um, people... <laughs> not based on the labels, but um, technically I'm one of the pluralists. I'm the guy that falls in between. I can see, I can see, um, uh, I kind of lean a little bit each way, uh, depending on how things are done. That's kind of how it works for me. So um, I'm sorry that that's happening. Commissioner Cavilia, I completely um, understand uh, your frustrations with the legislative uh, aspect. Um, I've moved beyond all that. Um, it is what it is. If we see it at the legislature, um, I, the one question that does pop into my main, my mind, um, how will we handle it <laughs> if we get, if it gets that far, if it does go that direction. Uh, but, but for me, this really boils down to this relevancy of sportsmen equals conservation, irrelevancy equals erosion. And it, it really is boiling down to that. And it's all right here out of the, out of the technical reviews and the position papers of, uh, the wildlife society. Uh, the Boone and Crockett Club, uh, there are others, uh, Teddy Roosevelt Conservation Partnership and the Congressional uh, Sportsman's Foundation have uh, taken not quite as strong a view, uh, uh, positions as some of these others, but they've made comments uh, expressing these concerns. And, um, you know, it's not the act of killing the coyotes that's the problem for me. It's, it's, how, it's how it's being done. Um, that's, that's what it boils down to. And uh, the, the Wildlife Society and, and uh, Boone and Crockett, through their, their concerns with the social dynamics, uh, kind of warn us against falling into that trap. That's, that, this is where I'm at. Relevancy equals conservation. And I see us um, staying relevant by uh, dealing with these, these contests. So, okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Omberg. Yeah, just, uh, you know, this is the difficulty as we, we all, I mean, we see value in, in so many of the comments being made. Um, um, again, you know, uh, to, to Commissioner Cavillia's point about being, uh, uh, you know, about the, the legislation, but it's also about being a traditionalist, who, who obviously uh, I am. Um, it's also about being a rural life. And which obviously I am. I, I want to be as rural as can be. I, you know, <laughs> there there can't be no no uh, no no place too far or 
Uh, I don't, I don't want to see nothing but wildlife and, and wild places in my view. Um, so I fit all those descriptions. Um, and, and it's not that, it, that there's, there's necessarily a disagreement at, at all. I can't even recall um, off the top of my head a comment from the sportsmen uh, you know, that, that I didn't necessarily agree with. But you know, for me, I, uh, you just have to, uh, again, uh, I, I brought it out, I want my position so that, uh, you know, I, I didn't surprise me. I've had plenty of conversations with those sportsmen around uh, my area about it. And so this is no, my position and my thought process isn't a surprise to anybody uh, that knows me uh, all that well that I've talked to had in depth. Uh, it worries me about the future. And uh, I'm a conservative person. And, uh, and so uh, I just uh, wanted to, to relay some of my, my final thoughts before we, we go out to public. Thank you, Commissioner Allenberg. Anyone else? Vice Chair Cavilia. I, I got to open my mouth again. Um, <laughs> uh, I guess one concern I have too is, you know, I grew up in rural Nevada and I, I've lived in Vegas now for almost 20 years. I think that, and this is again, my, my opinion, but you have a, you have a vocal minority on one side that's super opposed to this. The Kyle calling contests are a, you know, the guys doing it, it's a minority of the hunting population too. It truly is. Um, but I'm just, you know, everybody talks about the public in general, the public in general. I go talk to people. Most people in the public, they don't know what a cow calling contest is. They could care less about a cow calling contest. And I, that's just the truth. I mean, it, it is. All people I work with down here do not hunt. Very few of them hunt. You go talk to them about it. They don't, they don't even care. And I think that the bulk of our population is like that. Um, you've got a very active, very vocal minority. And, and I have a hard, it's, it's hard, it's just hard for me. And they're very organized. Um, you know, are, do, are we, are we conceding to that? You know, and I know they talk about, oh, there's eight other states that have, that have banned it. Yeah. Well, there's, there's technically 41, right? Oh, Hawaii doesn't have them. 41 others have not. And it, it's been attempted in those states as well. You know, so I have a, I just, I, I mean, everybody's, you know, where I lay now, but I, I've, I've got a hard time with this. And then kind of backing up a little bit on the legislative threat, you know, there's two threats out there. One's the Kyle calling contest are going to go to the uh, legislature. The other ones that we're going to attempt to change the makeup of the commission. Right. And I think, I think if you believe that how we respond to this is going to change their attempts to go to the legislature and try to get, and I'm talking about the anti hunting side of the world, to try to, they're still going to go to the legislature. That, that's why this thing really bothers me. Um, and I just, I just wanted to get it out there right now. All right. Thank you, Commissioner or Vice Chair Cavilia. Commissioner McNinch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, Commissioner Cavilia, I just, I can't, I can't help but continue to, to focus back on the North American model of wildlife conservation and the fact that there's, I know that we've got um, we've gotten a lot of uh, letters from NGOs, uh, and that 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 hasn't just been from sportsman organizations. That's come from all sorts of NGOs. Uh, uh, all they are is just non governmental organizations. That's all it is. And we've gotten uh, sign on letters. We've gotten a lot of letters from a lot of different, and they're all they're falling on all sides of the issue. Um, but I, I keep coming back to the North American model of wildlife conservation because this was developed by sportsman-based organizations on a broad level, at a national level. And, uh, and if, if I wish, I wish I had done more work on this earlier. Um, I just, you know, I guess I'm just in the same boat you guys are. Um, you know, we've all been getting it from all different sides and we've all put a ton of time into this. I wish I would have looked at this and, and at a time where we could have done it more as a commission and really evaluated this, um, I think Commissioner Omberg kind of brought up, you know, it would be nice to, to, to look at this, this document that we kind of found ourselves on and really, really understand what it's doing. It warns, it warns in here specifically of not addressing these types of issues. And the recommendations that it has in it are to address them. Um, 
in the need of maintaining relevancy and need uh, um, uh, of sportsmen. Um, the reason I keep fighting for it is because my 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 beliefs in conservation are tied directly to the success of sportsmen. That's that's it's as simple as that. Um, you're the sportsmen are the ones that have been doing this the longest. Um, they know how best to do it right now with regards to you know they. Um, it's a snap of a finger and, you know, that organizations write a hundred thousand dollar check for things. I mean, it's incredible the things that they accomplish. Um, this is just, it's, it's, it's the trail cam. It's the, um, caliber limitations. Uh, it's, it, these are all issues. It's the, the, the drones. Those are all issues that, we clean up because as the public becomes aware of those things, they form opinions. Whether I agree with you, the vast majority of, of uh, the public in the state, excuse me, um, don't have a particular opinion about anything with wildlife right now. But as they become aware and they become aware by whoever's getting into their ear, we all know that, they form and develop opinions. And whether they do anything at the legislature or with this commission, which, you know, I've defended the makeup of this commission for the exact region commission on Allenberg mentioned the, the, the rural, there's a rural representation on here that I think is really valuable and really critical. Um, so it bothers me too, that there's those conversations. Um, when I see, when I, when I see people starting to form those opinions, um, it just erodes trust. Um, the more urban we get, the more, distrusting the public becomes of a government agency to begin with, especially a wildlife agency. And as that continues to erode, it, it, we lose the ability for funding mechanisms that might be in the form of initiatives or uh, bonds or whatever the case might be. So it doesn't have to be direct impact um, at the legislature. It can be in many other forms. You know, I'm not signing on to that. You ought to hear what they do, um, that kind of stuff. Um, the vast majority of the public are largely accepting of what sportsmen do of hunting, fishing, trapping. And I include trapping in there. It's, it's that, that they're largely accepting of it, but how we do it will change those opinions. And that that's what this is, is that this is just a more, um, a more substantial and more significant issue than those others that has a greater, um, uh, a greater negative impact. If we, if we, if we, if we swing in this, that's, that's all. Okay, I think we'll wrap this discussion and take it out for public comment because I know we'll have additional comment once we're done. I'm gonna take cab comment first. So if you're with a cab, please raise your hand. And we're gonna take cab comment first. Mr. McVickers. Hello. Uh, our uh, cab was not in favor of any of the language proposed or any of the contest bans. So that was all we had. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mitch. Mr. Malarkey. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and the Commission at large. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to really sound off on my opinions so much in terms of how I voted. I'll let my voting record speak for that within the cab. But there were a couple of things that I found um, that I think are worth discussing. You know, the first I think is, is speaks to D Director Wasley's comments that we're talking about 3% of the population that are avid sportsmen. And you really have a vocal majority that's subjugating an involved minority in this case in the way I look at it. And the danger with that is that, you know, through Pittman Robertson, we, you commission just approved the purchase of a ranch, right? That comes from sportsmen. And so, you know, to that end, I think that it was a point that was worth kind of bringing up. Secondly, um, I think that you guys really need to look at support. You need to look at where the support for Nevada is coming from. Because the last time I checked, this is the Nevada Wildlife Commission and not the National Wildlife Commission. Um, and because of that, you have all of your caps have resoundingly opposed all of this language in the last four meetings. And that hasn't changed. 
And so I think that it's important, you know, for us as CAB members, we see, you know, people compelled to continue this conversation when the people who are trying to do good and help their communities and look out for wildlife are saying, commission, please take this off the table or at least listen to the people who are trying to advise you in this regard. And so, um, you know, those cabs represent tens of thousands of sportsmen in Nevada. And if you look at the opposition, a lot of the opposition are nationally funded animal rights organizations that are providing talking points. Um, and it's, it's virtue, virtue signaling at its finest. Um, and so I would encourage this commission to truly listen to the people who are active in this discussion from a cab perspective and the Nevadans that are speaking to you. Um, because I think that that's your job as the Nevada Wildlife Commission. Um, and lastly, I just one other thing that I haven't heard that is interesting to me is that the last time I checked prohibition um, has a pretty poor track record. And, you know, if you take an active uh, stance against this, I think you're just going to see these kind of contests get pushed underground and any other contests that come after that pushed underground the same way. I don't know if that's the case, but it might be something for you all to think about. So with that, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Malarkey. <clears throat> Mr. Dixon. Thank you, uh, Chair East and the commission for this time. Um, I will say that the, the Clark County cab, we have a meeting that lasts uh, three and a half hours. And we spent one hour on the entire agenda that you have. And we spent the remainder of our time right up to the end on this topic. Uh, we have 13 members of the public in, in attendance and also had the virtual uh, WebEx meeting running. Uh, so people like um, the public, like Fred Boltz could participate without having to come to the meeting. And uh, we had a very, very lively in serious discussion about this. Um, and even with that few people in the audience, the fact that we spent two plus hours on this topic uh, should tell you that there was a lot of debate within the cab. Uh, I know a couple of members of my cab are on uh, this call, will probably speak um, as giving you their opinions that went into the vote that we had. Our, our vote really said that we're kind of where Commissioner Prini was that we should wait and determine whether or not there's really a need for this. And, and, and I do a lot right now with environmental justice for my job, which has to do with uh, basically compensating uh, minorities and people of color for the ways that they have been in, environmentally impacted by the Department of Energy work over the years. Um, and what we're looking at right here is, I'm not sure if it's wildlife justice or what other things where you're looking at stuff, is that are we really trying to fix a problem here? And, and, and even though you guys have my, my cab piece, I'd like to, to say some of the discussion he had here. One of them was, and, and this comes to Commissioner McNish, and even though he said he copied language, when you look at this language right now, it is already compromised language. And, and why do I say that? We don't longer have a lawyer on the commission. Uh, and, you know, like we've always had a lawyer on the commission. And one of the things when I read this, because of the way we define a contest, which has got ands in it, in other words, the participants register and pay a fee and get cash prizes. So if I wanna organize an event with 60 people and I wanna promote it and I wanna sponsor it and I wanna solicit participation, but I don't offer cash or prizes or charge a fee, I can do that under this law as written. So I guess what I'm looking at is, well, the only thing that this regulation does is say you can't give somebody a cash prize for hunting coyotes in a large group. And I'm asking, and I asked the question, what have we really succeeded at with this regulation if that is the fact? And I'm not a lawyer, but I had a lawyer look at it and he said that my interpretation wasn't wrong. So I, I, I'm asking you, if the goal is, are we chilly changing public perception when I can still go out and organize and have a contest, but I don't pay people? It have, what, what have we succeeded at? And I get back to Commissioner McNish. I mean, if, if we're worried about the North American, you know, wildlife model and, and doing things, is, is just paying for something 
or getting a cash prize make it valid or not valid of the North American model? So I, I don't under, I mean, we went back and forth in our cab about this. I mean, tremendously about this. And to be honest with you, I, I personally believe that if you're going to have language, this is a compromise language because it doesn't change anything. I mean, there are a lot of people that will still organize and do this stuff without cash prizes. There are people who probably won't because of cash prizes, but I would say that there's probably a larger amount to do. If you ask people who live in Arizona, and I have uh, people who used to be guides up in, uh, in the Northern Strip, as well as people who currently live in Arizona, as said here, that hasn't changed the number of people that go out and do these things. You just don't have officially have prizes anymore. And so uh, I, I, I'm not sure what we're gaining by doing this. I'm going to come back to Commissioner Cavillia's thing. We may be forced into doing something, but this language here only changes, in my viewpoint, the fact that you can't pay somebody, can't give somebody a cash prize for having the most coyotes. And that's about all it does. So thank you for the time. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Uh, Mr. Gildone. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, I guess, first of all, I appreciate uh, the commission's heartfelt expressions uh, that they are struggling with this issue. I know things can get emotional and nasty, and sometimes, unfortunately, that, that uh, results in personal attacks towards you guys. Um, you're in a tough position. So I appreciate your time that you guys spend uh, dedicated to uh, the wildlife of Nevada. Uh, when it comes to the coyote calling contest, the Humboldt cab unanimous, unanimously voted in opposition to any restrictions to coyote calling contests. Um, we feel it is a slippery slope to, and, and it's an erosion of, you know, the sportsman's culture. It's this today. What's it going to be tomorrow? We feel it's a small, loud minority of people that are driving this topic. And I guess lastly, I even heard today commissioners, admit in conversation that there's no scientific data or evidence that uh, supports any restriction on uh, the taking of coyotes. Um, I guess that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gildone. Ms. Campbell? Uh, yes, Therese Campbell for the record. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, oh, go ahead. Okay. All right, thank you. I'm on the uh, uh, Clark County cab. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was indeed, uh, as Paul said, a very lively and very interesting uh, meeting the other night and a lot of different viewpoints expressed. Um, I just wanted to say um, it, it's, of course, maybe you already saw the, the votes and everything. I was, I voted to, recommend to the NBWC that you just go ahead with what you had already had on the agenda as far as the um, the coyote or the uh, wildlife killing contest as far as just the workshop and um, talking about the language mm -hmm. and that was that was my vote um, I was of course the dissenting vote on that and um, I just I I wanted to say that, I, I think that it really um, wouldn't change a whole lot about, about um, what people are doing. No, in other words, and I think I said something like this at the meeting, nobody is trying to keep anybody from hunting. No one is trying to get, uh, to keep people from getting together with their friends and going out and, uh, and hunting or calling, even calling the wildlife in and then shooting it or whatever. No one's trying to do that. This is not what this is about. This is about when um, competition is promoted by there's a just mass amount of who can get, get the most animals at one time. It is, it really looks bad. And a lot of hunters have come out against these contests and so then you have to you have to go back to that relevance thing and i think when you when you look at that you you have to say this this is not this is 
this this is not something where it's a slippery slope. Oh, if we, if we say yes to banning the contest, then the next thing you know, they're going to try to ban hunting. I am not I am not trying to ban anybody from hunting or fishing or anything. But these uh, these contests are um, that just looks really bad and. I, I think that the NBWC would be well advised to continue, continue to study this and maybe uh, uh, revise the language, but also to consider that people are, are becoming, yes, there's a lot of people that don't know anything about wildlife management and don't care. They're, you know, they're just trying to live their lives or they're struggling with uh, their, you know, unemployment from the COVID uh pandemic or whatever, but people are starting to be more informed and being more aware and making choices for themselves about, okay, well, this part I'm okay with, but then this other part over here, that's, that's just too extreme. And so I think that the, uh, the coyote or the uh, wildlife killing contests could be said to be an extreme and I, I think that the NBWC would be well served by considering that they are going to take a kind of a moderate approach to this and a sensible approach and, um, and really look at this and, and uh, take, take, uh, take note that the uh, public's view is, is changing and it might actually help people that are hunters because it would kind of show that um, Nevada is in favor of ethical and ethical hunting and not so much in favor of just um, anything goes. Uh, the, I think those days are, are, are behind us because the demographic of Nevada is changing and uh, there, there are a lot more people that are aware of these things than used to be. And uh, thank you for letting me talk. Thank you. Do I have any other cab comment? <clears throat> We're taking cab comment right now. Mr. Gilbert. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, can you identify okay, which cab you. you're with? Um, I, I look at this in, in potentially a different way that's been put out right now. First and foremost, uh, we are uh, to manage the wildlife in the most uh, scientifically based manner possible. And we are at or nearing a uh, crisis with the mule deer population in the state of Nevada. And these coyotes as well as other predators uh, are uh, substantially responsible uh, for the taking of uh, a high number of mule deer in this state. And the, the, price, of, the price of fur trapping, uh, poisoning, and everything else, these other control measures uh, are not utilized anymore. Uh, we're essentially down to an active removal process. And like it or not, these um, contests, uh, the ability for these people that uh, share and teach and mentor uh, these uh, skills, if you will, to be able to, to perform these necessary active removals of predators, to be able to keep the science-based uh, controls in place uh, are necessary. And um, as as a sportsman and, and as a conservationist, I believe that uh, all tools need to be available uh, for what we're going through right now. And uh, I would just hope that the commission would follow the science on this thing. And, um, uh, and I believe as other cab members have spoken, uh, this has been unanimously rejected by every cab uh, in the state of Nevada. So the ability to um, uh, look at this thing from a micro perspective. I believe that the data is out there as well. And I appreciate your time. Good luck. Thank you, Mr. Gilbert. Mr. Gurr. And for the record, Mr. Gilbert is with
Clark Cab, and I believe Mr. Gurr is with Elko Cab. That's correct. Okay. <clears throat> I just I wanted to make sure that, uh, thank you, by the way, you, this is a tough subject. You've been fighting it for years, at least six or seven that I'm aware of. I don't know that there's a good solution, perceptions, reality to a lot of people. And I hate to say this, but the coyote contest people themselves shut themselves in the foot a long time ago and made this prevalent today. And we're talking maybe 10 years ago when they posted stuff online. That being what it, what it is, I, Mr. Malarkey's comments and Mr. Dixon's comments pretty much reflect the feeling of the <laughs> Elko cab. I mean, we've turned it down year after year after year after year. And when you're talking about the public, I think the public in Elko has so little confidence in the cab and no confidence in the commission to do the things that really relate to wildlife. So we get very little attendance and very little input anymore. And I think it's because of the results of what comes out, our voice goes out and it comes back. Well, we didn't even listen to you. So that's part of what's going on from up here in Elko County too. And I appreciate your time. Good luck. Thank you, Mr. Gurr. Do we have any other cab comment? Okay, I don't see any other cab comment. So we'll go now to general comment. Mr. Garnett. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Yeah, um, so I would uh, first ask the commission to open the book of the Nevada Small Game Hunting Regulation, uh, the regulation booklet. On the last page is a full page ad for the 2021 Battle Mountain Chucker Hunting Tournament. It advertises an entry fee and thousands of dollars in raffle prizes. I would hope that the commission can see the overwhelming hypocrisy that exists here with that ad in the state issued small game hunting regulation booklet. Um, as mentioned before, the cabs um, unanimously are not in support of this ban. So I ask as a uh, person of the public, what is the point of the cabs if their voices continually go unheard? The groups against the calling contests are also the same groups who are against Nevada bear hunting. Yet in that situation, despite the anti-hunting opinion, Nevada went forward and allows bear hunting based on science, not their hurt feelings of the antis. Why, is this, <clears throat> why would the same scientific approach not be used in this case? According to the predator fee report earlier today, the state spent $70,000 on coyote killing for the benefit of antelope and $109,000 on coyote killing for the benefit of mule deer. These coyotes are killed, in, <clears throat> killed by trapping in which they are caught by stepping in a leg hold, sit there until they're strangled or shot by the state paid trapper. They're also chased by a shooter in a helicopter until the uh, shooter can uh, get a successful shot. So they're chased around until they're shot. I fail to see how morally these coyote removal activities by the state are any better than a calling contest, which at least allows fair chase. It appears that <clears throat> because the killing is done by the state, a blind eye is turned and these activities are not spoken about in depth. It is said that these contests provide no beneficial uh, financial benefit for the state, yet the opportunity exists for the commission to require both resident and non-resident coyote hunters to acquire a hunting license to take coyotes just like the surrounding states do. The commission continually mentions the few states that have banned contests, yet failed to mention a state, a neighboring state, Utah, which has passed a hunting and fishing right for the, its citizens. I would like to see the commission focus on something similar to that for the residents of Nevada. Um, also, um, I just want to mention, you're going to hear a lot of antis use the word killing contest. I appreciate uh, Commissioner McNich and changing that to calling contest, not killing contest. However, I just want to. Okay. Unfortunately, your time was up, Mr. Garnett. Um, I need to remind public comment, you get three minutes. And at three minutes, um, unfortunately, you will uh, 
be muted. So keep, please keep it brief if you have more to say than, than the three minutes allows. Mr. Christian. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can, please go ahead. Great, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair East, Director Wasley, and members of the commission. My name is Logan Christian, and I'm a conservation advocate with Mountain Lion Foundation. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to speak today. First, I just want to express our appreciation for the ongoing work of Commissioner McNinch to bring the issue of wildlife contests to the table, and for the continued efforts of the commission to consider this issue despite its polarizing nature. We respect that there are many different perspectives on wildlife contests, and we hope that the commission can reach the best possible agreement. Furthermore, we do not agree with the moral attacks levied against some commissioners, and I really hope that those individuals who are taking these extreme positions recognize that such language is neither helpful for Nevada's wildlife or its people. In general, we are in support of the proposed language that has been presented today. Mountain Lion Foundation is opposed to contests that target predator and fur bearer species, including coyotes, bobcats, and foxes. These contests do not represent standards of fair chase or science-based management of our native wildlife. And research does find that the indiscriminate killing of these species can lead to unintended consequences, including disruption of family groups, increased rates of reproduction, and increased conflicts with domestic animals. However, we urge the Commission to recognize that there are already several options for agriculture producers to kill individual animals that they believe are threatening their operations, even within the guise of this proposed language. While we would prefer to see language that eliminates the killing of predator and fur bearer species, as well as more resources to help producers use non-lethal options for preventing depredations, we want to emphasize, similar to what Director Wasley mentioned earlier, that nothing about this proposed language would end things like depredation permits or predator management plans. This proposal is simply about removing an outdated form of recreation and entertainment that both the science and the majority of the public find concerning. We urge each member of the commission to weigh this proposal, proposed language against what the Nevada legislature would likely pass as an alternative. And to Commissioner Caviglia's point, we are truly not offering this as a threat, but as a legitimate and likely alternative. The commission has a unique opportunity to weigh in and provide a stance that will help improve the public's perception of wildlife management in the state. Why leave this decision to the legislature when you all have the ability to address an important issue that does improve the relevancy of sportsmen and sportswomen? For all these reasons, we strongly urge the commission to adopt this language and thank you for your continued consideration of this issue, as well as the work that you're all doing on behalf of Nevada's wildlife. Thank you, Mr. Christian. Mr. Turk. Good afternoon, uh, Tom Turk for the record. Um, thank you, Chair and members of the Commission for the opportunity this afternoon. Um, I appreciate the pains that you've all been going through with this topic the last few months. Um, I recently decided to get involved um, because of my son and actually my hunting family. I'm here as a sportsman, hunter, conservationist, a participant in ranching and farming, a past hunter ed instructor for Department of Wildlife and a past chair of the Elko chapter of the Mule Deer Foundation in Elko. Um, I would ask you all to consider please where and why is there pressure to act on this issue and where is it coming from? Um, I would also ask you why would there be veiled threats over an issue like this that uh, in the past has not been an issue. Um, the emotional part of this for me and seeing it uh, come out in the public, um, if someone hasn't seen a, a lamb or a calf, I think these issues have been brought up before from the ranching community, but if they've not witnessed um, that from a, a coyote or other predator during birth, it's a uh, uh, truly painful. Um, the losses are not compensated, um, as in other areas of wildlife management. Um, I'm troubled by the outside influences that are rearing up on this issue. And uh, again, the, the threats to the commission and I'll call them veiled threats. Um, 
I believe the science on them is difficult to pin down. The population numbers has been mentioned in the past. Um, so I, I know that, or I understand, or I think I believe truly that while the contests, the calling contests don't have a major impact on the populations of coyotes, I do believe they do in a specific geographic region during that time and or during that period or for a period and coyotes tend to be wherever there is uh, uh, species for them to prey upon and to to survive so we remember the cyclical theory that if there's lots of jackrabbits there tends to be lots of coyotes and uh, vice versa if there's a, a low number of prey species then the ten number of coyotes tend to fall off as well. I, I think that's the circle of life. I appreciate the opportunity again. Um, I don't believe that the basis for this issue to spend this much time on has been worthy of it. Um, I ask or encourage you to. Thank you, Mr. Turk. I'm just going to remind the public that you have three minutes to speak and at your three minutes, um, you will be muted so we can move along quickly. I may also ask, we have a lot of folks that want to speak today. If you just have an, a, a new message, great, but if it's a ditto, we welcome that too. So moving on, Mr. Green, you have three minutes. Good afternoon. I want to say I respect each of you. Uh, for putting your hat in the ring. Controversial matters such as this are never fun or easy. You should all be praised for your service. We should condemn anyone harassing or threatening anyone on this commission. I'd like to acknowledge Mr. Wasley's uh, comments. I truly hung on every word he said. It was interesting. Uh, as we heard, there is no science to show that these contests hurt coyote populations. How the removal of coyotes uh, from a contest area impacts mule deer or other game species is not clear. That's important to understand. The U.S. government kills 100,000 coyotes annually. We know that there has not been success in curtailing this population nationwide. I don't participate in these, in these contests. However, as Mr. Wasley said, other sportsman activities that are legal today may not be tomorrow. And that's why I'm here. The antis inundate your email. They stack these meetings with commenters. In other states, we know these antis have been successful in banning many of the activities sportsmen enjoy in Nevada today. We know the demographic in Nevada is changing. I acknowledge that. And that is why it's important that we do not cave to this movement. If this were a carp contest or a rodent contest, nobody would be caring. Heck, in California, they still allow ground squirrel contests in Cedarville. How does that fit in to the conservation framework that's been discussed extensively? For whatever reason, coyotes invoke a soft spot for people. I don't know whether it has to do with their dog-like features. However, these people have little or no understanding of how these animals have proliferated since the 1950s and how they've expanded their range by nearly 40% since then. Simply put, we all know that coyotes are well represented in Nevada and no contest or contests will change that. I understand and respect that the commission is weighing the social backlash. I want the commission to hear me. Today's coyote hunt contest ban is tomorrow's bear hunt ban and next year's dove hunt ban. Many of the people in opposition would love to see hunting altogether ban. Commissioner Caviglia summed it up well. The general public doesn't care about this issue. The people who care have spoken and they support the commission. And with respect to Commissioner McNish's comments about the needing to essentially acquiesce to these antis. I understand his point. However, these people will not stop with this. It's not gonna be the end. This will energize them and they'll be coming back for other sportsman activities we enjoy in Nevada. Again, this isn't about contests for me. I've never done one, nor would I. However, I support their choice to do it. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you, Mr. Green. Mr. Smith. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you, Chair East and members of the commission. I appreciate you taking time to consider and take comment on this really important issue. I'd also like to thank Director Wasley for his comments at the outset of this agenda item. 
My name is Chris Smith. I'm here on behalf of Wild Earth Guardians and our nearly 1,000 members and supporters across Nevada. I'm also a sportsman. I'm supposed to be an anti, I guess, but I can't remember the last year that I didn't hold a license in multiple states and I own livestock. These contests are deeply unpopular. They are not hunting and they are not wildlife management. I note that the North American model also condemns the commercialization of wildlife as one of its tenets. Wild Earth Guardian supports the regulation change as written, which is narrow and common sense and compromise. We urge the commission to move this forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. Wasden. I said that right. Will you unmute yourself, please, Mr. Wasden? As for that, I thought I would have been unmuted. Um, <laughs> yes, I'm Dr. Wasden. Um, I live in Clark County. I don't personally participate in coyote calling contests, but I do not object to them. I thank you for your role in protecting, conserving, and managing and restoring our wildlife. Uh, I hope you would not make this a political decision. Determine the need. If there is a need, then make the decision that's best. But if there's not a need, I would hope that this wouldn't become political. Um, I know that there is a Mule Deer Foundation and they do support coyote calling contests. Um, I just, you know, I, I again echo the comments that have been made. I am a sportsman. I don't participate in these, but I do support having them. Thank you. Mr. Pollock. Good afternoon, Chairman East and uh, Wildlife Commissioners. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for the incredible amount of time that you have spent regarding this matter. Um, though it is frustrating to see the amount of the commission and the department's resources gone toward a social issue, your consideration is appreciated. Um, the issues around coyote calling for me, uh, cardio competitions are a branding problem, uh, not an ethics problem. The issue with the competitions at its core stems from the lack of pushback against a false narrative from those uh, who would oppose uh, competitions and hunting in general. Uh, these competitions are not senseless or frivolous killing. Um, these competitions abide by all regulations in place to manage predators, and they have very real uh, impact on rural areas where these competitions are held. Uh, the competition in Eureka, for example, has raised funds to expand and repair several wildlife guzzlers, as well as work to remove uh, pinion juniper encroachment around springs. Uh, the competition in Ely, Nevada, is a fundraiser for the community's volunteer fire department. Uh, a statewide ban will disproportionately affect rural areas where popular opinion favors these competitions. Um, a statewide ban is not a compromise, and that is in large part why none of the county cabs have supported the language uh, put forth. Uh, one compromise would be an addendum for nonprofit groups that put monies back into the community and conservation uh, be exempt from a ban. Um, this could be achieved through a license and would allow the department to monitor the competitions to determine the number of animals harvested, uh, the real impact, if any, and make decisions on the competitions going forward based on data instead of um, politicizing the issue. Um, another compromise, for example, would require the competitions to use the animals pelt and put on workshops, uh, teaching people how to tan and how to use uh, this renewable resource. Um, this would begin to uh, address the PR and the branding issue in a very real way. A, a ban, however, makes no effort to improve the PR and branding issues around hunting. A ban is essentially a nod to anti-hunting groups, acknowledging hunting has a negative branding issue and that rights will be taken from sportsmen and from Nevadans whenever enough pressure is applied. Uh, thank you for your time and for the opportunity to speak on this issue. Thank you, Mr. Pollack. Mr. Beffert. Yes, hello. Uh, thank you very much for your time today. My name is Brian Beffert. I am the director of 
uh, the Toyabi chapter of the Sierra Club here in Nevada. And on behalf of Sierra Club's nearly 40,000 members and supporters in Nevada, I want to thank you, commissioners, for your time today and for your service to Nevada's habitat, wildlife, and citizens. <clears throat> I appreciate your consideration of this issue. I'm speaking in support of the ban on wildlife killing contests. These contests have no valid basis in science. As such, they are counterproductive to both sound wildlife management and healthy ecology in Nevada. I hear there's a debate as to whether this is true. I'd love to see the data. Uh, they are also cruel, unsporting, and violation of the public trust doctrine that holds that wildlife is a shared public asset that must be protected and maintained for present and future generations. I encourage the commission to have Nevada join Arizona, California, New Mexico, and other states in leading the way and setting an example for ethical science-based wildlife management by adopting this ban. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Stoker. Hello, this is Ron Stoker. Um, I appreciate the commission taking time to listen to me out of their day. Um, I'm the vice president of WIN down here in Southern Nevada, which is Wildlife and Habitat Improvement in Nevada. Um, it's basically my other full-time job. Uh, me and ma many members of my group get up before the sun comes up. And we go back after the sun comes down. You know, we we pull stuff through marshes. We 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 break our back. You know, building guzzlers, and, and it's all for wildlife. You know, <clears throat> and at the end of it. These coyote killing contests, you might debate the science on them, but I know if you don't have a coyote, you have a fawn, and you know, and that's what we needed here in Nevada. Mm -hmm. And and it, it's just like the the gentleman said before, they have banned in New Mexico, and the next thing they banned in New Mexico is traffic. And so if you if you look at the pattern, they they don't hide stuff. This is just the tip of the iceberg. The next thing, I don't know what their next plan is, but it, it's going to escalate. And so. Um, where it comes to that this is good and it's good for the wildlife that I love and I bust my hump for on the off season. I, I, I hope that the commissioners think long and hard about who swings the hammers and not who writes the letters. I appreciate your guys' time and I know it's a tough decision. And I hope you do the best. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Stoker. Ms. Newfer. Hi, my name is Cheyenne Newfer. I grew up in rural Northern Nevada, and I fully support the proposed language regarding the wildlife killing contest. I strongly urge the commission to make the honorable decision and help end wildlife killing contests in the state of Nevada. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Newfer. Mr. Morris. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Go ahead, please. Hey, I want to take uh, appreciate the commission. I have a unique uh, perspective for the commission. I am the only four-time world champ with my partner. We've hunted the world championship in Nevada for since 1997 when I won my first championship. I then won it in 07, 08, and in 2016, I was 50 years old and won another world championship. I cannot imagine my life. If it wasn't for the World Coyote Calling Championship, which was held in Elko, Nevada, the money, you know, $394 million to $414 million is coming into your state from sportsmen, hunters, and fishers from other parts of the country, just not Nevada. Nevada spent $749,000 on a lethal budget last year for coyotes and killed 27,124 coyotes in Nevada. Um, these contests are not the problem. It might be perception. Uh, Project Coyote, let's let's talk about the elephant in the room. Project Coyote has $24 million budget. They're spending that money. They did it in New Mexico. They did it in Arizona. Why would Nevada, why would Hughes Commission let these small, the small percentage, you talk about the small percentage of people that uh, uh, oppose this coyote calling contests. But let's talk about the positives. Uh, I put three girls through college. I've made a living hunting coyotes. It used to be a re revered traditional the history of coyote calling. And you, you quote Aldo Leopold and you talk about the wildlife model. There would not be a wildlife model if it wasn't for the uh, predators that were controlled and taken out of the system. 
you as a community mission need to, to find your way through this. And uh, to quote Aldo Leopold, the last word in ignorance is the man who says of an animal or plant, what good is it? Project Coyote is using you, the commission, and coyotes as their inroads. Next, it'll be the chucker contest. Next, it'll be the fishing. And I'm disappointed that, Tony, that uh, Commissioner Wofley would not support this. You, as a commission, need to support contests. You need to say, get ahead of it. Say, this is a good thing for Nevada. And I appreciate your time. It's a tough, it's a tough road to hoe. But as a guy who makes a living uh, hunting coyotes, um, I would like to see the commission go for more hunter rights, hunter rights bills at the state legislative level that then Project Coyote and the small minority of people cannot access or get to Nevada wildlife. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Morris. Um, next up, and I'm going to really brutalize this last name, Alanis. Yeah. Yeah. This is Diego. I uh, strongly oppose this. Uh, thank you, Mr. Morris. Thank, thank you, Cavilia. Is that it? That's it. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you for being brief. <laughs> Mr. Staley. Board, I appreciate your time. Uh, I know I'm going to get right to the point. Uh, I oppose this ban on coyote contests, just like Al Morris, Chris Garnett, and many others have stated. Um, this is just an attack on one small group. And as Chris Garnett brought up, you guys, the, de the Department of Wildlife has a chucker killing contest on the back of their small game regulations, which is kind of the hypocrisy is, is, is astounding. And the one thing I want to bring up is that was brought up by one of the cab board members. Um, all of your cab boards have told you to kill this bill, to kill this, be done with it. None of them approve of it. It's time for you guys to act and it's time to make the decision to end this. There's no point for it. Uh, Nevadans have spoken. We don't want this. This is not what we want. This is what some small group or nation, national coyote group project wants to happen. And also the one thing I wanna bring up lastly is that when this bill was brought forward, there was a thing saying that uh, small business impacts, there was no impact to small businesses by outlawing coyote calling contests. I hate to argue and I hate to disagree with that because there was no surveys actually conducted in any of those small towns, as well as Elko and any of the small little groups and in, in places that these con are conducted in Elko, in Elko, Eureka, all these other counties. And I just, I don't think that that, that was done correctly. And it's against NRS for you guys to sit there and say that there is no uh, impact on small businesses when all these businesses depend on um, predator calling contests come the winter time to get a lot of their income and revenues for hotels, gas, food, you name it, there's something there. So for you guys to sit there and rule that out, that there's no uh, business impact to any of these, these small businesses is wrong. So uh, and again, I appreciate your guys' time. It's a rough road, but it's time for you guys to act it's time for you guys to make the decision and kill this bill it's ridiculous the cab boards have spoken they've unanimously unanimously come out even elko county has said we support and we want coyote killing or coyote calling contests to happen thank you for your time board thank you mr staley just a quick reminder three minutes um and if someone's already said what you were going to say just say, please say ditto Thank you. Um, Mr. Parsons. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners. I uh, appreciate this opportunity to comment. My name is David Parsons. I'm a retired career biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and a science advisor for the nonprofit conservation organization, Project Coyote. Uh, we have a Nevada representative for Project Coyote who was unavailable to be here today. So I'm representing the views of that person. I applaud the commission for proposing a ban on contests for capturing or killing predatory or fur-bearing animals. This proposal is grounded on solid science and accepted hunting ethical practices. Such practices include paying attention to uh, public trust principles, 
as the director uh, pointed out, and I really appreciate his comment, but the practice of fair chase, uh, killing for only legitimate purposes and the prohibition of commercializing wildlife, which this contest most definitely do. These are all uh, representations of tenants of the North American model. There is no credible basis in science that contest hunts for predatory or fur-bearing animals provide any verifiable benefits for wildlife conflict management or wildlife conservation. Ample scientific evidence shows that predatory and fur-bearing animals can have important benefits on the ecosystems they occupy, resulting in greater biological diversity, disease and rodent control, improved ecological health, and the resiliency of ecosystems to environmental change. It is important to emphasize that adopting this regulation does not prohibit the hunting of any of the animals specified in it, according to current Nevada regulations, simply in the contest aspect. Eight states have already prohibited wildlife killing contests, and social science research and public opinion poll show a significant shift in public attitudes about wildlife to a more mutualistic view that wildlife, that wild animals possess intrinsic values that transcend their util utilitarian values for humans. I apologize for using these labels, but uh, that's what the social scientists do is put labels on, on beliefs. I recommend that, the, that Nevada join these eight other states to lead the way in setting an example for ethical, science-based wildlife management. Thank you for this opportunity to comment. Thank you, Mr. Parsons. Mr. Burris. Thank you, Chairman East, Director Wasley, and commissioners for allowing me to speak. I know this is a difficult time to manage. Um, let me make this clear. I've never entered one of these contests and I spend much of my time outside of my work activity, actively working on conservation of wildlife through my role as the Youth Programs Director for Wildlife Habitat Improvement of Nevada, which means many of my hours in the are in the field, actively improving the environment for our wildlife. I can, I'm also the co-host of the Battle Warren Duckers podcast that actively recruits people to help with conservation projects throughout our great state. I find it troubling that we are even considering managing wildlife on public opinion and emotion rather than science. But I will leave that argument to others. The issue I will raise pertaining to is pertaining to legality of the workshop that is proposed. Nevada Revised Statutes 233B.0608 requires due diligence to determine the impact on small businesses, which has not been done. If that had been done, the impacts noted would be noted to ranchers and farmers, as well as many other businesses that are blessed with the revenues that come from these contests coming to their communities. These mom, are mom and pop restaurants, bars, hotels, and gas stations. They all have an increase in revenue that is vital to their survival. Let us not forget the ranchers though. Belonging to a ranching family, I know the financial impact of losing a single calf to predation. So obviously there is a financial impact to these small businesses, which if given due diligence required by Nevada law would have been noted. So that being said, I believe that moving forward with this workshop would be in violation of Nevada Revised Statute 233B.0608. And this then would be, should be tabled until such time that the provisions are, have been met. You have a fiscal and statutory responsibility that require you to manage by science and follow the law while you're doing it. I would encourage you to stop the action until you meet the statutory requirements that you were installed, it, they were installed for a reason. Thank you for your time and I appreciate all the hard work you guys are doing. I know this is a contentious issue and I really do appreciate all the time you guys have put into it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burris. Mr. Donnelly. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Patrick Donnelly. I'm Nevada State Director with the Center for Biological Diversity, and I speak on behalf of our thousands of Nevada members. We're in opposition to coyote killing contests, and we support the proposed regulation. I think the question we need to ask here is, does the Board of Wildlife Commissioners represent the 2% of Nevadans who hunt? 
Or does the Wildlife Commission represent all Nevadans and our diverse and pluralistic interests in wildlife? I think we've heard, well, the opposition is the minority, and, and that just says people are really out of touch with what normal Nevadans think. Most people, when a coyote killing contest is described to them, will react with revulsion. They are counter to the common moral sensibilities which guide behavior in our society. So we can hear, well, all the cabs oppose this regulation. Well, I think that tells you a lot more about who is on the cabs than the legitimacy of that particular institution uh, than it does as a barometer for how Nevadans feel about killing contests. Seeing how many animals can be slaughtered as fast as possible to get prizes is not sporting, it's wrong. Nevadans agree, and I think the, the time is now to take action on this issue, put it to bed, and ban these contests. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Donnelly. Ms. Hoffaditz. Unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Jana Hoffaditz. I have lived near Pyramid Lake for about 30 years. I love living remote and I love being surrounded by wildlife. Today, we hear from two different sides. Please choose to vote for neither one side or the other, but instead for nature, for wildlife. Let's give them a voice, those who can't speak here today. I believe you all being wildlife commissioners have this most respected responsibility. If we cannot coexist with a respectful behavior to nature, we are doomed. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hoffaditz. Ms. Boger. Whoops, sorry, Tiffany. <laughs> we can hear you. Oh, you can hear me. Okay. We can. Great, sorry. Thanks for this opportunity and for the tough work that you do. Oh my gosh, I've been feeling so empathetic. Um, because I've gone through just a, a very emotional process myself, figuring out how I feel about this. And I come back to my fifth grade teaching years. I taught a lot of grades, but fifth grade is the one where you really can get kids up there talking about issues from the heart, listening to each other, and then thinking, does that change their feeling one way or the other? Maybe a little bit, maybe it doesn't. They go to lunch together, they play together. And I just think this is a real missed opportunity on both sides for real education. And I, I feel like it's not the place or the time to, to put any ban or constriction on these contests until we all learn more about each other. And we tend to learn now on social media where things are described to us by people who've never participated or there's an image out there that really is repulsive and we know that yes those are real does that tell the whole picture um so i, I just think that most of the people who are speaking uh to ban the calling contests i would guess that hardly any of them have really been out there to see it, to talk to the people in the community. What does it mean to them? I just see this as an a, opportunity for education. And we sportsmen and women have a big responsibility to step up and try and get the stories out there, the real people who participate and why, and what are the benefits that accrue to that from the communities, and I'd like to see all the speak people speaking against to go out there. Uh, they, they don't have to watch the event itself, but talk to the people involved. Go to the bar afterward, have a drink together, and, and maybe you'll at least humanize each other a little bit. That's what we used to do when we were duking it out over wilderness, remember? <laughs> so, well, we still do that some, but anyway, that's what we my point, let's get a little more, humanize each other, both sides. Let's, uh, let's, let's go, it's beer 30 right now. Let's do it. Thank you, Karen. Mr. Dixon. Uh, 
Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Hi, Madam Chair, members of the commission. Uh, this is Jeff Dixon. I'm the Nevada State Director for the Humane Society of the United States. I, uh, Although I represent a national organization, I very much identify as a Nevadan. I own a home here. I recreate here. I enjoy the wildlife here. I bird watch here. So I don't, um, I don't appreciate the attempts to diminish uh, the standing on this issue uh, based on you know who employs who and so forth. I know that if there is a uh, organization in support of these contests or anything else, uh, they would not get the same uh, treatment. And I know that you know there's there's a lot of talk on both sides to try to diminish each other's standing. But I think what the difference here is that you know our side, the mutualists, the advocates, the um, we don't feel well represented um, here, and we're trying to uh, get some more representation. And so. Um, I'll, after that, I'll just say that, you know, I don't think that I could say anything um, to be as persuasive to this board as the uh, department director uh, said, uh, speaking as a sportsman himself. So um, I would urge you just to rewatch that. I think everything he said was was valid. And it's just, uh, and it's a very common sense um, and measured uh, way to look at this, obviously coming from my side. And uh, I would urge you to pass this rule as written. Um, Arizona's commission did it, as you know. Um, and I don't think there's anything more uh, on that. I just hope we can move forward and you can find a way to support the policy. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Mr. Reese. Good afternoon, Mike Reese. A um, couple of points here. I, I heard early on Dag Burdett referred to this as a petition. It is not a petition. It is it a resolution from Clark County is what started this and agendized that. Uh, didn't have to be accepted. You chose to accept it. Uh, I don't care either way. I just want the general public and everybody else out there to know this is not a petition. Um, point number two, Elko County on Wednesday had an agenda item to put bounties on coyotes in their county. They're looking at that as another form of control. Bounty might only be one month out of the year, might be four, doesn't matter. It's a tool, it's much like a coyote contest. We can all argue the effectiveness or ineffectiveness of a coyote competition. Again, it is a tool. What this is leading to is a control of us socially because you've said on here that we're not trying to stop you guys from going coyote hunting. We're not trying to stop this and that. What you're really trying to do is stop our right to assemble and control us socially. We've seen the red wave starting to come across the country because of statements and stuff such as this. <clears throat> we look at the group that looks out for us the best as Congressional Sportsman's Foundation has put, uh, they lobby Washington DC, state level. They have sent a letter in to all of you guys on the cab letters and they are and for this. They will lobby for this. There is no reason why this cannot continue to go forward the way it is, especially when you've had all the NGOs and the cabs vote on this. <clears throat> They've said no. Let me change positions here. If I was a lobbyist and I was going to go to introduce a bill to the legislature, I'd have to tap on somebody's shoulder, Mr. or Mrs. Senator or assembly person. Uh, I'd like you to introduce this bill on our half, but let me give you the backup. We've had every NGO in the state, we've ever had every cab say, no, they don't want to do this, but would you jeopardize your political career and please present this on our behalf? That's a hard one to sell. I would urge you guys to make a motion at the end of the public comment, make the motion to end this debate right now. Let's start concentrating on sensitive species and get back to management of biological, not sociological. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reese. Ms. Matheson? Are we going to hear from Ms. Matheson?
Can you please unmute yourself and get started? There's got lots of public comment to get through. Yeah. All right. So I just wanted to come and talk about, so me and my friend, we run stuff in the outdoors. We have a YouTube channel. We do a ton of stuff. I just kind of grown out and that growing up in the outdoors. In the last couple of years, I've started to realize like a huge uh, decrease in the deer population, or at least from what me and my friends are around me down towards southern Nevada. And I think a huge part of it is the uh, predation and these animals giving the deer and other species of these. And I think just getting rid of these coyote calling contests, less coyotes are obviously going to be killed. Not many people will be motivated to get out or spend the money on calls and get rid of this contest will basically ruin anything we've set up for to help bring deer population back and getting rid of these contests will bring back more disease and have higher population it'll destroy anything that we have. Okay, we're gonna, if Mr. Matheson could rejoin us on the phone, that would be fine, but we're gonna move on because that was, we couldn't hardly hear him. Um, so we're gonna move on to Mr. Ricker. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, hi, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman East and members of the commission. Uh, my name is David Ricker. I'm speaking as an individual. Uh, I would simply like to ditto uh, Mr. Bryce Pollock's eloquent comments in opposition to this proposed regulation and also uh, Mr. Reese's sentiment concerning the infringement on the right to peacefully assemble and freely associate. Uh, and you know, I would urge you to, to not enact this proposed regulation. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you, Mr. Ricker. So I have Mr. McGar and then Ms. Dean, um, and I believe that will end our public comment. And I intend to take a break after that. Um, so uh, we'll start with Mr. McGar. Please go ahead, Mr. McGar. Can you unmute yourself, please? Mr. McGar, please unmute yourself. There you go. Can you speak to us? We can't hear you. Okay, we're gonna move on from Mr. McGar to Ms. Dean. And I'm going to ask at the moment, it's 340, if you intend to if you intend to offer public comment, please raise your hand and keep it raised so that I know how many people we have left to hear. We've been doing this for a long time. You get three minutes. I'm, I intend to hear everyone, but we need to take a break as well. So please raise your hand and keep it raised if you intend to speak. Ms. Dean. All right, thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. I am Jeanette Dean, an alumna of the University of Nevada, Reno, where I studied political science and sociology. I currently live and work in Minnesota, where I work as a national environmental advocate to help protect the natural environment and wildlife using modern science, traditional ecological knowledge, and respect for other beings and human ethics. I first testified against wildlife killing contests in Nevada 
in March 2015. And I am very relieved that a regulation is finally ready for adoption by a majority of you wildlife commissioners on the Nevada board. I am therefore happy Shall I continue? Shall I continue? Yes, please continue, Ms. Dean. Okay. I am therefore happy to again join those today asking for I am therefore happy to again join those today asking for passage of the long-awaited regulation by the Nevada Board of Wildlife Commissioners to ethically stop wildlife killing contest in Nevada to protect predatory animals and fur bearing animals, which will show more respect for wildlife species and for individual animals. I believe that Nevada revised statute 501.100, which is the legislative declaration regarding wildlife reveals the fairness of the proposed regulation as well, with its strong statement that, one, wildlife in the state not domesticated and in its natural habitat is part of the natural resources belonging to the people of the state of Nevada. I wish to emphasize that nowhere does it mention hunters only, including those who participate, in wildlife contest as the main group of people it should apply to. Such contests that cause as many deaths of animals as possible to win prizes and cash are very dishonorable to many people in Nevada and people like me who studied ethical political policy in Nevada and the dangers of regulatory capture by small groups and special interests. Instead, Nevada's natural resources are meant to belong to all pe people of Nevada as fairly as possible. And I know many. Okay, thank you, Ms. Dean. We're going to take a break. We're having some network issues here at the office. So we're going to take a 10 minute break. We'll come back at three, we'll come back at 355 and we will finish up with the following public comment. Mr. Volz, Mr. Blakesley, Mr. Flowers, Mr. Mr. Kilborn, and Mr. McGar. So I'll see you back here at 355. Thank you.
If I can have everyone come back, we still have a little bit of public comment to hear. Okay, so my apologies, we had some network issues. In addition, I have several members of the public who continue to raise their hand and then drop them. And it throws me off because I know we need to take a break and we did, but I really need you to keep your hand raised if you intend to speak. We wanna hear everybody, but I can't keep watching hands go up and down. So um, I'm gonna call on Mr. Volz. Are you able to hear me, Chairwoman? Yes, yes we Thank can. You. Thank you. Thank you. For the record, Fred Volz. Many comments were offered at this week's Clark Cab meeting attempting to support wildlife killing contests by people fearful of change or who are not interested in truly protecting wildlife, only increasing wildlife killing opportunities. They make such a pitch regardless of the negative consequences and black mark such contests give to this commission and endow. Of course, cabs, when they meet, are dominated by hunting enthusiasts. We have to remember that wildlife is not a plaything for people to do with as they choose. The already implemented regulation in neighboring Arizona, a model for the Nevada proposal, has not threatened mom, apple pie, and the American way of life, despite dire predictions that Armageddon, should this commission choose to do something favorable for wildlife that avoids want and waste. Perhaps the most outlandish claim is that the people you are to represent, that would be all Nevadans, regardless of the slot you fill on the commission, don't favor the abolition of wildlife killing contests. A broad coalition of informed and engaged advocacy groups sent this commission their position paper to you yesterday. In that paper, a Nevada specific statistically vetted poll demonstrated widespread opposition to wildlife killing contests. The results are no different than in other states. For example, similar 2019 polls of both Oregon and Kansas residents using sound polling practices found that over 60% were opposed to pointless and destructive wildlife killing contests. The compelling arguments against these wasteful and dangerous to public safety contests have already been made multiple times. One or two days a year of killing contest participants in a given rural town will not make a material difference between a business's or community's economic survival or failure. Finally, if the commission chooses not to take further action on a wildlife killing contest ban, this issue will not suddenly evaporate, but take a materially different tack. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Foltz. Mr. Blakesley. Mr. Blakesley, we can't hear you. Can you speak up? I can barely hear you. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'll try and holler. Um, okay, I just wanted to respond to a few things that have been said here. Um, the anti-hunters don't get to blame the general public. There's no way that the general public gets to be claimed by them. I want, I want to say that uh, there's two sportsmen's coalitions in this state that are very strong politically and they represent tens if not hundreds of thousands of sportsmen. So I think that needs to be recognized. As far as singling out um, the coyote hunters, I've, I've faced this my entire life as a trapper. To try and single out the, who they consider the low hanging fruit and eradicate them. Well, that's been called hypocrisy tonight, and I'm not gonna say it's a different word. I'm gonna say it's cultural bigotry. And that's an ugly word, damn ugly word, but look it up. That's exactly what this is. If it's okay to do it for chuckers and fish, but not coyotes, how's that any different than you know, racial or re religious bigotry? But anyway, I, I'll go back to my speech now. As far as the legislature goes, I think there's been a gross overreaction to these threats of 
legislature. I've been a professional lobbyist, um, one uh, level or another for over 40 years in Carson City. I've heard this same argument time after time after time for 40 years, threatening the commission. Every time a new bunch comes on, the same thing gets tried. Well, um, I'll tell you why you, you don't need to worry that much about the legislature. They have a completely different motivation than you do. Most people are trying to survive. There's another election before the next legislature, but over 80% of those guys have to, to uh, get elected. Controversial issues hardly ever, hardly ever get passed in the legislature. They get a hearing so that, so that a senator or an assemblyman can say that they put it up there, but then the, they always go away. Most people don't want to irritate a large voting block, and we are a large voting block. There are hundreds of thousands of sportsmen, and they realize that. We've got two strong coalitions that have had excellent success in the legislature. I, I wouldn't worry about it. Kill this thing now. We'll take it from there if it ever goes to Carson City, and I'm not sure it will. I know the players that you're talking about that have brought this up. I know where this thing originated. One of them lost his seat because of a controversial bill. So... Thank you, Mr. Blakesley. Mr. Flowers. Yes, Rex Flowers speaking on behalf of myself. Um, I am a member of the public. I'm also a hunter. I am neither irrelevant nor am I not a normal Nevadan. And I take offense to those who have a different view to me to, to make those comments. Uh, I am not in favor of this regulation. I would hope you will kill it today and move on. Um, I've, I've publicly said that a number of times. Um, and I wanna bring up the fact that we talk about the irrelevancy of um, hunters because they're only 2% of the population. As I go to these commission meetings, and you, and I'm sure most of you are aware, I've gone to them forever, it seems like. I go to as many as I can. I attend subcommittee meetings, or uh, com commission committee meetings, and cab meetings. And I see the same people at all those meetings. It's a, it's a very small group of people, whether they are against the bear hunt that's on the agenda or the coyote hunt, or in favors of something else. Um, you know, it, it, they speak as they are representing the general public and they're only representing their own personal views. So uh, these people are gonna be at the legislature. I've been there, they're always there. Uh, the only difference is if you pass this regulation or if you accept and go forward with the regulation, it gives them one less thing on their plate when they get to the legislature. It does not mean they won't be there. So um, I ask you not to pass the regulation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Flowers. Mr. Mr. Kilborn. I gotta go grind this. Please unmute yourself, Mr. Kilborn. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. thank you. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, my name is Gary Kilborn, and uh, a Northern Nevada resident for over three decades. I was brought up in a very rural cattle ranch and come from a hunting family. Had many friends, well-known Nevada citizens and avid hunters, both in Nevada and around the world. With 
each of which I've discussed these contests, all are appalled by the contests, ironically. As the commission's noted, this sport is not about ethical hunting specifically, but it does bestow on the state of Nevada and all of our sportsmen a bad reputation. And this potentially damages the respectability of the state and its heritage. I wanna truly thank each of you for all of your astute analysis and critical thinking that you've put into this issue. The science though is undeniable and the public polls are undeniable regardless of comments made here on the issue. The contests do nothing but harm uh, from multiple perspectives and help nothing. With that as a backdrop, I approve the proposed language. Thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you, Mr. Kilborn. Mr. McGar, we'll try this again with Mr. McGar. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Sorry about earlier, I was having problems. No worries, we were too. Go ahead. So I'm just asking you guys to vote against this. Um, everybody's talking about science. I think we should table this for a while or drop it and do a study. Use some of our predator fees that us as outdoorsmen um, pay every year. Do a five-year, 10-year study and find out, figure out the number of tournaments that are put on, the number of coyotes that are taken, and then go to the places that are putting them on and find out what kind of income would be lost if you ban them. I would myself put out there that any of the people that want to go against or that want these bans, why don't you try going out calling and seeing what it is? Keep saying unethical, yada, yada, yada. Go out with somebody. Learn what it takes to call in a coyote. It's not, we don't just go out there and slaughter them by the thousands like everybody perceives. So I would just suggest people to try something new. Sit down and talk. One person earlier, go out and have a beer and discuss it. And then go out and learn something about it. But we also need to know the financial impact from the communities and like the nonprofits that do use these tournaments to um, raise money for their clubs, organizations, and so on. So again, I just ask you to vote against this and thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Tomlinson? Ms. Tomlinson, um, someone spoke from Project Coyote. Are you are you speaking on behalf of Project Coyote or are you speaking on behalf of yourself? I'm speaking on behalf of myself. Okay, thank you, go ahead. You're welcome. Thank you, commissioners. Appreciate all the time you've taken on this issue. I'm Fauna Tomlinson, a Reno resident. I hold a Nevada hunting and fishing license. I volunteer for many other conservation or orgs. I urge you to adopt the language to end wildlife killing contest. There's a lot at stake for sportsmen. Tony said it so eloquently, and I agree. Irrelevancy can erode privileges. Thanks for your careful consideration. Thank you, Ms. Tomlinson. Mr. Gonzalez. Good afternoon. Sorry, uh, I've been listening all day and uh... Appreciate everybody's time involved in this. It's, it's definitely emotional for both sides. I call in uh, in support of. I don't agree with the ban. Um, I'm a contestant in participate in contests, and I want to say that it's not a killing contest. We are calling coyotes. It's a calling contest. Who can call the most in? If we're not organized. Um, out there as a group planning a dinner after our, our hunt, we're still going to go out and, and do that. As you guys say that the, the verbiage won't affect that. Um, but it's definitely an attack on a good group of folks. Yeah, we're the 3% or 2%. Um, but we, we are the true conservationists. The people that are funding Project Coyote and all this, they don't do anything for sportsmen. They don't do anything for wildlife. It's another notch on their belt um, and it's not gonna end there. I've heard today uh, the commission talk about the black kangaroo rat. Um, I've heard them talk about the sage grouse, the chuckers and how much um, money's been spent against, you know, mule deer and, and help in that situation. We are providing a service for free um, that, that you guys do on your own already with a helicopter and 
you know, we just want to be left alone. I hope you guys drop this. I know the verbiage is out there and it's proposed, but it, I mean, it's just the hypocrisy, as Mr. Garnett mentioned, is just ridiculous. Tomorrow, there's going to be a contest with Chuckers that is sponsored by Endow. And what is the difference? Why are we any different than you guys? You know, all hunters should band together against this this opposition and uh i hope you guys reconsider your thoughts um with the verbiage and i appreciate everyone's time thank you guys and have a good evening thank you mr gonzalez we have anyone else wishing to speak in public comment that hasn't spoken yet okay seeing none I'm going to bring it back to the commission. Um, and I wanna say a few things now um, before we get uh, into our dialogue and our deliberation. Um, I want to thank each of you for being patient through this process. I know it's not been easy. It's been very, very difficult for many of us. Um, some of the vitriol that we've experienced has been really tough. Um, but I wanna also tell you that I respect your positions and I appreciate you immensely. Um, every single one of you, you've laid your cards out on the table and I appreciate that uh, more, than you, more than you can know where I can even express. We have to make tough decisions on this commission. Um, that's why we're here. We have to make these tough decisions and sometimes they're not popular. Sometimes they go against what we believe, but as um, Commissioner Olmberg said, you know, <laughs> He might be tarred and feathered, but he's gonna speak his mind. Um, I feel the same way. So I, I'm with you there. Um, I've had some sportsmen not very happy with me. Um, this is probably one of the hardest decisions we've had to make. And um, I think they, there are, there's a lot of passion on both sides. I've talked to a lot of people. I've talked to contestants I've, and participants. I've talked to people fully against this. Um, it's not my thing, but I've listened. And um, there's a lot of things that aren't my thing, but I've listened and I've been open-minded about this, but I've also made a promise to see this through. And that's why we're here today. And again, I appreciate you all. Um, I am concerned about the future. I'm, I'm concerned, about, concerned about our relevancy as well as the relevancy of the wildlife department and our culture. Um, and that's why I made the promise to see this through. You all are gonna vote the way you vote. And I appreciate that again. And I respect you for that, for that vote. We have three options before us. And I just wanna lay those out really quickly before we start our deliberation. We can approve this and move forward as it is. We can add revisions or edits to it and bring it back, or we can deny it. That's all up to you. I have made no promises to anyone. I have been asked how the commission's going to vote. I don't know because I don't know what the deliberate, where the deliberation is going to take us after hearing all the public comment and all of, all of your uh, testimony today. So with that, I'll open it up to deliberation and uh, we'll see where things go. Does anyone wish to speak? Commissioner McNinch. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just would like to make a couple of quick clarifications. Uh, uh, there were there were comments made, um, kind of maybe more in the form of a question. So I wanted to address those. Uh, one in particular, and it came from the Clark Cab. Um, you know, basically, how is this uh, the way that it's written? Um, how, what, how does it preclude uh, people getting together and going out and removing coyotes? Um, you know. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't. And the one, um, it's the it's the prizes, the incentives, the uh, it, it's the um, enumerated take. It, it, the, those are the things that are offensive about them. And it's it's a celebration of the of the wildlife. And here's probably the big thing. Um, it really outlines this, uh, and it and it has to do well, well comparing it to the other contests. How are they different? Um, well. Uh, for me, the, the Wildlife Society laid it out best, and it basically is that some of these other contests, uh, we're talking about um, big buck contests, trucker contests, fishing derbies, 
um, they're they're operating within a realm uh, a system that's recognized uh, for those competitions. Um, they're harvested consistent with ordinary and generally accepted hunting practices. That's the difference. The the, the calling contests are not, and and that's that's really why the issue with the contest. It's not the take of the animals. Um, this is not a biological issue in my, my mind. It might be in some others, but, but it, this, this doesn't have anything to do with the biological aspect. Um, uh, so I wanted to make that clarification. I thought there was one more, but um, I, I'll save my comments. I just wanted to make that, um, make that clarification. Uh, I, guess, I guess there was one other one. Uh, having to do with with the fact well it's not biological so we should be able to continue to do it um the way that the north american model of wildlife conservation was developed um and this was a vision from aldo leopold his vision was is that you had wildlife professionals that established um the need for certain management practices so i see a big difference between doing something that doesn't have a biological impact and a wildlife agency saying that we should do something because we need a wildlife impact. There's a big difference there. So I'll, I'll concede that, that there's no biological impact, but from a North American wildlife, um, North American model of wildlife conservation standpoint, it's not based on something that's coming from wildlife professionals that's saying this is something that we need to incorporate into our wildlife management scheme. That's the difference. And Tony, I don't know, maybe. I misread that from the uh, from the North American model. If you if if there's a if I've misinterpreted or misstated, uh, I'd appreciate clarification. So, I'll. Thank you. Okay, Vice Chair Cavilia, you had your hand up. Yeah, and I I, I kind of touching on the same thing Dave talked about. You know, in the, in, you bring you bring up the chucker contest or the fishing contest. And I guess I have to respectfully disagree with Dave's logic, you know, their logic that that's okay because it's within a, a designated season and that, but Kyle hunting's legal, right? It's wide. It's, it is, it's wide open in Nevada. So they're hunting it within the, the limits of Nevada. Um, and I, I don't get the logic. We can go out and kill. Everybody can go kill a limited chucker. Uh, we can't kill a coyote. You know, I, 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 for me, there's a little hypocrisy there. Uh, the other, one other thing I want to bring up is, Earlier, we talked about, you know, the trail camera regulations and the thermal regulations and the drone regulations and that. For me, again, personally, this is a different animal. Um, that gets into the fair chase into the world. And, uh, you know, th this is not this is a social issue. This is not a fair chase issue. Uh, I just I just wanted to, to bring those two items up. OK, thank you. Mr. McNinch. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, Commissioner Cavilli, I don't. I, it's not my intent to be argumentative and point counterpoint, but I guess that's really where we're at on this whole thing. Um, from from my standpoint, the the relevance, um, the, the aspect with the uh, the contests, um, the, the point isn't the take of the com the coyotes. I'm not debating that that's that that's a problem. Um, what I'm saying is is that the harvest, the methods of harvest, aren't aren't consistent with the ordinary and generally accepted hunting practices that the, that the public views as uh, that they that they review as as normal and and accepted that's kind of my point is that it's not the it's not the removal of the animals that's the issue it's how it's being done and that that's uh, in the confines from what when they're being how it's being conducted that that's kind of my point um, and on the with respect to the other um, the other fair chase aspects um, I'm not challenging people's uh, morality here or uh, trying to label them as doing something wrong here. Um, I acknowledge that there's nothing illegal about it. Um, what I'm saying is, is that, um, that there are other ways to manage them that are more acceptable and more, um, more consistent with social norms, the, the, the norms that, that are gonna be acceptable um, in, in society. And, that has to play in. Um, it's a really important component. So uh, I'm struggling with the, um, I, I don't want it to become a, a, a biological conversation. Um, I'll, I'll be the first to concede it's not. 
that in my mind, it's how it's being done is the issue and, and the potential ramifications. So when we're talking about the, uh, uh, the trail cams and had we not done anything with those, how would that have impacted our relevancy? So they might be um, not quite as controversial and maybe not as many people have formed opinions about them, but over time, those will eventually erode relevancy. So they're all tied into that relevancy concept. And that's, that's, that's why they're, they're similar. I, I understand what you're saying, but that's how I tie them in is that it's still a function of relevancy. If we don't deal with those things, um, eventually that relevancy will be challenged. Okay, other comments? Commissioner Allberg, then Commissioner Keel. Yes, uh, I mean, I guess um, just addressing some of the, the, the comments and the difficulty in, in, uh, in educating, and, and then we're still talking about the slippery slope. That's not in the language. Uh, we've gone through that slippery slope. Um, we've, we've discussed all those. Uh, so we need to, you know, I, the way I look at it is I, I have to look at this language as face value, word for word. I mean, as, as Mr. Dixon pointed out, um every word you know we've gone through this with the shall you know what does shall mean and what is may mean they're, they're two different things and so um it is it is compromising language um uh, another you know we, we doing this for conservation purposes i mean it's important for for um for me that uh you know when we talk about these groups uh wanting to, to, to get together it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't uh absolutely affect anything with the right to assembly um, or, or actually go through there and do predator control where, where, uh, where, where you know, it's still debatable whether you, you can effectively do it, uh, you know, that are, have a effective uh, benefit to it. And, uh, you know, there's clearly cases that that can happen um, when we, where we are in an area that we are doing a, a uh, a, a, a removal project and that it's, it could be supplemental to it. Um, but it, it, it doesn't stop that from potentially being beneficial. But it does, um, uh, looking at, at the potential for erosion, I'll share, uh, I guess, an analogy that I've shared with a lot of the people that I've discussed it about. I, I come from a background uh, of also with, um, racing. Uh, a lot of the racing organizations were very much similar to how the, the genesis of the Kyle Common test. I mean, they were small groups, all, all meant for good purposes. And at the time, it, you know, when they started, it was for a trophy. Uh, but we all look at NASCAR and, and the, the potential that it has, you know, it, it's huge for a business perspective. Um, it's no longer just the local clubs putting on races, it's a huge business. And uh, as has been acknowledged and recognized in other converse, uh, conversations, that is wide open. We have enormous amount of public lands, and uh, that'll that'll constantly. Uh, and, and we're dealing with the, our open land, you know, in, in other issues. Is is how many how it is impacted us with with people uh, coming into. Our state uh, in, with the sheds. I mean, we, we fight it nonstop with our, our neighboring states, uh, you know, impacting us. And by it's, this is going everywhere else, just, you know, I guess my mind looks down the road a ways is, uh, you know, as, as uh, people, I mean, there's no doubt that there's going to be some states that don't. And they, you know, they may have. Uh, more of an impact for, for people moving in to, 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 to conduct them. But uh, at the, all the others that do, or, or that will, you know, uh, you know, just look down the road, there's the potential for other states to, to, uh, to adopt some regulation. And, you know, I, I think that we could be, and, and I've already been told, you know, or, or I guess suggested that that people their reaction to this will they'll double down they'll do more of them and uh, that that worries me and it worries me with us being open as as it is 
So just, again, my thoughts, as if we all have our own thoughts, this is a super tough one. Um, but uh, I, I, I worry about the erosion immensely. It, it, it really, uh, the potential is there. Thank you, Commissioner Allenberg. Commissioner Keel. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess I still struggle with singling one group out when the act in and of itself has no biological consequence. Um, and I think that's been well recognized. Um, but I do worry about the relevancy of this body and the cab and the entire process if we don't listen to cab members along with you know the uh, mass of general public that we're here today. But I think what what worries me the most is if we assume that the methods used in these calling contests aren't accepted methods. I mean, they're using mouth calls, hand calls, electronic calls that are used by any individual um, not participating in a content contest, then that is the definition of the slippery slope. And, and where do we go next? But I don't know of another method, or maybe I'm not following exactly where Commissioner McNinch is going with these contests and the method not being generally accepted when they are in non-contest um, events. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other comment? Commissioner McNitch? Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, uh, Casey, I, I was I wasn't being specific to the uh, to the act of calling the coyotes because there there's nothing that speaks to that. If people want to call uh, coyotes in and shoot them, I mean it's um, you know it's not precluded, it's not prohibited in the regulation proposal. So um, it wasn't my intent to get into that uh, specifically. This is really focusing on the contest itself, and it, and it just goes back to what. Um, the perceptions and, and the, the acceptability in society. I don't know how else to put it. It's, um, uh, I'm going to, if I could, I'll, I'll read I, like a, I had a little thing here I wanted to read real quick. And um, I keep going back to this document because it really resonated with me. It, it kind of put things in focus. There's a lot to it. I'm not representing the whole document. So um, I don't want people to think that I'm uh, cutting pieces out or, or whatever. I mean, it's available for people to look at and review. I just can't, you just, you just can't read the whole thing to everybody. That's all. So I'm going to read this other portion. And again, this is from the uh, North American Model of Wildlife Conservation Technical Review conducted by the Wildlife Society and the Boone and Crockett Club. And it says, the development of human dimensions of wildlife as a discipline has moved us closer to realizing Le Leopold's um, ideal, which is uh, this idea of incorporating social and biological sciences in order to, and it says the integration of biological and social sciences is necessary to meet the conservation challenges of the 21st century. This is coming from somebody that lived in the early 1900s. Um, it's the foresight that, um, hey, if we don't adapt to the to the changes in, uh, that's what started the, the model in the first place. Um, there was widespread hunting, um, and again, not a, not a um, statement on morality or hunting ethics, it's just the way it was. Um, there was widespread hunting and it was reducing and resulting in a reduction in wildlife um, that people enjoyed uh, <coughs> recreationally, whether that be through hunting or, or looking. So, so they started this model that said, hey, we need to temper how we do our things because otherwise, number one, we're not gonna have any wildlife. And when we don't have wildlife, two things will happen. The public's not going to appreciate us for getting rid of all the wildlife, and we won't have anything to enjoy moving forward. And so that's what that's what those uh, that's the premise of those all those uh, those suggestions and the and the ideas behind incorporating that social and biological those those aspects is to to blend those together so that we have a public that's accepting of of way things that are done. Um, we're not talking about antis versus <laughs> sportsmen here. This is the general public. Um, I don't know what percentage of the population are anti-hunting, but I suspect that it's it's slow. <laughs> you know, I think that the public, um, kind of to, to Joel's comments, um, the public's very dynamic, very diverse, uh, very diverse opinions, and um, it would be difficult for anybody to claim 
that the public is behind them. But the bottom line is, is that they do have opinions. Um, they form opinions based on things that are done. And that's going to determine uh, relevancy. And in my mind, like I said earlier, that's going to dictate um, conservation, uh, the level of conservation that we see. So that's where I'm pushing from. That's where I'm coming from is my concern that that's going to erode. Uh, again, um, not questioning uh, people going out and calling. It's just the function that there are certain aspects of hunting um, and even some of these other contests that the public finds easier to swallow than they do the format and the foundation and the premise behind the calling contest. That's just, I don't know if I can explain it. it it's just how people think. Okay. Anyone else have Mr. Barnes? Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> yeah, it just seems like we've, uh, we've, pretty much discuss this about as much as as we can i mean we're we're getting close i think um I, and i want to let commissioner mcnish know that that i hear where he's coming from um i understand um what he's saying i just don't uh this time i just don't think i uh i agree with the, with the same thing he's saying um I have a tremendous amount of respect for him and, uh, and where he's coming from it just is one of those things right now that uh that I don't, I don't uh, necessarily agree with, um, and that happens. I believe in the, uh, I believe in this process. I came, I came from the, from the cab. I was a cab chairman. Um, I know we're always accused of, uh, we don't listen to the cabs. Um, I disagree with that because I think we do when you're on this level, a lot of times you're, you know, you're exposed to different things that maybe the cabs don't always see, but, um, but but I'm here. I'm hearing what they're saying. I'm hearing what sportsmen are saying, and um, and and I think that's that that's where I am with them right now, um, for for a lot of reasons um, that we've heard. It's just this is a polarizing issue, and um, for me, it's just it's just kind of where where I align um, the most with um, right now, and uh, I don't want to cut anybody off with any any discussion. But um, I'm, I'm ready to make a motion. If we need to make a motion, um, if, if Dave wants to go ahead and make his motion, I'm fine with that too. But um, like I said, I think I'm, I'm about ready to, uh, to wrap, wrap this up. So if uh, I'd be willing to make a motion, um, like I say, if, if Dave doesn't want to or if the chairman's ready for one. Commissioner McNitch, what is your pleasure? Well, I appreciate you uh, providing me that opportunity, uh, Tom. And uh, again, you know, I, I respect you guys immensely. Um, I do feel very strongly about this. I mean, I've, um, you know, I've, I've come out on a number of issues, and this is this is the one that's that's uh, hit me the the hardest overall. Um, that's why I, I'm at where I'm at. Um, but I do appreciate you uh, providing the opportunity, and and. Um, uh, I think that I will take advantage of that, uh, and I appreciate you allowing that opportunity. And um, you know, um, so if con conversation is completed, I'll make a motion that we uh, progress the new section in NAC 502 having to do with uh, uh, the prohibition of wildlife contests um, to um, move it forward with uh, adding language uh, for enforcement, um, uh, outlining enforcement of the, of the leg, uh, violation citations, um, as we kind of talked about. I'm sorry, I wasn't quite prepared, Tom, to, to get into it. I don't want to miss my opportunity that you, that you provided. Um, so let me see here. I've got to get my stuff together here. Uh, so, Madam Chair, I guess uh, let me start over. I would like to make a motion that we forward the uh, the proposed language uh, prohibiting wildlife calling contests, um, along with an enforcement provision similar to the one that's outlined in the Vermont regulation having to do with uh, uh, citations for violations uh, to um, to a future meeting for consideration. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? I have a second from Commissioner Weiss. We have a motion by 
Commissioner McNinch and a second by Commissioner Weiss to move regulation uh, 503 with regard to the wildlife uh, fur bearing contests forward. All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed? Okay, motion denied. Uh, four to five with commissioners Barnes, Perini, Cavilia, Keel, and Rogers in opposition. So I guess we're I guess we're done. Thanks to everyone for your um, commitment to seeing this through to this point. Uh, moving on to agenda item number 13, future commission meetings and commission committee assignments, Secretary Wosley and Chairwoman East for possible action. The next commission meeting is scheduled for January 28 and 29, 2022. The commission will review and discuss potential agenda items for that meeting. The commission may change commission meeting dates, times and locations. At this time, the chairman may designate and adjust committee assignments and or dissolve committees as necessary. Any anticipated committee meetings that may occur prior to the next commission meeting may be discussed. Um, so in front of us, we have a revised um, meeting schedule. Um, it was brought to my attention that um, Secretary Wosley cannot attend our March 1819 meeting. And so, um, we're proposing to move it to the 25th and 26th. Does anyone have any comments, concerns about that meeting? Okay, seeing none. Um, do we need to do the whole agenda item or do we need to do piece by piece? I guess we just, just do piece by piece because this is I think the only piece that will go out for public comment. So seeing no comment, um, do we have any public comment on moving our March meeting to the 25th and 26th? And I believe that meeting will be in Las Vegas. Okay. All right, I don't see any public comment, so I'll bring it back for a vote. Uh, do I have a motion to move the March meeting to the 25th and 26th in Las Vegas? Mr. Rogers, Commissioner Rogers. Uh, yes, I'd like to uh, make a motion uh, to change the March dates of our commission meeting from March 18 and 19 to March 25 and 26 of 2022 in Las Vegas. Okay. Do I have a second? I have a second by Commissioner Perini. Unfortunately, we've lost Commissioner Barnes. Um, he lost his connection, so, but we can still, we'll still move forward. Um, all right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, motion carries eight to zero with Commissioner Barnes absent. Um, committee assignments, I am going to make assignment. Uh, I have two changes to the committee assignments. Um, and while we don't need to really make this change um, permanently, because the next legislative session isn't a, is a ways away, um, Commissioner Rogers has asked to be removed from the legislative committee because we moved him to the TAC committee. So um, we'll reflect that on the website. And then the Wildlife Damage Management Committee, I'm adding um, public rep Representative Fauna Tomlinson to that committee for when it meets next. Um, and I believe that that was all I had. Secretary Wosley, do you have, do you want to talk about uh, our next agenda items? Yep. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a list of potential items here. I'll, I'll share what I have on our list um, as potential items. Uh, then we can work with you uh, to develop that agenda or add any additional items. Um, my list includes 
Well, let me first of all say that meeting is uh, January 28, 29 in Reno. And um, with any luck, we'll be able to meet in person and we'll be looking to also, um, you know, have a, a hybrid type component. Um, of course, that'll be dependent on capacity uh, at the venue, but we think we've got some of that figured out. So that's our, that's what we're shooting for. My list includes the, uh, an APRP committee, meeting potentially, a uh, TAC committee, um, a workshop for the ETAG regulation, which is uh, CGR uh, 504, and then NAC chapter 504 simplification, and NAC chapter 503 simplification, a draft, a presentation of the draft predation management plan, and the, the main items uh, will be the big game season uh, setting and, and regulations uh, set in odd numbered years, but amended in even numbered years. So that meeting will be in 22. So we'll be looking uh, just to amend. Um, and we have a criteria in place uh, where, we, where we either have you know, a, an urgent need to, to change season date to avoid conflict or take advantage of emerging opportunity or curtail, you know, any kind of a potential impact to, to the resource. Um, black bear seasons uh, will also be set, and those are set annually. Uh, mountain lion limits and quotas also set annually. Uh, the season is set in, in NRS, so it'll just be the quota. Um, heritage tag seasons and quotas, and those are set annually, but a year in advance. Uh, Dream Tag, Partnership in Wildlife and Silver State Tag Seasons and Quotas, which are also set annually. The Big Game Application Deadline and the Big Game Tag Eligibility, um, also set annually. We'll have a, uh, a report, a conference report from the WAFWA Midwinter Meeting, which is um, first week of January, uh, running into the second week. I think it's like 6th six, six through the 10th. And then we'll have a uh, Wildlife Heritage Account report. And that concludes uh, my list of potential agenda items. And we're happy to add anything to that list or uh, work with you to uh, take anything off if need be. Okay. I know we've got a number of policies coming up under APRP. Um, I believe they were mentioned earlier in the day. So we'll have those. I don't see anything else at the moment. Um, Okay, so with that, if that concludes that, we'll move on to uh, public comment uh, agenda item number 14. Public comment will be limited to three minutes. No action can be taken by the commission at this time. Any item requiring commission action may be scheduled on a future commission agenda. Do we have any public comment? Mr. Dixon? Thank you, uh, Chair East and the commission. Um, I did wanna say that I heard Tony allude to hopefully we will have an in-person meeting in February, which I would greatly look forward to. I will say the third time is a charm at Clark County. Uh, we had the system working well with WebEx and live. Um, I would strongly recommend in the past, we've tried to have people congregate in various places in Reno or I mean in, in Elko or, or Las Vegas and attend by a, a group. Now that we've got the virtual thing working with Zoom or something like that, Having a setup where you have this system going, I didn't see other than maybe one person wanting to comment today that you really had problems with. Um, I think this works well. I think it allows a greater participation by a larger group of people. And I heard people talk about the relevancy of the cab and Elko, and I've gotten the complaint here in Clark County. What I'm trying to do is give greater relevancy to the people in a county for the things that we do so we get a broader range of comments. And it's working well in Clark County. And, and I would only recommend that the commission and the Department of Wildlife consider taking a virtual first going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Mr. Volz. Yes, yes. Uh, good afternoon again for the record, Fred Volz. Well, NDAO seems to have finally solved the lack of consistent Zoom meeting capabilities for general commission meetings. There is another continuing trend that's more than a little concerning and in need of simple solutions by the next commission meeting. At today's meeting and others in 2021, support materials, namely PowerPoint presentations given during agenda items, have not been posted before the meeting begins, 
They follow days later on the NDAO website or must be individually requested of support staff. Even for information items, it is important for the public and commissioners to see what's presented in advance and given the opportunity to reflect on it and comment on it at some point during the meeting. That opportunity has been denied, even though the materials were likely finalized days before the actual commission meeting for agenda items 6D and 12. Of even greater concern, the listed agenda item for 6D mentions Mr. Jackson's recurring presentation on the annual predator killing program results, but makes no mention that there would be three other presentations from Messrs. Mahoney, Stoner, and Solterre. These presentations should have been listed in the agenda, but were omitted. The meeting agenda needs to clearly state what will be presented and discussed. Otherwise, there's potential for an open meeting law violation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Volz. Mr. Burris. Thank you for hearing me again. Um, I wanna take this opportunity to uh, commend uh, Director Wosley for number one. He has a, a game warden out here in Overton that's been a recent addition to our community that's been amazing. He has done everything that we've asked him to do. He uh, has continued to patrol our area. And instead of kind of passing the buck, he always takes responsibility for what he does. I think he should be commended for what he does. You know, I also um, wanna commend this board for all the hard work that they do. But at the same time, we seem to have a, a little bit of an issue when it comes out to uh, our game guides and putting the regulations out there that are that are actually relevant and possible. So we've had a couple issues. We had an issue this year with uh, marking big game tags that the regulations and the game guide didn't quite match up. And looking at the last year's uh, small game and upland game tag manual, um, we had an issue where it would appear that we had um, legal weapons presented for the Raven hunt, which is federally illegal and illegal in the state of Nevada, which can cause confusion. I just would ask that we need to find a way that we can go through those game regulations and make sure that we don't have these issues in the future because it becomes an issue for both the sportsmen and the, the wardens when they come to enforcing that we end up causing undue stress on both of the groups. And, you know, my goal as a conservationist and, and having a wildlife podcast is to get everybody on the same page. There's no reason for us to fear and hate the game wardens, but if we're both giving, given two separate sets of rules, we're causing an issue to start with. So I would just ask that we really try to figure out how we make that problem go away in the future. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Do we have any other public comment? Okay, I don't see any. I want to thank everyone for their hard work today. Um, and I won't see you again until after the first of the year. So have a wonderful holiday and I'll see you in January. Thanks everyone. Thank you everybody.